Elizabeth I, one of the most celebrated monarchs in English history. Her reign, often referred to as the Elizabethan era, was a period of significant cultural, economic, and political flourishing. With the establishment of English Protestantism and the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, just a few of her notable achievements. Her skillful management of Parliament and her moderate religious policies helped stabilise a kingdom previously torn apart by religious conflict. But she never married, which earned her the moniker the Virgin Queen, and her leadership provided the stability that enabled the arts to thrive, with figures like William Shakespeare defining the age. Hello and welcome to the channel. Is it your first time? Well, if it is, welcome. And, if you're coming back, it's great to see you again. As always, if you want to go above and beyond to support the channel, links are in the description. Otherwise, the best way to support is by liking, subscribing, and just enjoying the video. Now, with that being said, let's all get nice and comfortable, take deep breath, and relax. And we can begin our full biography of Queen Elizabeth I of England. Elizabeth Tudor entered this world on September the 7th, 1533. She was born at Greenwich Palace, bearing the names of her esteemed grandmothers, being Elizabeth of York and Lady Elizabeth Howard. She was the second child of Henry VIII of England to survive infancy within the bonds of marriage. Her mother, Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife, second out of six, by the way, gave birth to Elizabeth, who at her birth was the heir presumptive to the English throne. However, her half-sister, Mary, had lost her position as a legitimate heir due to Henry's annulment of his marriage to Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon, and his subsequent marriage to Anne, all in pursuit of siring a male heir to ensure the Tudor succession. Elizabeth was baptized quickly on September 10th, 1533, three days after her death with prominent figures such as Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, serving as her godparents. Tragedy struck, however, when she was just two years and eight months old. Her mother, Anne Boleyn, had her head removed. Yes, on May 19th, 1536. And Elizabeth, well... She was declared illegitimate, losing her place in royal succession. Shortly after Anne's execution, Henry married one Jane Seymour, who did manage to bear him a son, being Edward, cementing his position as the undisputed heir apparent to the throne. Elizabeth was then placed in her half-brother's household, and participated in his christening, holding the chrysom or baptismal cloth. Well, despite all of these uncertainties and challenges of her early years, Elizabeth demonstrated a keen intellect and a thirst for knowledge. Under the tutelage of her governesses and tutors, such as Catherine Champernone, later known as Catherine Ashley, and William Grindle, she mastered multiple languages, among them including French, Dutch, Italian, and Spanish, all of the big ones for effective diplomacy, by the way, at the time, especially French and Spanish. By the age of twelve, 
She could even translate religious works and classical texts from Latin and Greek into English, and other languages as well. Her education continued under Roger Ascham, who fostered a love of learning and intellectual curiosity in Elizabeth, ensuring she became one of the best educated women of her time, especially at such a young age. Quite impressive. Well, old Henry the Eighth, he wasn't around forever either, and he died in 1547. And following his death, Elizabeth's half-brother, Edward the Sixth, assumed the throne at the very young age of nine years old. Catherine Parr, Henry's widow, remarried Thomas Seymour, Baron Seymour of Sudley, who was Edward's uncle and the brother of the Lord Protector Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset. The newlywed couple welcomed Elizabeth warmly into their household at Chelsea, where she encountered a rather troubling episode that has some scholars speculate had a lasting impact on her emotional well-being. Now, I don't generally like to supply these kinds of warnings, but in the interest of all of my audience, those who do not want to hear any SA-related material, please skip forward a few minutes. Thank you. Thomas Seymour engaged in, let's just say, inappropriate behavior with Elizabeth. This included some rather touchy-feely playing, and tickling even, crossing more than a few lines, it seems. Apparently he would also enter her bedroom at night, wearing his night clothes. Not cool, especially since she was only fourteen at the time. Well, very uncomfortable with these unwanted advances, Elizabeth would rise early and surround herself with maids to avoid his unwelcome morning visits. But shockingly, rather than addressing her husband's behavior, Parr actually participated in these activities. On one occasion she even held Elizabeth so she couldn't move while Seymour cut her gown into pieces. Well, it didn't last forever. The fun had to end when Parr, perhaps feeling a little bit jealous, put an end to the situation after she walked in one day on Seymour rather forcefully embracing Elizabeth. Well, despite Parr's intervention, Thomas Seymour continued his attempts to exert influence over the royal family. Following Parr's death in childbirth on September the 5th, 1548, Seymour renewed his advances towards Elizabeth, with the intention of actually marrying her. Elizabeth's governess, Cat Ashley, who favoured Seymour, encouraged Elizabeth to console him in his grief, whatever that means. However, Elizabeth, of course, being intelligent, especially for her age, remained very sceptical of Seymour's motives, doubting his sincerity in mourning, perhaps trying to get one out of sympathy. Well, in January 1549, Seymour's ambitions led to his arrest and imprisonment in the Tower of London, which is not a place you would want to be imprisoned in. He was thrown in there, locked up on suspicion of plotting against his brother Somerset, orchestrating a marriage between Lady Jane Grey and Edward the Sixth, and also the attitudes towards Elizabeth, and seeking to wed her, which was seen as not cool. Well, despite intense interrogation, 
Elizabeth steadfastly maintained her innocence, frustrating her interrogator, Robert Thirwitt, who believed that she had a part in this and was as guilty as anybody else. Well, sticking to her guns certainly proved to be advantageous, because she managed to get away with everything, although she hadn't really done anything, but, you know, politics. Seymour, however, well, he was executed on March 20th, 1549, bringing an end to his tumultuous pursuit of power and his seeking of marriage to Elizabeth. It turns out it's very hard to act inappropriately towards the queen when you were missing your head. Well, following Edward's death on July 6th, 1553, at the age of 15, his will disregarded the Succession to the Crown Act of 1543, bypassing both Mary and Elizabeth as heirs, and instead naming Lady Jane Grey, Henry VIII's great-niece, as his successor. Well, you can see how this is a bit of a problem. Lady Jane Grey was proclaimed queen by the Privy Council, but her reign was short-lived, lasting only nine days as support for her quickly dissipated. On August the 3rd, 1553, Mary triumphantly entered London, accompanied by Elizabeth. Initially, the relationship between the sisters appeared from the outside to be very harmonious. But, as with all struggles for power, and unfortunately, family affairs. Things soured quite quickly. Well, you see, Mary, she was a staunch Catholic, and Catholics are traditionally not very keen on Protestantism. Thus, Mary aimed to suppress Protestantism, which Elizabeth had been raised in. You can see the problem here. Mary enforced attendance at Catholic Mass, forcing Elizabeth to conform, outwardly at least. Thus Mary's popularity dwindled in 1554, when she announced her intention to marry Philip of Spain, who was also a devout Catholic. Thus discontent spread across the nation with many turning to Elizabeth as a symbol of opposition to Mary's religious policies. In January and February of 1554, Wyatt's rebellion erupted, but was swiftly quashed. Elizabeth was summoned to court and questioned about her involvement. Despite her protests of innocence, she was imprisoned in the Tower of London, on March 18th, 1554. And while there is little evidence that she had conspired with the rebels, some had attempted to have communication with her. Some had even approached her. Mary's advisor, Simon Renard, argued that Elizabeth posed a threat to her throne, which was technically true. Elizabeth's supporters, including William Paget, Baron Paget, persuaded Mary to spare her sister's life due to a lack of concrete evidence against her. And, spoiler alert, the life was spared. On May 22, 1554, Elizabeth was transferred from the Tower to Woodstock, where she remained under house arrest for nearly a year under the supervision of Henry Bedingfield. Her journey elicited cheers from the crowds. In the April of 1555, Elizabeth returned to court as Mary's apparent pregnancy had advanced. If Mary and her child died, which was a very 
likely scenario in those days. Women dying during childbirth was extremely common. Elizabeth would ascend the throne. However, when it became evident that Mary was not pregnant, Elizabeth's prospects of becoming queen increased. Acknowledging the shifting politics, King Philip, who became king of Spain in 1556, sought to cultivate Elizabeth as an ally. She was, after all, a preferable option to Mary, who was betrothed to the Dauphine of France. Well, Elizabeth received visitors at Hatfield House, where she had been living since October 1555. By October 1558, she was already preparing for her reign. Mary formally recognized Elizabeth as her heir on November the 6th, 1558. And when Mary died on November the 17th, Elizabeth ascended to the throne. She had become queen at the age of 25 and she immediately communicated her intentions to her council and peers who had gathered at Hatfield to pledge their allegiance. In her speech, Elizabeth expressed great sorrow for her sister's passing, acknowledging the weight of the responsibility that was now suddenly placed upon her. She invoked the concept of the sovereign two bodies, distinguishing between the natural and the political. And here is a quote from her. My lords, the law of nature moves me to sorrow for my sister. The burden that is fallen upon me makes me amazed, and yet, considering I am God's creature, ordained to obey his appointment, I will thereto yield desiring from the bottom of my heart that I may have assistance of his grace to be the minister of his heavenly will in this office now committed to me. And as I am but one body naturally considered, though by his permission a body politic to govern, so shall I desire you all to be assistant to me, that I with my ruling and you with your service may make a good account to Almighty God, and leave some comfort for our posterity on earth. I mean to direct all my actions by good advice and counsel. Well, as Elizabeth's procession moved through the city on the eve of her coronation, she received a overwhelmingly enthusiastic welcome from the citizens orations and pageants, many with a very obvious Protestant theme, greeted her along the way. Her gracious responses endeared her to the spectators. Well, on January 15th, 1559, a date chosen by her astrologer, John Dee, Elizabeth was crowned and anointed by Owen Oglethorpe, the Catholic Bishop of Carlisle, in Westminster Abbey. Amidst all of the organs and fifes, bells and trumpets and drums, she was presented for the people's acceptance. And accept her she did. Well, while Elizabeth was welcomed as a queen in England, the country remained apprehensive about perceived Catholic threats not just at home, but abroad, as well as uncertainties surrounding her choice of a spouse. Her religious convictions have been a subject of scholarly debate, by the way. While she did identify as a Protestant, she maintained a lot of Catholic symbolism, such as the crucifix, and minimalized the importance of sermons, which was contrary to the fundamental belief of Protestantism, so, yeah. While well, recognizing the potential threat of a Catholic crusade against England due to her heretical status, Elizabeth and her advisers pursued a Protestant solution 
that aim to appease Catholics to some extent, while addressing the demands of the English Protestants. However, she remained staunchly opposed to the Puritans, whose reforms were just too extensive. In 1559, the Parliament began to enact legislation for a church that was modelled on the Protestant settlements of Edward VI, with the monarchy serving as its head, but retaining many Catholic elements, including certain vestments. Kind of like going to a bit of a buffet. Just take the things you like and bring it back to the table and have a nice little meal. But this time it was for religion. Well, while the House of Commons strongly supported these proposals, the Bill of Supremacy encountered resistance in the House of Lords, particularly from, guess who, the bishops. Elizabeth benefited from the fact that many bishoprics were vacant at the time, including the Archbishopric of Canterbury. This allowed her supporters among the peers to outnumber and simply outvote the bishops and conservative peers. Despite this, Elizabeth had to concede the title of Supreme Governor of the Church of England, rather than the more contentious title of Supreme Head, which many deemed inappropriate for a woman to hold. The new Act of Supremacy was enacted on May the 8th, 1559. It mandated that all public officials swear an oath of loyalty to the monarch as the Supreme Governor. Or, you get fired. That's right, full disqualification from office. Additionally, the heresy laws were repealed to prevent the persecution of dissenters experienced during Mary's reign. Simultaneously, the Parliament Pact passed, rather, a new Act of Uniformity, which mandated attendance at church services and the use of the 1559 Book of Common Prayer, although the penalties for non-compliance, known as resuscency, by the way, were really not very severe, and not really enforced anyway. Since the outset of Elizabeth's reign, the expectation of her marriage loomed large, sparking speculation about potential suitors. And there were plenty of them, too. Apparently she was quite the dish. Well, despite receiving numerous proposals, she never married and remained childless. You go, girl leaving historians to speculate about the reasons behind her decision. Well, unfortunately, some do suggest that her experiences with Thomas Seymour may have soured her on the entire idea of romantic relationships. Perhaps so, but that's a bit of speculation. Throughout her life, Elizabeth entertained various suitors, considering marriage until she reached the age of fifty. Her final courtship was with Francis, the Duke of Anjou, who was, by the way, significantly younger than her. While marriage presented the opportunity for an heir, it also posed risks, potentially jeopardizing her power, or inciting political instability. Well, in the spring of 1559, it became very apparent that Elizabeth had harbored romantic feelings for her childhood friend, Robert Dudley. Rumors circulated that she would marry him if his wife Amy were to die. <sighs> Okay. Well, guess what happened? Amy's death in September 1560 
sparse suspicions of foul play. How did she die? Well, apparently she fell down the stairs. Right. Well, many, of course, pointed the finger at Dudley to orchestrate this entire thing so that he could marry Elizabeth. And it all seems a little bit too convenient, doesn't it? You don't have to be Hercule Poirot to figure this one out. Well, despite Elizabeth's contemplation of marrying Dudley, opposition from her advisers and conservative peers, as well as the rumours of a potential uprising, dissuaded her. Well, Dudley, he had to find another wife, didn't he? He was down a wife right now and needed to fill that void. So his marriage to Lettuce Nollies, yes, a real name, in 1578, had apparently stirred Elizabeth's displeasure. But even so, he had apparently remained central to her emotional life. He died shortly after the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, leaving behind a note addressed to Elizabeth, discovered among her personal effects after her death. That's right, she kept it all that time. Certainly shows that old Dudley meant quite a lot to her. Well, marriage negotiations played a pivotal role in Elizabeth's foreign policy strategy. In 1559, she declined the proposal from Philip II of Spain, her half-sister's widower. But she did remain open to other potential matches, including King Eric XV of Sweden. Earlier discussions had also broached the idea of a Danish alliance, with proposals from Henry VIII for a match with the Danish Prince Adolf, Duke of Holstein Gotorp, and later from Edward Seymour, the Duke of Somerset, for a union with Prince Frederick, Frederick rather, later Frederick II of Denmark, although these talks had stalled by 1551. As Sweden courted Elizabeth, King Frederick II of Denmark proposed to her, in the late 1559, to counterbalance Sweden's advances. Elizabeth also entertained the prospect of marriage to Charles II, Archduke of Austria, a cousin of Philip II of Spain. But unfortunately, in 1569, relations with the Habsburgs had soured somewhat. So, one more thrown on the no-pile. In the subsequent years, Elizabeth explored marriages with French Valois princes, initially with Henry, the Duke of Anjou, and later with his brother, Francis, also the Duke of Anjou, who had been the Duke of Alencon. The proposal with Francis was linked to plans for an alliance against Spanish control in the southern Netherlands. Elizabeth appeared to take the courtship seriously, for a time, even wearing frog-shaped earrings gifted by Francis, and apparently she had referred to Francis quite a lot as her little frog, which is, I think, quite funny. Well, however, Elizabeth's attitude towards marriage evolved over time. In 1563, she confided to an imperial envoy her inclination to simply remain single, forever, preferring a modest life, a quiet one, over all the nonsense and responsibilities of queenhood. Despite pressure from Parliament, to marry or designate an heir, particularly following her illness with smallpox in 1563, Elizabeth had dug her heels in. She was not letting anybody tell her what to do. Tradition be damned. 
She prorogued Parliament in April of 1563, resuming only when she needed its support for taxation in 1566. I bet all the members of Parliament got paid anyway. Ugh. Well, by 1570, it was widely accepted among her senior government figures that Elizabeth would simply never marry, or even name a successor. William Cecil, her trusted adviser, began considering alternative solutions to the succession issue. Her decision not to marry was often criticised, but she saw it as a means of safeguarding her political security, recognising that naming an heir could make her vulnerable to plots and coups, as had been the case for her predecessor. And, well, if anyone's been watching the other videos, pretty much everyone else. Elizabeth's unmarried status gave a kind of rise to a cult of virginity, drawing parallels to the Virgin Mary. In art and literature she was often depicted as a virgin or a divine figure, rather than a mortal woman. Initially, Elizabeth herself emphasised her virginity, declaring to the Commons, and I quote in 1559, and in the end, this shall be for me sufficient, that a marble stone shall declare that a queen, having reigned such a time, lived and died a virgin. Later, poets and writers elaborated on this theme, elevating Elizabeth to an iconic status. While well, public displays of devotion to the Virgin Mary in 1578 were interpreted as veiled opposition to Elizabeth's marriage negotiations with the Duke of Alencon, Elizabeth herself maintained that she was wedded to her kingdom and subjects, under divine protection, declaring in 1599, all my husbands, my good people. That's sweet. Yeah. However, not everyone accepted Elizabeth's claim of virginity. A few eyebrows were raised. Catholic eyebrows. Well, the Catholics accused her of engaging in sinful behaviour that tainted the nation symbolically. Actually, Henry IV of France, not of England, of France, famously questioned whether Elizabeth was truly a virgin at all. Very salacious. A contentious issue surrounding Elizabeth's virginity was whether she consummated her relationship with Robert Dudley. In 1559, she had Dudley's bedchambers moved next to her own, and in 1561 she fell mysteriously ill, causing her body to swell. Hmm, probably a coincidence. In 1587, a young man named Arthur Dudley was apprehended of suspicion of espionage in Spain, claiming to be the illegitimate son of Elizabeth and Robert Dudley. Arthur's age aligned with the 1561 illness. While he provided a detailed account of his life, including his upbringing in the royal palace, his story well, it wasn't quite good enough to convince the Spanish authorities. And modern scholars mostly dismiss the notion of Elizabeth concealing a pregnancy, citing the intense scrutiny of her life by contemporaries. She just wouldn't have gotten away with it. Now, on to Mary, Queen of Scots. We're going to backpedal a little bit now. Talk about her rivalry with Mary for a little bit, if you would permit me to do so. So, we're going back to around 1560 on the timeline, okay? 
Elizabeth initially opposed the French presence in Scotland, fearing that they aimed to invade England and install her Catholic cousin Mary Queen of Scots on the throne. Mary, being the granddaughter of Henry VIII's elder sister Margaret, was considered by many to be the rightful heir to the English crown. Elizabeth, persuaded by the threat posed by Mary and the French, supported Protestant rebels in Scotland, culminating in the Treaty of Edinburgh in July of 1560, which effectively removed the French threat from the north. Upon Mary's return to Scotland in 1561, the country had embraced Protestantism, and the Council of Protestant Nobles, supported by Elizabeth, now governed it. Despite Elizabeth's efforts to maintain control, Mary refused to ratify the treaty. This, of course, put the two at odds, certainly a strained relationship. Well, in 1563, Elizabeth proposed her own suit, suitor, rather, Robert Dudley, as a husband for Mary, but both Mary and Dudley showed very little interest. Instead, in 1565, Mary married Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, who also had a claim to the English throne, but not a very strong one. However, Darnley, well, everybody hated him, and because of his severe unpopularity, he was murdered in 1567, likely orchestrated by James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, whom Mary subsequently married not long after. I'm sure that uh, Darnley was turning in his grave over that one. Well, Elizabeth, who was suspicious of Mary's involvement in Darnley's death, confronted her about the hasty marriage, and you can see how this all went. One can only imagine the conversation between the two. These events, well, they ultimately led to Mary's downfall. It was all pretty obvious what had happened. Well, she was forced to abdicate in favour of her son, James the Sixth, and then she was thrown into the Loch Leven Castle prison, not a nice place to be. Although she did manage to escape in 1568, her defeat at the Battle of Langside led her to seek refuge in England, where she had hoped, somewhat misguidedly, for Elizabeth's support. However, rather than risk political instability, Elizabeth chose to detain Mary in England for the next nineteen years, unwilling to commit to either returning her to Scotland or sending her to France. Mary thus became the focal point of rebellion in England, particularly among Catholics. In 1569, a significant Catholic uprising occurred in the north, with the primary goal of freeing Mary, marrying her to Thomas Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, and installing her as the English Queen. The rebellion was swiftly crushed, leading to over 750 executions on Elizabeth's direct orders. Pope Pius V responded to the revolt's perceived success by issuing the papal bull Regnans in Excelsis in 1570, excommunicating Elizabeth and declaring her a heretic, thereby releasing her subjects from allegiance to her. The papal bull, of course, intensified anti-Catholic sentiment in England, and prompted legislative measures against Catholics by Parliament. These measures, although severe, were somewhat mitigated by Elizabeth's direct intervention. For example, in 1581, 
converting English subjects to Catholicism with the intent to withdraw them from allegiance to Elizabeth was made a treasonable offence. And, of course, the punishment for treason was... getting your head removed. From the 1570s, missionary priests from continental seminaries clandestinely entered England with the aim of reconverting the country to Catholicism, a dangerous mission indeed. Well, not many of these priests managed to do the job for very long. They were found and executed. But this had the effect of somewhat fostering this cult of martyrdom among the English Catholics. Remember the whole thing of the New Testament, Jesus saying they persecuted me first. Well, now they're persecuting you. Well, they must be persecuting us because we're on Jesus' side. Well, it becomes a little bit difficult when everybody wants God on their team. Well, Regnans in Excelsis, that papal bull, provided English Catholics with a compelling reason to view Mary as the rightful sovereign of England. Although Mary might not have been directly involved in every Catholic plot to place her on the English throne, evidence such as the Ridolfi plot in 1571 and the Babington plot of 1586 do quite a lot to suggest her utmost complicity. Elizabeth's spy master, yes, they had them back then, Francis Walsingham, and the Royal Council diligently gathered evidence. Initially, Elizabeth resisted calls for Mary's execution, thinking it was a little bit in poor taste. However, by the late 1586, she had run out of patience. She approved Mary's trial and execution based on letters intercepted during the aforementioned Babington plot. Mary was, therefore, beheaded at Fotheringhay Castle on the 8th of February, 1587. Elizabeth later claimed that she had not intended for the execution warrant to be dispatched, and blamed her secretary, William Davison, for its implementation without her knowledge. However, doubts remain about the sincerity of Elizabeth's remorse, and her true intentions regarding the execution. Now, away from Mary, Queen of Scots, Let's talk about a little bit of, uh, policy. Foreign policy first, which was primarily defensive in nature. Except for a few instances where aggressive actions had to be taken, such as the English occupation of La Havre from October 1562 to June of 1563, Elizabeth had this goal with La Havre, to eventually exchange it for Calais, the port city on the mainland, which had been lost to France in 1558. However, the occupation ended in failure when her Huguenot allies joined with the Catholics to retake the port, which no one really saw that one coming, Huguenots being Protestants, who were constantly at odds with the Catholics in France. Watch my video about the French Wars of Religion. Now that's one to have with dinner. Well, throughout her reign, Elizabeth relied heavily on her fleets to pursue an aggressive policy, particularly in conflicts against Spain. The Anglo-Spanish War, which saw around 80% of its battles fought at sea, was a significant example of this strategy. Elizabeth actually knighted Francis Drake after his circumnavigation of the globe from 1577 to 1580, 
Drake became famous for his raids on Spanish ports and fleets, contributing significantly to England's naval power. And just a few days ago, I did a video about him. You might want to go watch it. Quite interesting. Well, despite all these maritime successes, Elizabeth largely avoided military expeditions on the continent, at least until 1585. In that year, she sent an English army to aid the Protestant Dutch rebels against Philip II of Spain. This decision came after the deaths of key allies and the surrender of Dutch towns to Spanish forces. The Treaty of Nonsuch in August 1585 marked the beginning of the Anglo-Spanish War, which lasted until the Treaty of London, almost twenty years later, in 1604. The expedition to aid the Dutch was led by the Earl of Leicester, Elizabeth's former suitor. However, Elizabeth was not fully supportive of this course of action. She initiated secret peace talks with Spain, shortly after Leicester's arrival in Holland, which contradicted Leicester's plans for active military engagement. Elizabeth didn't want that. She wanted to avoid decisive action with the enemy. While Leicester, well, he was more on a aggressive approach, intending to fight actively. Their conflicting strategies led to tensions between them, exacerbated by Leicester's acceptance of the post of Governor-General from the Dutch States-General without Elizabeth's consent. Elizabeth's reluctance to fully commit to the Dutch cause, combined with Leicester's political and military shortcomings, and the chaotic situation in Dutch politics, ultimately led to the complete failure of this campaign. Elizabeth repeatedly refused to send the promised funds for her soldiers, undermining the military effort, and Leicester, well, he eventually resigned from his command in December of 1587, ending a chapter in Elizabeth's foreign policy characterized by hesitancy and internal discord. The expeditions of Francis Drake against Spanish ports and ships in the Caribbean in 1585 and 86, along with his successful raid on Cadiz in 1587, played its own role in weakening the Spanish naval power and disrupting Philip II's plans for enterprise in England. These actions demonstrated England's ability to strike at the very heart of Spanish maritime interests, and ultimately thwarted Philip's attempts to launch a full-scale invasion of England. The Spanish Armada, a formidable fleet of ships assembled by Philip II, set sail for the English Channel on the 12th of July 1588, with the intention of ferrying a Spanish invasion force under the Duke of Parma from the Netherlands to the coast of southeast England. However, they encountered a series of setbacks, including miscalculations, misfortune, and of course the devastating attack by a group of English fire ships, well, that was admittedly the main issue. This attack occurred off Gravelands on the 28th to the 29th of July, certainly a night to remember. Well, this led to the dispersion of the Spanish fleet, and its eventual straggled return to Spain with significant losses occurred along the way, particularly off the coast of Ireland. You see, they couldn't just sail back the same way. No, too many English fire ships. They had to go all the way up, and all the way around. And, let's just say, the North Sea Passage is not very kind that type of year. 
Well, in response to this perceived threat of invasion, English militias were also mustered under the command of the Earl of Leicester. Yes, the boats were sank, but we just wanted to make sure. No harm in boots on the ground, right? Elizabeth, displaying her characteristic courage and resolve, addressed her troops at Tilbury on the 8th of August, declaring her determination to defend her realm against any and all foreign aggression. Her famous speech to the troops at Tilbury emphasised her faith in her loyal subjects and her commitment to protecting England from invasion. Thus, the defeat of the Spanish Armada was celebrated as a triumph for Protestant England and a testament to Elizabeth's leadership. That ground invasion? Well, it never really came. Either way, the boats were sank, and it bolstered national morale, reinforcing the perception of Elizabeth as a strong and capable monarch. Who needs a husband, anyway? Well, not her, apparently. However, the victory did not end the conflict with Spain, and the war continued. In fact, despite all of the losses, the continuing war often favoured the Spanish, who still maintained control over the southern provinces of the Netherlands. In 1589, Elizabeth launched the English Armada, or the Counter Armada, whichever we want to call it. I think English Armada sounds cooler. Well, this was led by Francis Drake, very experienced, and John Norris, in an attempt to retaliate against Spain. Well, despite having Francis Drake on their side, the expedition ended in disaster, with heavy casualties suffered by the English fleet, and really no significant gains made at all. The defeat marked a setback for England, and allowed Spain to regain its naval superiority in the following years. Despite the failure of the English Armada, Elizabeth's resolve to defend her realm remained undiminished. Her involvement in France after the Protestant Henry IV inherited the French throne in 1589 marked another shift in foreign policy. Concerned about the potential threat posed by a Spanish takeover of the Channel ports and eager to support a Protestant ally, Elizabeth dispatched military support to Henry IV her first venture into France since the failed English occupation of La Havre in 1563. However, the English campaigns in France proved to be disorganised and ultimately ineffective. Peregrine Berthier's campaign in northern France in 1589 ended in disarray and half of his troops were simply evaporated under the French forces. Better luck next time, kid. John Norrie's expedition to Brittany, yes, the same one who was in the Armada in 1591, was even more disastrous, and it resulted in the near destruction of his army by a force from the Catholic League. Elizabeth's reluctance to invest in supplies and reinforcements for her commanders hindered their efforts, leading to even more setbacks. In July of 1589, Elizabeth sent Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, to aid Henry IV in besieging Rouen. However, Essex's campaign yielded little success and Henry ultimately abandoned the siege in April of 1592. Elizabeth then struggled to maintain control over her commanders once they were abroad, often expressing frustration at the lack of communication and progress. 
In addition to her challenges in France, Elizabeth faced significant opposition in nearby Ireland, where a predominantly Catholic population resisted English authority. Old habits die hard, it seems. The Nine Years' War, which erupted in 1594 and lasted until 1603, posed a severe test for Elizabeth's rule. Rebel leader Hugh O'Neill, backed by Spain, led a revolt against English control. Despite efforts to quell the rebellion, including sending Robert Devereux to Ireland in 1599, Elizabeth encountered difficulties in achieving meaningful victories. Throughout her reign, she also maintained diplomatic relations with the Tsardom of Russia, initially established by her half-brother, Edward VI. Despite occasional tensions, particularly over trade and military alliances, Elizabeth's correspondence with Tsar Ivan the Terrible remained generally amicable. However, Ivan's successor, Fyodor I, adopted a more open approach to foreign relations, dismissing English trading privileges and rejecting Elizabeth's proposals for an alliance. Now who's terrible? Well, during Elizabeth's reign, England also expanded its trade and diplomatic relations with the Barbary states, particularly Morocco. Despite a papal ban and opposition from Spain, England established a trading relationship with Morocco, exchanging armor, ammunition, timber, and metal for Moroccan sugar. It was a sweet deal, I suppose. Well, in 1600, Abd u Awahed ben Masoud, an ambassador from the Moroccan ruler Mulai Ahmad al Mansur, visited England to negotiate an alliance against Spain. After all, they were quite close as well. And, well, living memory of the Reconquista. I suppose that one is hard to get out of the nightmares. Well, this did indicate a potential for cooperation between the two powers, but I don't think the Pope would have liked that very much. Well, don't forget about the Ottoman Empire, the Pope's best friends. Diplomatic ties were also forged with them, too, with the establishment of the Levant Company and the dispatch of the first English ambassador, William Harborn, to the Ottoman capital in 1578. What a job! Well, the Treaty of Commerce was signed in 1580, and there were numerous exchanges of envoys and correspondence between Elizabeth and Sultan Murad III. Murad even entertained the idea of an alliance between Protestant England and the Ottoman Empire, considering their shared rejection of idol worship. Elizabeth's government exported tin, lead, and even ammunition to the Ottomans, and there were discussions of joint military operations against Spain during the outbreak of war in 1585. Well, in the realm of exploration under Elizabeth's reign, Humphrey Gilbert sailed to Newfoundland in 1583 with the aim of establishing a colony, while his half-brother, I'm sure you know of him, Walter Riley, explored the Atlantic coast and claimed territory in present-day Virginia, possibly named in honor of Elizabeth. You know, Virginia, Virgin, the Virgin, Queen. That's pretty much it. Well, 
Riley also attempted to establish colonies in Virginia, landing on Roanoke Island in 1585 and 1590, though the fate of these ventures still remains a little uncertain. And of course, the big one, that eventually grew a little too big for its boots, and eventually when I make a video about it will probably be four hours long, the East India Company, founded in 1600 with a charter from Queen Elizabeth, granting it a complete monopoly on English trade in the Indian Ocean and China. Commanded by James Lancaster, the company embarked on its first expedition in 1601, becoming a dominant force in global trade and acquiring substantial territory in India during the 18th and 19th centuries. While the period following the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 was marked by significant challenges for Elizabeth, which persisted until the end of her reign, which we are quickly approaching. Ongoing conflicts with Spain and in Ireland, coupled with heavy taxation and economic hardships resulting from poor harvests and the costs of war, strained the nation. Raising prices and declining living standards added to the populace's woes. Sounds familiar. Well, in response to internal dissent and the threat of Catholic opposition, Elizabeth intensified repression against Catholics, authorizing commissions to interrogate and monitor Catholic households. To maintain a facade of peace and prosperity, she increasingly relied on internal spies and propaganda, once again sounding all a little familiar. Well, Elizabeth's later years saw a shift in the character of her government, particularly her privy council in the 1590s. Many of her key advisers had already passed away, leaving a new generation in power. Factional strife within the government, which had not been prominent before the 1590s, became a defining feature of daily politics. And a bitter rivalry emerged between Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex, and Robert Cecil, son of Lord Berkeley, each backed by their own numerous supporters, further complicating governance and diminishing the Queen's personal authority. As her reign progressed, Elizabeth resorted to granting monopolies as a form of patronage to courtiers, instead of seeking additional subsidies from Parliament, exacerbating public resentment. This practice led to price-fixing and widespread discontent. The culmination of this discontent was evident in the agitation within the House of Commons during the Parliament of 1601. In response, Elizabeth delivered her famous Golden Speech in November of 1601 at Whitehall Palace, where she professed ignorance of the abuses and sought to appease the members with promises and appeals to their emotions. Here's a quick little excerpt of her speech. Who keeps their sovereign from the lapse of error? in which, by ignorance and not by intent, they might have fallen, what thank they deserve, we know, though you may guess. And as nothing is more dear to us than the loving conservation of our subjects' hearts, with an undeserved doubt might we have incurred if the abusers of our liberality, the thrallers of our people, the ringers of the poor, had not been told us. Yes, language is a little old, I know. Well, despite the economic and political uncertainties of Elizabeth's later years, 
England experienced an unparalleled literary renaissance. So, everyone was poor, but, hey, at least the books were good. The emergence of a new literary movement began towards the end of the second decade of Elizabeth's reign, marked by works such as John Lilly's Euphius and Edmund Spencer's The Shepherd's Calendar in 1578. Do look them up. And of course, by the 1590s, some of the greatest names in English literature, including William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, reached their peak, leading to the zenith of the English theatre continuing into the Jacobean era. The Elizabethan era's greatness owes much to the contribution of its builders, dramatists, poets and musicians, rather than the direct patronage of the Queen herself, who was actually not a significant supporter of the arts, but at least she wasn't a repressor of them. Well, by this point, she was getting on a bit. As Elizabeth aged, her public image underwent a transformation. She was depicted as various mythological figures, including Belphoebe, Astrea, and Gloriana, the eternally youthful fairy queen from Edmund Spencer's poem. Despite the idealized portraits, Elizabeth's physical appearance was marred by smallpox scars, leading to dependency on wigs and cosmetics. Her oral health also deteriorated significantly due to severe tooth decay, and many of the teeth had actually fallen out at this point, making it difficult for foreign ambassadors to understand what the hell she was saying. Yes, kind of hard to pronounce those L's and F's without any front teeth, I'm afraid. However, despite these physical challenges, Elizabeth's courtiers continued to praise her beauty, and she herself embraced the role, possibly even believing her own performance in the final years. Her fondness for the charming yet impetuous Earl of Essex, despite his repeated indiscretions, illustrates her personal vulnerabilities. Despite his desertion and attempted rebellion in 1601, Elizabeth was deeply affected by Essex's fate, recognizing her own misjudgments as contributing factors. Lord Burghley's death in 1598 marked a significant transition in the Elizabethan government, with his son Robert Cecil assuming the role of senior advisor and de facto leader of the government. One of Robert Cecil's key tasks was to ensure a smooth succession upon Elizabeth's death, as she had still never officially named a successor. In secret negotiations, Cecil engaged with James VI of Scotland, who had a strong claim to the English throne. Through coded correspondence, Cecil coached James on how to approach Elizabeth, advising him to humour her and avoid too many unnecessary questions. And Elizabeth responded favourably to James's tone, indicating her implicit approval of him as her successor. Well, until the autumn of 1602, her health had remained relatively stable, apart from the teeth. When a series of deaths among her close friends plunged her into severe depression. In March of 1603, Elizabeth fell seriously ill, exhibiting signs of a deep depression and melancholy. Despite her reluctance, 
Robert Cecil insisted that she retire to bed and rest, to which she defiantly replied that must is not a word to use to princes, little man. Hmm. Well, it wasn't long after that little man comment it was very unnecessary that she passed away on the 24th of March 1603 at Richmond Palace. Cecil and the council promptly proclaimed James as the new King of England. And well, although her death is conveniently recorded as occurring in 1603, in England at the time followed the Julian calendar, where the new year actually began on the 25th of March. Hence, by the modern calendar, Elizabeth actually died on the last day of 1602. But now we're just getting technical. Well, eventually a funeral procession came and it was held on the 28th of April. And it was a somber affair, led down in these with these horses draped in these black draperies, with a large procession through the streets, thousands of people gathering to witness her interment at Westminster Abbey, alongside her half-sister Mary. In the words of the chronicler John Stowe, Westminster was surcharged with multitudes of all sorts of people in their streets, houses, windows, leads and gutters, that came out to see the obsequy. And when they beheld her statue lying upon the coffin, there was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like hath not been seen or known in the memory of man. Sir Francis Drake, born around 1540 in Devonshire, England, a renowned seaman and privateer, whose circumnavigation of the globe from 1577 to 1580 established him as a pivotal figure in English naval history. These daring exploits included the successful raid on the Spanish silver train at Nombre de Dios, significantly enriching England and disrupting the Spanish maritime supremacy. Knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1581 for his services, Drake's strategic skill was instrumental in the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. Thus, his legacy as a master navigator and privateer endures to this day, symbolizing the rise of the British Maritime Empire and the fall of the Spanish dominance in the New World. Hello and welcome to the channel. Is it your first time here? If it is, hello, good to meet you. And if you are coming back, it's good to see you again. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, the best way to do that is by liking, subscribing, and leaving your comments down below. Those who want to go above and beyond may refer to the Patreon link in the description. Now, with that being said, let's all get nice and relaxed. Take a deep breath. We may begin our biography of Sir Francis Drake. Francis Drake was born at the rustic Crowndale farm, near Tavistock in Devon. His exact date of birth remains unconfirmed, but it is around the aforementioned date. This birth year is deducted from various contemporary texts, one of which notes that Drake was two and twenty when he obtained the command of the Judith in 1566, which suggests that he was born around or before 1544 at the latest. But most people settle on the date of 1540. 
Now, 1549, that was a difficult year for the family. The Drakes were compelled to flee their home in Devon all the way to Kent, mainly due to the severe religious persecution that erupted during the Prayer Book Rebellion, a topic for another video. All you need to know is that it was something that you would definitely want to run away from if you were on the pointy end of it. Now it was in Kent that Francis's father found a brand new calling, that being ministering to the sailors in the king's navy. After being ordained as a deacon, he was appointed as the vicar of Upchurch and the Medway. This period marked a significant chapter in young Francis's life, and set the stage for his future maritime adventures. Now from an early age, Francis was immersed in the world of maritime adventure, beginning his seafaring career as an apprentice under the guidance of his relative, the sea captain William Hawkins of Plymouth. His talent and diligence were evident from the start, and by the age of eighteen he had already advanced to the position of purser, as noted by English chronicler Edmund Howes. In the 1550s, Drake's father secured him a position with the master of a small bark, which was a vessel that was part of the bustling trade network between the Medway River and the Dutch coast. Here, Drake likely engaged in commerce, traversing the coasts of England, the Low Countries, and even as far as France. The ship's master was thoroughly impressed with Drake's conduct, and, having no suitable heirs of his own, bequeathed the bark to Drake upon his death. Now that's lucky. Now, something a little bit less pleasant. When we look at the historical context of 1562, the West African slave trade was largely controlled by the Portuguese and the Spanish. Sir John Hawkins, seeing an opportunity, formulated a strategy to infiltrate and capitalize on this lucrative trade. Now, Drake, while not among the financiers of this venture, is believed to have served as a common seaman on Hawkins' initial slaving voyages. While anecdotal evidence suggests Drake's involvement in the first two voyages, stronger evidence confirms his presence in the last two of the four slaving voyages conducted by Hawkins between 1562 and 1569. Hawkins' first venture in 1562 involved capturing Portuguese slave ships off the coast of Sierra Leone and selling the captured Africans in the Spanish Indies, yielding substantial profits. Encouraged by this success, Hawkins embarked on a second slave trading voyage in 1564, this time with the explicit backing of the Queen that being Queen Elizabeth II, of course, who lent him the ship Jesus of Lubeck. This time, Hawkins aggressively captured many inhabitants of an African town and sold them at Spanish ports in the Caribbean, again turning a significant profit for himself, the Queen, and their consortium of investors. Though not a member of the consortium, Drake, as part of the crew, would have received a share of the profits, albeit probably not much of a share. The Spanish and Portuguese were not pleased, of course, with the English foray into the slave trade, a market that they had considered their own. They didn't want anybody else muscling in on their business. 
while under diplomatic pressure to avoid conflict, Queen Elizabeth eventually prohibited Hawkins from undertaking a third expedition. But Hawkins was undeterred. He arranged for a voyage under the command of his relative, John Lovell, in 1566, and of course he wanted Drake to come with him. This venture did not meet with success, however, as over 90 of the enslaved Africans were released without payment. Drake's next notable adventure was in 1567, joining Hawkins on what would be their final joint voyage. The crew attempted to capture slaves around Cape Verde, but met with little success. They then allied with local kings in Sierra Leone, capturing several hundred prisoners, although the kings retained a larger share of the captives. This voyage faced numerous challenges, including storms, Spanish hostility, and of course a devastating hurricane that separated one ship from the rest of the fleet. The remaining ships? Well, they were forced into the port of San Juan de Ulua, near Veracruz. Quite a lot of repairs needed to be done. Well, soon after they were attacked by the Spanish, under the newly appointed Viceroy of New Spain, Martin Enrique de Almanza, leading to the disastrous Battle of San Juan de Ulua. The English suffered a significant defeat, and they lost all but two of their ships. In the chaos, Drake, who was now captain of the Judith, made the difficult decision to flee, leaving Hawkins and the others behind. Hawkins, however, escaped on the Minion, returning to England with a mere fifteen of his original crew leaving hundreds of English sailors abandoned. Upon his return, Hawkins was a little bit upset. He accused Drake of desertion and the theft of treasure. Drake, of course, refuted these accusations, maintaining that he had distributed all profits fairly among the crew and had believed Hawkins to be lost when he made the decision to retreat. Well, this contentious end in their voyage marked a turning point for Drake's career. From then on, he abandoned trading and slaving in favor of direct confrontations with Spanish holdings. This change in focus was partly fueled by the animosity towards the Spanish that Drake developed after the Battle of San Juan de Ulva and its aftermath. The 1567-69 voyage marked his final involvement in anything to do with the slave trade. Well over these last four voyages, approximately 1,200 Africans were enslaved with estimates suggesting that up to three times as many may have perished. Well, in 1572, a little while later, Francis Drake embarked on his first significant independent venture, targeting the Isthmus of Panama, an area that the Spanish referred to as part of the Tierra Firme, and the English as the Spanish Main. This region was crucial, as it was where the immense wealth of Peruvian silver and gold was unloaded and transported overland to the Caribbean Sea. From there, Spanish galleons would ship it to Spain, from the town of Nombre de Dios. Departing Portsmouth, on Plymouth rather, on May 24, 1572, with 73 men aboard two small vessels, the Pasha and the Swan, Drake 
set his eyes to seize Nombre de Dios. Drake's initial assault on Nombre de Dios occurred in late July of 1572. He managed to capture the town, but was severely wounded by the arriving Spanish forces from Panama, who were understandably angry, forcing his retreat without securing the treasures stored in the royal treasury. Well, he decided not to attack Nombre de Dios again, but shifted his focus to simply raiding the Spanish galleons along the coast where he could find them. He also, along with the help of his allies, the Kimarons, who were escaped African slaves, somewhat ironic, raided the mule trains carrying gold, silver, and goods from Panama City. Among these men was Diego, who later earned his freedom after many years serving under Drake. And here we find one of Drake's most notable exploits. During this period, it was the capture of the Spanish silver train at Nombre de Dios on April the 1st, 1573, which of course significantly enriched him and increased his fame. Near Cabo de Cativas, he encountered a French privateer, Guillaume Le Testu, commanding the 80-ton warship called the Havre. The two joined forces, and Drake planned to intercept the mule train at Campos River, two leagues from Nombre de Dios. He instructed his captains to rendezvous at the Francisca River on April 3rd to extract them after the raid. The combined English and French forces, along with the Quimaron scouts, surprised the mule convoy. The following morning seized over 200,000 pesos worth of treasure. After attacking the train, Drake and his cohorts discovered that they had captured around 20 tons of silver and gold, a lot more than they thought was going to be there. So, they couldn't carry it all. It's a good problem to have. They buried much of this treasure, way too heavy to take back, and fled with a significant amount of more carryable gold. This incident may have inspired many later tales of pirates and buried treasure. Tragically, during the retreat, however, Le Testu was captured and executed. The adventurers struggled to carry as much gold and silver as they could across approximately 18 miles of jungle-covered mountains to their raiding boat's location. Arriving at the coast, they found that the boats were missing, leaving them demoralized, exhausted, and stranded with the Spanish close behind. Uh, Drake, where are the boats? Well, at this critical juncture, Drake took to inspiring his men. He then buried the treasure on the beach and got to work constructing a raft. With this, he and four other sailors sailed twelve miles in heavy swells to where they had left two other boats. Now, when Drake finally reached the boats, his crew, shocked by his disheveled appearance, feared the worst. Well, Drake, playing along with their fears before revealing a large amount of Spanish gold, and happily declaring, Our voyage is made. By the second week of August 1573, Drake returned triumphantly to Plymouth. An exceptional moment during this expedition was on February the 11th, when Drake and his lieutenant, John Oxenham became the first Englishman to sight the Pacific Ocean. 
They climbed a high tree in Panama's central mountains, a feat first achieved by the Spaniard Vasco Núñez de Balboa in 1513. The Quimarons had carved steps into the tree, leading to a platform where Drake, Oxenham, and the Quimaron leader Pedro viewed the vast ocean. They vowed that one day they would sail these waters, a promise Drake fulfilled during his later world circumnavigation. Upon his return, Drake was celebrated as a hero in England, and, of course, vilified as a pirate in Spain. Although the British government had signed a temporary truce with Spain's King Philip II, it could not officially recognize Drake's accomplishments. You know, politics. In 1575, Drake was involved in the Rathlin Island Massacre in Ireland. Under the directives of Sir Henry Sidney and the Earl of Essex, Robert Devereux, Sir John Norris and Drake laid siege to Rathlin Castle. Following its surrender, Norris's troops killed all two hundred defenders and several hundred civilians, which of course included women and children of the clan MacDonnell. Meanwhile, Drake's task was to prevent any reinforcements from reaching the island from the Gallic, Irish or Scots. This left sorely boy MacDonnell, yes, his actual name, a leader of the Gallic resistance against the English power, stranded on the mainland. The devastating attack led Essex to report to Queen Elizabeth's secretary that Sorley Boy was likely to have run mad for sorrow, having lost everything he ever valued in the assault. Yeah, feel a little bit sorry for him, don't you? Well, after the successful raid on the Panama Isthmus, Drake planned a significant expedition, which was later known as the Famous Voyage, targeting the Spanish territories along the Pacific coast of the Americas. This ambitious journey was backed by a consortium including influential figures such as Francis Walshingham, Robert Dudley, the first Earl of Leicester, John Hawkins, Christopher Hatton, and, of course, Drake himself. The original idea, authored by Sir Richard Grenville, received a royal patent in 1574 for such an expedition. However, Queen Elizabeth rescinded this patent a year later upon learning of Grenville's aggressive intentions towards the Spanish. Despite this, in 1577, Elizabeth likely provided financial backing for Drake's voyage to South America, though she stopped short of giving him an official commission. Well, this voyage aimed to be the first circumnavigation in almost six decades. So you can see how it was more than a big deal. Once again, Diego, returning character, was part of Drake's crew. His bilingual abilities in Spanish and English, making him an invaluable interpreter for encounters with Spanish or Portuguese speakers. Employed as Drake's servant, Diego was compensated like the other crew members. Setting out from Plymouth, on November the 15th, 1577, Drake and his fleet faced immediate challenges from severe weather, forcing them to seek refuge in Falmouth, Cornwall. After repairs, they departed again on December the 13th, aboard the flagship Pelican, with four additional ships and 164 men. Drake soon expanded his fleet, by capturing the Portuguese merchant ship Mary, originally Santa Maria, 
off the coast of Africa near the Cape Verde Islands, and he also took its experienced navigator, Nuno da Silva, captive. As they crossed the Atlantic, Drake's fleet dwindled. He had to scuttle the Christopher and the flyboat Swan due to the loss of men. The fleet made landfall eventually at the forbidding Puerto San Julian in present-day Argentina, a site where Ferdinand Magellan had executed mutineers half a century earlier. Drake's crew encountered the eerie sight of bleached skeletons on Spanish gibbets. Echoing Magellan, Drake held a trial and executed his own mutineer, Thomas Doherty. The ship Mary was found to be rotting and was stripped and abandoned. Choosing to overwinter in San Julian, Drake delayed his push through the Strait of Magellan. The Execution of Thomas Doherty Drake's journey was marred by internal strife, particularly with co-commander Thomas Doherty. On June 3, 1578, Doherty was accused by Drake of witchcraft, of all things, and faced charges of mutiny and treason in a ship trial. Drake, asserting he had a royal commission, which he didn't, it was never produced, denied Doherty a trial back in England. Key evidence against Doherty came from the ship's carpenter, Edward Bright, whose testimony was crucial. Well, after the trial, Bright was promoted to master of the ship Marigold, and Doherty, having disclosed the voyager's purpose to Lord Burghley, a critic of provoking the Spanish, was found guilty. The night before his execution, Doherty and Drake shared communion and dined together, maintaining a show of camaraderie. Francis Fletcher, the ship's chaplain, described this last meal as both sharing cheerfully, as if some journey only had been in hand. On July the 2nd, 1578, Drake executed Doherty by cutting his head off, which usually does the trick. The voyage continued to face hardships, and by January 1580, Drake found himself stranded on a reef in the Celebes Sea. When Fletcher suggested that their misfortunes were divine retribution for Doherty's unjust death, Drake furiously chained him to a hatch cover and declared him excommunicated. Well after this execution of Thomas Doherty, Drake and his reduced fleet of three ships set sail for the Strait of Magellan at the southern tip of South America. By September 1578, Drake had navigated through the strait and had entered the Pacific Ocean. It was here that violent storms led to the loss of the Marigold, captained by John Thomas, and forced Elizabeth, under John Winter, to turn back to England. This left Drake with only his flagship, the Pelican. Upon reaching the Pacific, Drake renamed Pelican to Golden Hind to honor Sir Christopher Hatton, whose crest featured a golden hind. Drake's journey along the Chilean coast led him approximately 55 degrees south as recorded in Richard Hakluyt's The Principal Navigations, Voyages and Discoveries of the English Nation. Here, he and his crew engaged in skirmishes with the indigenous peoples of southern Patagonia, marking the first European conflict with the native inhabitants of this region. During their time in the Straits, 
The crew learned that an infusion made from the bark of Drimis Windery was effective against scurvy, which led to the scientific naming of the plant. The more you know. Historian Matteo Martinic has noted that Drake's explorations were pivotal in identifying the southern extremity of the Americas and the adjacent oceanic regions. Initial reports of Drake's findings south of Tierra del Fuego emerged after the explorations of William Shodan and Jacob Lemaire in 1616. Raids on the Spanish-American West Coast Continuing north along the Pacific coast of South America in the Golden Hind, Drake attacked various Spanish ports and got busy with the plundering of various towns. He captured several Spanish ships, using their more accurate navigational charts as the English hadn't quite caught up to them just yet. Near Mocha Island, which is now part of modern-day Chile, hostile Mapuche injured Drake and his servant Diego with arrows. Further north, in Valparaiso, also modern-day Chile, Drake seized a ship loaded with Chilean wine. Near Lima, in Peru, Drake captured a Spanish ship carrying 25,000 pesos of gold, equivalent to about 7 million pounds in today's currency. That's British pounds. He also learned of the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, sailing west towards Manila. He pursued and captured this treasure ship, later named Caca Fuego, which was his most lucrative prize. Not just a ship, but a ship filled with treasure. Aboard the Caca Fuego, Drake found 36 kilograms of gold, also a golden crucifix, jewels, 13 chests of silver reals, and 26,000 kilograms of silver. Of course, he was quite delighted with this fortune. Drake dined with the captured ship's officers and passengers, later releasing them with gifts and letters of safe conduct. He then continued his northern journey, raiding more Spanish settlements. His final significant stop was in Guatulco, where his crew looted from April 13th to the 16th. It was here that Drake began to begin to be a little bit homesick and wanted to return to England. He had a few options. The options were to sail back along the Spanish-dominated coast or to seek a northern passage through the rumoured Strait of Anion. He ruled out the dangerous southern return considering either continuing north to the Strait of Anian or just crossing the Pacific towards the East Indies. In May, Drake's ship bypassed the Bahia California Peninsula, continuing north. This part of the journey was into largely uncharted territory, as the western coast of North America had only been partially explored by Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, in 1542 for Spain. Or to avoid further Spanish conflict, Drake sought a discreet location to prepare for the return journey. On June the 5th, 1579, Drake made a brief landfall at South Cove, Cape Arago, just south of Coos Bay in Oregon. Then he moved southward, by June 17th, he found a protected cove along the coast of what is now Northern California. There, he claimed the land for Queen Elizabeth, naming it Nova Albion, or New Albion. 
To solidify this claim, he posted an engraved brass plate, marking the sovereignty for Elizabeth and her successors. The crew set up a fort and worked for weeks to repair the Golden Hind, including careening the ship to clean and repair the hull. Drake had friendly interactions with the local coastal tribes, the Miwok, and he explored the region. Well, it couldn't all be a holiday. He left New Albion on July the 23rd, and the ship stopped at the Farallon Islands the very next day, where the crew were hunted for provisions, mainly for food. Seals and sea lions were reportedly particularly tasty. Drake then set a course southwest to catch the trade winds across the Pacific. Months later, he reached the Maluccas, part of modern-day Indonesia. It is suggested that Drake actually careened his ship on the shores of Magdalena Bay in Lower California due to challenging winds and currents before sailing to the Maluccas and the Spice Islands. Well, either way, it was here that Diego succumbed to wounds that he had sustained earlier. Poor old Diego. Well, the Golden Hind was also nearly lost on a reef, but was saved after the crew waited for favorable tides and dumped some cargo to lighten the ship. Drake also befriended Sultan Babula of Ternate in the Maluccas. The crew became entangled in local conflicts with the Portuguese, before making stops along the African coast, rounding the Cape of Good Hope, and reaching Sierra Leone by July 22nd, 1580, on their journey back to England. This marked the final leg of Drake's epic circumnavigation, which had significantly disrupted Spanish dominance and expanded English maritime knowledge. You know, the first time's the worst time, right? On September 26, 1580, the Golden Hind sailed into Plymouth, marking the triumphant return of Francis Drake and 59 of the crew members, the ones that remained. And don't forget about the rich cargo of captured Spanish treasures and spices, ready to spice up that famous English cuisine. The value of the Queen's share of this cargo exceeded the total income of the English crown for that entire year, so she was quite happy as well. Drake's achievement as the first Englishman to circumnavigate the earth was celebrated, his voyage being the second ever to return with at least one ship intact after El Cano's voyage in 1520. Thus, Queen Elizabeth took a keen interest in maintaining the secrecy of Drake's voyages, declaring all written accounts to be the and I quote, Queen's Secrets of the Realm. Drake and his fellow participants were sworn to secrecy, and if they told anyone, the Queen would kill them. So that was a good motivation to not tell anybody, especially the Spanish. Yes, the Queen aimed to keep these details very hidden from the Spanish their rival in global exploration and conquest. In a gesture of gratitude, and to commemorate the successful circumnavigation, Drake presented Queen Elizabeth with a jewel token. This piece, seized off the Pacific coast of Mexico, was crafted from enameled gold, and featured an African diamond, and a miniature ship with an ebony hull. In return, the Queen bestowed upon Drake what is known as the Drake Jewel, an ornate pendant encircled with diamonds, rubies, and pearls. 
Now this gift was extraordinary, especially for a commoner. Remember, he wasn't Sir Francis Drake yet, but he was certainly about to be. And Drake was depicted wearing this jewel in a 1591 portrait by Marcus Geraerts. The pendant featured a portrait of Elizabeth by miniaturist Nicholas Hilliard on one side, and on the reverse a sardonic cameo depicting double portrait busts, a regal woman and an African male. The Drake jewel remains a rare survivor among 16th century jewels, and is preserved at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Go and see it while well, you can. April the 4th, 1451. Queen Elizabeth bestowed a knighthood on Francis Drake aboard the Golden Hind docked in Deptford. Interestingly, the knighthood was actually performed by the French diplomat Monsieur de Marchemont who was the negotiating party for Elizabeth to marry Francis, the Duke of Anjou, the brother of the King of France. Involving the French diplomat was a bit of a strategic move by Elizabeth, as it subtly garnered French political support for Drake's actions. During the Victorian era, nationalist sentiment reshaped this story promoting the idea that Elizabeth herself had knighted Drake. But that is just not the case. Following his knighthood, Drake adopted the coat of arms of the ancient Devon family of Drake of Ash, claiming a distant kinship. This claim led to a legal dispute over the right to use these arms, prompting Queen Elizabeth to award Drake his very own coat of arms. His heraldic achievement is inscribed with the motto Sic Parvis Magna, which means great achievements from small beginnings. Hmm, I might write that and put it on the wall. The coat of arms features a hand emerging from the clouds, labelled Auxilio Divino, signifying by divine aid. This symbolized the belief that Drake's successes were supported by divine providence, a common view in an era that saw national destiny and divine will as closely intertwined. In 1585, as tensions between England and Spain escalated, the signing of the Treaty of Nonsuch participated a open conflict. Queen Elizabeth, through her principal secretary, Francis Walshingham, tasked Sir Francis Drake, and yes, it's Sir now, after his knighthood, with leading a preemptive strike against the Spanish colonies. Thus Drake set sail from Plymouth in September of the same year, commanding an impressive fleet of twenty-one ships and about 1,800 soldiers under the leadership of Christopher Carlyle. The expedition's first target was Vigo in Spain, where Drake held the town for two weeks to ransom supplies. He then moved to plunder Santiago in the Cape Verde Islands. The fleet crossed the Atlantic where Drake sacked the port of Santo Domingo and captured the city of Cartagena de Indias in present-day Colombia. Notably, while in Cartagena, Drake released about 100 enslaved Turks, which, of course, made the Turks very happy. On June 6, 1586, during the voyage's return leg, he attacked the wooden fort at San Augustin in Spanish Florida, burning the entire town to the ground. After these successful raids, Drake proceeded to Sir Walter Riley's Roanoke settlement, 
where he replenished supplies and took all of the original colonists back to England, before the arrival of Sir Richard Grenville with additional supplies and settlers. Drake finally returned to England on July 22nd of 1586, entering Portsmouth to a hero's welcome, naturally. While the aggressive nature of Drake's actions and those of other English and Dutch privateers certainly was not received well by the Spanish, thus Philip II of Spain prompted an invasion of England. Plans had to be made. Drake accepted a new commission on March the 15th, 1587, with multiple objectives, including disrupting Spanish supply lines to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, and attacking the Spanish Armada if it had set sail. Arriving at Cadiz on April 19th, Drake found the harbour filled with ships preparing for the Armada. Launching a daring attack, Drake inflicted heavy damage, claiming to have sunk 39 ships, though Spanish reports admittedly only to 24 losses. Well, who do you believe? Either way, this assault, known as the singeing of the king's beard, delayed the Spanish invasion for over a year. Drake continued his disruptions along the Iberian coast, capturing significant quantities of supplies and making a total profit of around £140,000 for England, with 18000 of that going to Drake himself. When the Spanish Armada set sail for England, in the May of 1588, the English fleet, led by Lord Howard of Effingham, with Drake as vice-admiral aboard the Revenge, met the Spanish off the Cornwall coast on July the 29th. Drake famously captured the disabled Nuestra Señora de Rosario, including its significant monetary cargo, which was intended for the Armada. As the Armada attempted to regroup near Calais, Drake and the other English commanders launched fire ships against the Spanish fleet, which of course forced them into the open sea. The decisive battle occurred off Gravelands, where Drake, Frobisher, and Hawkins inflicted significant damage on the Spanish fleet, leading to the loss of five ships. Drake, in a letter to Admiral Henry Seymour, dated the 31st of July, 1588, noted the fierce engagement, expressing that the Spanish seemed determined to fight to the death and would not give up without a significant beatdown. Somewhat paraphrased, of course. Well, the damaged armada, unable to return via the English Channel, was forced to sail around the British Isles, encountering devastating storms off the Irish coast. The fleet returned to Spain, with a grand loss of 63 ships. One of the most enduring anecdotes about Drake is his legendary composure during the imminent Spanish invasion. It is said that upon being warned of the approaching Spanish fleet while playing bowls in Plymouth Hoe, Drake remarked that there was plenty of time to finish the game and still defeat the Spaniards. This story, though lacking contemporary eyewitness accounts and first recorded 37 years later, reflects that mythos of Drake's calm demeanor in the face of danger possibly influenced by the adverse winds that delayed the English fleet's launch as the Armada approached. In 1589, following the defeat of the Spanish Armada, England mounted its own offensive against Spain. 
Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norris were tasked with three main objectives. Firstly, to destroy the Spanish Atlantic fleet, which was under repair in northern Spain. Second, to land at Lisbon in Portugal, incite a revolt against King Philip II and also Philip I of Portugal, and support the installation of the pretender Dom Antonio, prior of Crato, to the Portuguese throne, and thirdly, to attempt the capture of the Azores, to establish a permanent English base there. Thus the campaign began with an attempt to engage the Spanish fleet in the port of A Coruña. Drake and Norris managed to destroy several ships, but faced strong resistance, and were ultimately repelled. This setback delayed their plans by two weeks, forcing them to abandon the pursuit of the remaining Spanish ships and proceed directly to Lisbon. Norris led his troops on a challenging march along the rocky Portuguese coast to Lisbon, while Drake, with the fleet, sailed around the peninsula. By the time Norris's troops reached Lisbon, they were exhausted, not only from the journey itself, but by plague and all sorts of other illnesses. Norris relied on Dom Antonio to rally local support, demanding provisions and reinforcements, or else threatening to retreat. And contrary to their agreed strategy, Drake anchored his fleet at the mouth of the Targus River, avoiding the risk of sailing past Lisbon's well-defended approaches to deliver the needed artillery and heavy ordnance. The anticipated local uprising, in support of Dom Antonio, however, did not materialize, and the land campaign ultimately faltered. Norris, his army, and Antonio re-embarked, attempting instead to intercept the Spanish treasure fleet. However, it was thwarted by bad weather compelling them to simply sail back to England, where the weather is always good and sunny. On their return, Drake sought to salvage some measures of success from the campaign. He made a brief stop in the Galician Rias, where he pillaged the defenceless town of Vigo for two days, burning it to the ground. However, this raid proved costly, as Drake lost hundreds more men to combat and sickness, with around two hundred being wounded. Not bad for a defenceless town. While the strengthening local defences and arriving Portuguese militias forced Drake's fleet to retreat once more. During their return through the Bay of Biscay, Two of the English vessels were captured by a squadron of Zabras led by Captain Diego de Aramburu. The failed expedition was disastrous, to say the least, with estimated losses ranging from eight to twenty thousand English soldiers and sailors. Well, upon his return to England, Drake faced scrutiny over his conduct during the expedition. The Privy Council charged him with various failings and mishandling of his command, although he was never publicly admonished for these charges. The episode led to a significant decline in his favour at court. It was not until 1595, six years later, that Drake was given command of another naval expedition. The series of events marked a downturn in a previously illustrious career. It's a harsh reality of the Elizabethan era. You can win a hundred battles, but as soon as you lose one, 
all of a sudden, nobody wants you. Poor Drake. Well, Drake's final expeditions and battles went thusly. His attempts to conquer the port of La Palmas ended in failure, and his fortunes did not improve as he continued his campaign. His efforts to capture San Juan de Puerto Rico also met with defeat in the Battle of San Juan. During this engagement, the Spanish defences proved all too much for him. Gunners from El Moro Castle managed to fire a cannonball directly through Drake's storeroom on the expedition's flagship. Remarkably, Drake survived this direct hit, but the incident underscored the intense resistance he faced. With his second in command, Thomas Baskerville, Drake captured and burned Nombre de Dios. They then attempted an am ambitious overland crossing of the Isthmus to attack Panama City. However, the Spanish were very well prepared, having barricaded the road, and the English forces were unable to break through these defences. Suffering heavy casualties, Drake and Baskerville were forced to abandon their attempt to take the city. Well, a few weeks after the failed attack on Panama, on January 28, 1596, Drake succumbed to dysentery, while anchored off the coast of Portobello, where some Spanish treasure ships had sought refuge. This disease, of course, was very common and deadly among sailors during this period, so it wasn't anything surprising, and no one expected foul play. At the time of his death, Drake was 56 years old. Not old, but certainly not young for the time. Well, in a poignant final request, Drake asked you to be subscribed to ASMR Historian. No, I'm just kidding. He asked to be dressed in his full armour before he died, a most dignifying end. He was then buried at sea in a lead-lined coffin near Portobello. His burial place is believed to be near the wrecks of two British ships, the Elizabeth and the Delight, which were earlier scuttled in Portobello Bay. Following his death, the English fleet, demoralized and defeated, shrugged their shoulders and simply returned home. Now, this exact location of his final resting place is still a bit of a mystery, and it's a subject of ongoing interest. Efforts by marine archaeologists, researchers, and Various treasure hunters to locate his sealed coffin continue to this day. Divers have explored the seabed around Portobello Bay, hoping to uncover the site where one of the most famous English seafarers was laid to rest. It's still out there somewhere. Perhaps even by the time you're watching this video, we will have discovered it. Who knows? But... As of this time in 2024, we have not. Well, his death certainly marked the end of an era. A life characterized by bold ventures, and the substantial impact he had on naval warfare and exploration. Definitely up there with others, like, let's say, Horatio Nelson and... Ferdinand Magellan, certainly up there, for sure. William Shakespeare is widely regarded as one of the greatest writers of the English literary tradition. His extensive body of work includes 154 sonnets, 39 plays, and two narrative poems, spanning tragedy, comedy, 
and historical genres. His masterpieces, such as Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and A Midsummer Night's Dream, have profoundly influenced literature, theatre, and the English language. In fact, he introduced over 1,700 new words to the language. His profound insights into human nature and emotion, combined with his innovative use of language and verse, ensure that his works are celebrated, studied, and performed around the world more than four centuries after his death. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here and it's your first time, it's great to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to see you again. As always, the best way to support the channel is by enjoying the content. Liking and subscribing is a level up from that, and those who wish to go beyond may refer to the description. You'll find where you need to go. Now, with that being said, let us begin. Take a deep breath and relax, and we can begin our biography of William Shakespeare. Born in Stratford-upon-Avon, that being the town of Stratford-upon-the-Avon River, William Shakespeare was baptized on April 26th, 1564. His precise birth date is unknown, but it is traditionally observed on St. George's Day, that's April 23rd, and coincidentally that is the same date that he passed away later in 1616. He was the third child and eldest surviving son of a family of eight, which was a pretty normal size of a family at that time. Born to John Shakespeare, an alderman, and successful glove-maker from Snitterfield. His mother was Mary Arden, a member of a wealthy landowning family. So you could say that he was well and truly middle class. It is widely believed that Shakespeare was educated at the King's New School in Stratford, a free school that was established in 1553, and situated about a quarter mile from his home. Despite the variability in the quality of grammar schools during the Elizabethan era, their curricula were fairly consistent, if you could find one. Students received a rigorous education, centered around Latin texts, as standardized by a royal decree. At the age of eighteen, Shakespeare married a woman by the name of Anne Hathaway, who was 26 at the time. The marriage license was issued by the Diocese of Worcester's Constituary Court on November the 27th, 1582. The following day, the bonds were posted by two of Hathaway's neighbors to ensure there were no legal barriers to their marriage. The haste of the wedding is suggested by the Chancellor's decision to read the bans once, rather than the usual three times. Six months after the wedding, their daughter Susanna was baptized on May 26, 1583. Twins Hamnet and Judith followed, baptized on the 2nd of February, 1585. However, poor little Hamnet died at the age of eleven, with his burial noted on August 11th, 1596. Pretty common back in those days to have a lot of children and not feel too bad about it. Many of them simply wouldn't make it through. Just a fact of life, a very unfortunate one, but a fact nonetheless. Post the birth of his twins, Shakespeare's life becomes a little less documented, until he emerges on the London theatre scene in 1592. The period between 1585 and 1592 is often referred to as Shakespeare's 
lost years. Various anecdotal stories do exist about this time. For example, Nicholas Rowe, who was Shakespeare's first biographer, shared a local legend from Stratford that Shakespeare fled to London to avoid prosecution for poaching deer from the estate of Squire Thomas Lucy, whom he later ridiculed in a satirical ballad. Another 18th century story describes Shakespeare stating, starting, rather, his theatrical career by managing horses for the theatre patrons in London. John Aubrey suggested that Shakespeare had been a country schoolmaster. Some 20th century scholars speculated he worked for Alexandra Houghton of Lancashire. He was a Catholic landowner who mentioned a one William Shakeshaft in his will, which was a common name in Lancashire at the time. Now, the only record of Shakespeare during this period is his appearance on what is called a complaints bill from a Queen's Bench court case dated Michaelmas, term 1588, and October 9th, 1589, and these years, of course, are just filled with stories largely based on hearsay. Illustrates the mystery surrounding his early adult life. But I suppose that's not really what he's remembered for. Well, his exact beginning as a writer is also unclear. But it seems by 1592, several of his plays were known to be staged in London. This attention led to a critical remark from playwright Robert Greene in his works Groat's Worth of Wit, where Greene mocks Shakespeare as an upstart crow, suggesting he was overreaching by comparing himself to university-educated writers such as Thomas Nash and Christopher Marlowe, known at the time as the University Wits. Green's use of shake scene in his critique clearly points to Shakespeare, making this one of the earliest mentions of Shakespeare's work in the theatre. Thus his career likely started sometime between the mid-1580s and just before Green's public rebuke. Well, from 1594 onwards, William exclusively wrote for the Lord Chamberlain's Men, a theatre company he partly owned, and which became London's premier group. After the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, they received a royal patent from King James I, and were renamed the King's Men. The year of 1599 was notable for Shakespeare, he and his partners built the Globe Theatre on the Thames South Bank, that's the main river that goes through London, and took over the Blackfriars Indoor Theatre in 1608. His financial successes from these ventures allowed him to purchase New Place, which at the time was Stratford's second largest house, in 1597 and invest in local tithes in 1605. Shakespeare's works started appearing in quarto editions from 1594, with his name boosting sales by 1598. He continued acting in his and others' plays beyond his writing success. Notably, the 1616 edition of Ben Jonson's works list him as an actor in several plays, indicating he maintained his acting roles alongside writing. However, evidence like his absence from the 1605 Volpon cast suggests a gradual end to his acting career. Yet, he is listed in the first folio of 1623 as a principal actor in many plays, 
some staged after Volpon. Traditions and some speculative sources say he placed roles like, played roles like rather, the ghost of Hamlet's father, and parts in As You Like It and Henry V. Shakespeare balanced his life between London and Stratford throughout his career. He lived on and off in various parts of London, from St. Helens, Bishopgate in 1596, moving to Southwark by 1599, and then to an area quite nearby to St. Paul's Cathedral in 1604, where he rented from Christopher Montjoy, a rather prolific wig maker. Critics often agree that Shakespeare collaborated with other playwrights throughout his career, particularly in the early formative stages and in the late creative stages. His earliest works include Richard III and the three parts of Henry VI, crafted during the early 1590s amidst a trend for historical drama. While the exact dates of Shakespeare's plays are challenging to pinpoint, it is believed that Titus Andronicus, The Comedy of Errors, The Taming of the Shrew, and The Two Gentlemen of Verona may also be from his early period. These initial historical plays, drawing heavily on Raphael Holinshed's 1587 Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, seem to support the legitimacy of the Tudor dynasty by showing the chaos of weak or corrupt leaders. Shakespeare's style in these early works shows the influence of other dramatists like Thomas Kidd and Christopher Marlowe, as well as the conventions of medieval drama and the works of Seneca. His play, The Comedy of Errors, was influenced by classical models, but no clear source has been identified for the taming of the shrew, at least not as of yet. This play possibly linked to a separate play of the same name, and may be derived from a folk tale, along with the Two Gentlemen of Verona, which hints at endorsing several unfortunate aspects such as the R word. It's posed a few challenges for modern critics, directors, and audience due to its narratives on taming a woman's independent spirit. Well, in the mid-1590s, Shakespeare's early comedies, known for their tight double plots and precise sequences, evolved into the romantic atmosphere of his acclaimed works like a Midsummer Night's Dream, a blend of romance, magic, and humor. His next comedy, The Merchant of Venice, presents the vengeful Jewish moneylender Shylock, reflecting the era's prevalent views, but potentially appearing a little derogatory today. Well, I suppose offense is going to depend on who's taking it. This was followed by the wit of Much Ado About Nothing, the rural charm of As You Like It, and the festive spirit of the Twelfth Night. After the poetic Richard II, Shakespeare introduced prose comedy into the histories of the later 1590s with Henry IV, Part I and II, followed by Henry V. Here, the character of Falstaff emerges as a friend to Prince Hal, showcasing a blend of comedic and rather serious tones, paired with the narrative depth of Shakespeare's more mature works. This period includes the tragedies, Romeo and Juliet, a portrayal of passionate adolescence and love leading to death, and of course, Julius Caesar, which introduced a new form of drama, as described by modern James Shapiro, where various strands of politics, character, inwardness, 
contemporary events, and even Shakespeare's own reflections on the act of writing, began to infuse each other. In the early 17th century, Shakespeare penned the problem plays, namely Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and All's Well That Ends Well, alongside several of his best-known tragedies. Critics often view these tragedies as the pinnacle of his art. The character Hamlet, known for the soliloquy, to be or not to be, that is the question, is one of Shakespeare's most analysed and, of course, well-known. In contrast to Hamlet's introspective nature, characters like Othello and Lear seem to act impulsively, which leads to their downfall. These tragedies often focus on such fatal errors or flaws, disrupting order and leading to the demise of the hero and those around him. In Othello, for example, the jealousy stirred by Lego leads to the tragic killing of Othello's innocent wife, Desdemona. In King Lear, titular characters designed to relinquish his power sets off a chain of events leading to the murder of his own daughter, Cordelia, and of course the blinding of the Earl of Gloucester, described by critic Frank Kermode as offering neither the characters nor the abundance any relief from its cruelty. In Macbeth, ambition drives the titular character and his wife to murder the rightful king and usurp his throne, leading to their eventual destruction. This play integrates a supernatural element into its framework. His final major tragedies, Antony and Cleopatra and Coriolanus, showcase some of Shakespeare's finest poetry, and according to T.S. Eliot, are among his most f successful tragedies. T.S. Eliot also commented that, and I quote, Shakespeare acquired more essential history from Plutarch than most men could from the whole British Museum. In this last phase, Shakespeare turned to romance or tragic comedy. You know, a mix of tragedy and comedy. Finishing plays like Kimberline, The Winter's Tale and The Tempest, as well as the collaborative work Pericles, Prince of Tyre. These plays, less grim than the earlier tragedies, end with reconciliation and forgiveness for potentially tragic mistakes. Some critics view this change as evidence of a more peaceful outlook in Shakespeare's final years, though it may simply reflect theatrical trends. He also worked with John Fletcher on two more plays, Henry VIII and The Two Noble Kinsmen. These collaborations and his final plays suggest a culmination of Shakespeare's evolving artistry, ending with a focus on redemption and reconciliation in his later works. In the late 19th century, Edward Dowden reclassified four of Shakespeare's later comedies as romances, due to their unique blend of comedic and tragic elements, though many scholars today refer to them as what is called tragicomedies, and the term has been widely adopted, not just for Shakespearean works. Shakespeare's early plays were performed by various troops, as indicated by the 1594 quarto of Titus Andronicus, which lists three different companies. Following the plagues of 1592-93, to 93, his plays were primarily performed by his own troop, probably because the other troops were all dead. I'm just speculating. Well, first they were performed at the Theatre, creative name, I know, and then at the Curtain in Shoreditch, which is north of the Thames. 
the public's enthusiasm for Shakespeare's characters, like Falstaff and Hal, made the plays extremely popular. A dispute with uh, their landlord, actually, led the company to dismantle the theatre. That was the name of the venue, not the venue itself. And reuse its timbers to construct the famous Globe Theatre on the south banks of the Thames at Southwark in 1599. The Globe, which opened in the autumn of that year, was a rather innovative playhouse, built by and for actors, where many of Shakespeare's most celebrated plays, including Hamlet, Othello, and King Lear, were performed. The renaming of the Lord Chamberlain's men to the King's men in 1603 marked the beginning of a close relationship with King James I. Court records from 1604 to 05 show that the King's men performed several of Shakespeare's plays, including two renditions of The Merchant of Venice. Post-1608, the troops split their performances between the Globe in the summer, and the indoor Blackfriars Theatre in the winter. The more elaborate staging possible at the Blackfriars, combined with the Jacobean trend for lavishly staged masks, allowed Shakespeare to introduce more sophisticated stage effects. In Kimberline, for instance, Jupiter descends amidst thunder and lightning, marking a shift in theatrical presentation. Key actors in Shakespeare's company included Richard Burbage, who originated roles such as Richard III, Othello, Hamlet, and King Lear. William Kempe, known for his comedic roles like Peter in Romeo and Juliet, and Dogbury in Much Ado About Nothing. And later, Robert Armin, who took over from Kemp around 1600 to play parts like Touchstone in As You Like It and The Fool in King Lear. In 613, an eyewitness account by Sir Henry Woden describes a performance of Henry VIII with, and I quote, many extraordinary circumstances of pomp and ceremony. Sounds like my kind of a show. On the 29th of June in that same year, 1613, apparently a cannon had misfired and set the attached roof of the globe on fire. Of course, the globe's roof was a thatched one, which is notoriously inflammable. Well, the entire theatre ended up burning down. But they did reconstruct it and today it still stands on the banks of the Thames. You can go visit it. It kind of sticks out among all the modern buildings in London, a testament to the old architecture, although I'm sure they won't be firing any cannons in or at the building any time soon. Well, in 1623... John Hemmings and Henry Condell, fellow actors from The King's Men and close friends of Shakespeare, compiled and published the First Folio, which was a comprehensive collection of Shakespeare's plays. This edition is significant because it includes 36 plays, 18 of which that had not previously been published. The plays that had appeared before this folio were only available as quartos, which were of course notoriously inexpensive and often inaccurately printed. The first folio criticises these earlier versions as stolen and surreptitious copies. Alfred Pollard, referring to some of these early quartos as bad quartos, due to their erroneous and often distorted texts, possibly reconstructed from the actor's memories or audience notes. 
Significant textual variations are found among the surviving versions of the players, attributable to a mix of printing mistakes, notes from actors or the audience, and even potential revisions by Shakespeare himself. Notably, plays like Hamlus, Troilus and Cressida and Othello might have been revised by Shakespeare between their quarto and folio editions. In the case of King Lear, the text of the 1608 quarto and the 1623 folio are so different that they are often published separately to avoid any confusion, and you can see this in the Oxford Shakespeare edition. Well, during 1593 and 94, a plague led to the closure of theatres, prompting Shakespeare to shift his focus, and while he was trying to figure out what to do, he decided on Raid Shadow Legends. No, I'm just kidding. I had to put a raid joke in there. He switched his focus to poetry, rather. He published two narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, and the R word of Lucrece. You know, I can't say that word on YouTube. They don't like it. Dedicating them to Henry Riothsley, the Earl of Southampton. Venus and Adonis depicts the goddess Venus's unrequited love for the beautiful youth Adonis, while the R word of Lucrece tells the tragic story of the title character, who is R worded by the lustful Tarquin. Both poems, drawing from Ovid's Metamorphosis, explore the themes of lust and its moral consequences and become quite popular during Shakespeare's lifetime. A Lover's Complaint, another narrative poem about a seduced young woman, and The Phoenix and the Turtle, an allegory about the death of a mythical phoenix and his love a turtle dove, were also attributed to Shakespeare. In 1599, two of his sonnets, 138 and 144, were published without his permission in a work titled The Passionate Pilgrim. The Sonnets of Shakespeare, a collection of 154 poems, were published in 1609, marking his last non-dramatic work to appear in print. These sonnets, written throughout his career for a private audience, reflect deep themes such as love, passion, beauty, mortality, and time. Francis Marys mentioned Shakespeare's Sugred sonnets in 1598, suggesting they were shared privately among friends before their official publication. The sequence of the sonnets in the published version doesn't appear to follow Shakespeare's original order, and seems to be divided into two contrasting series, one about a dark-complexioned woman, creatively titled The Dark Lady, and another about a fair young man, titled The Fair Youth. This division has led to much speculation about the identities of these individuals, and whether they are real or fictional, or if the narrative voice of is actually Shakespeare himself. Wordsworth famously said that Shakespeare unlocked his heart with these sonnets. The 1609 edition of the sonnets publication was dedicated to a Mr. W. H., described as the only begetter of the poems. The identity of this Mr. W. H., whether he is the mysterious patron or perhaps an orchestrator in getting the sonnets published, remains unknown. This dedication could have been penned by Shakespeare or perhaps the publisher, Thomas Thorpe, 
whose initials appear on the dedication page. The sonnets are lauded for their exploration of love, desire, procreation, and themes of mortality. Well, at the outset of his career, the early plays, including The Two Gentlemen of Verona and Titus Andronicus, adhered to the more conventional styles and rigid structures of the day, characterized by stylized language and extended metaphors. Critics have pointed out that these grandiose speeches sometimes slowed the action, with reverse, with verse rather, that could appear overwrought or perhaps even stilted. Shakespeare, however, quickly began to modify these classical forms and suit his own dramatic purposes, certainly taking the basics and tweaking them and changing them to his own style. An early indication of this evolving process is evident in Richard III's opening soliloquy, which recalls the medieval drama's vice, but also anticipates the deeper self-reflection seen in his later plays. His approach didn't shift overnight, however. Rather, Shakespeare blended tradition and innovative styles throughout the course of his career, with Romeo and Juliet and Richard II demonstrating a particularly effective mix of these techniques. And also, go and watch my video on Richard II. It was, if I do say so myself, a banger. Well, by the mid-1590s, including works like A Midsummer Night's Dream, his poetry had become quite a bit more natural, adjusting metaphors and imagery more closely to the narrative's requirements. Shakespeare's preferred verse form was blank verse, written in unrhymed iambic pentameter. This structure typically meant that each line was made up of ten syllables, with an emphasis on every second syllable. The blank verse in his early plays, while quite nice to read, was often a little monotonous, with lines frequently pausing at their end. Over time, Shakespeare began to break this pattern, introducing more rhythmical variety and depth. This evolution is particularly evident in Julius Caesar and Hamlet, where he disrupts the flow to mirror the character's emotional turmoil. For instance, in Hamlet, Shakespeare writes, and I'll read a little bit from it now, Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting that would not let me sleep. Me thought I lay worse than the mutinies in the bilbos. Rashly, and praised be rashness for it, let us know. Our indiscretion sometimes serves us well. As he moved into the late tragedies, his style grew even more varied and intense, as seen in Macbeth, where the language shifts rapidly among metaphors and similes, demanding more from the listener to piece together the full and deeper meaning. His later works, including the romances, feature abrupt plot shifts and complex sentence structures, creating a sense of spontaneity and fluidity. Shakespeare was not only a poetic genius, but he also had a pragmatic sense of theatre. He often adapted stories from classical sources such as Plutarch's Lives and Hollingshed's Chronicles reshaping each narrative to broaden its appeal and present, present rather, multiple perspectives. His skill in plot design meant that his plays could endure substantial adaptation or translation without losing their intrinsic drama. I'm sure we've all seen the adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. You know, the one you probably watched in high school with Leonardo DiCaprio and... I forgot the other person that was in it. Wasn't Kate Winslet, wasn't it? Maybe she was in Titanic, I'm not sure. 
But, yes, it was adapted for modern times, but the story was still there. It was the same story with a different coat of paint. And Shakespeare stories are very easy to do this with. Well, in his later years, particularly in his romance works, he revisited the more formalized styles of his earlier works, enhancing the theatrical illusion. Throughout his career, he developed characters with more nuanced motivations and distinct speech patterns, while maintaining elements of his earlier style in subsequent plays. Nicholas Rowe was the first biographer to note the tradition, which Samuel Johnson later echoed, that Shakespeare retired to Stratford a few years before his death. In 1608, he was still active as an actor in London. Cuthbert Burbage mentioned that after acquiring the lease of the Blackfriars Theatre from Henry Evans in 1608, the King's Men, which included Hemings, Condell, Shakespeare, etc., were stationed there as players. Of course, the bubonic plague's presence in London throughout 1609, and repeated closures of public playhouses, over sixty months closed between May 1603 and February 1610 due to the plague, meant that actors often lacked work. I suppose some things never change. Rare was complete retirement at this time. Shakespeare continued his visits to London in 1611 to 1614. In 1612, during the Bellot v. Montjoy case, he testified about the marriage settlement of Montjoy's daughter, Mary. In March 1613, he purchased a gatehouse in the former Blackfriars Priory, and from November 1614, he spent several weeks in London with his son-in-law, John Hall. After 1610, his writings began to slow down, and we don't have any works, at least ones we've discovered, that are attributed to him post-1613. His final three plays were collaborations, likely with John Fletcher, who succeeded him as the King's Men's House playwright. Thus Shakespeare retired in 1613, before the Globe Theatre burned down, during that performance of Henry VIII on the 29th of June. Shakespeare then passed away on the 23rd of April, 1616, at the age of 52, which is pretty young, for someone with money at least. Back in those days, if you were poor dying at 52, well, that was normal. But... Usually, the better off you were, the better living standard you would have, cleaner home. Well, unfortunately, Shakespeare didn't live that long. But, as they say, the candle that burns twice as bright only burns for half the time. Well, he died shortly after drafting his will, which began by declaring him, ironically, in perfect health. No contemporary source that we have clarifies his death's cause or nature. About fifty years later, John Ward, the vicar of Stratford, wrote in his notes, Shakespeare, Drayton, and Ben Johnson had a merry meeting, and, it seems, drank too hard, for Shakespeare died of a fever he contracted there. And this was a believable scenario, since Shakespeare was indeed quite acquainted with both Johnson and Drayton. Tributes from other writers reference his relatively abrupt demise, such as, We wandered, Shakespeare, that thou wentst so soon, from the world's stage to the grave's tiring room. 
He left behind his wife and two daughters. Susanna married the physician John Hall in 1607, and Judith wed Thomas Quinney, a vintner, two months before Shakespeare's death. On the 25th of March, 1616, Shakespeare signed his last will and testament. Thomas Quinley, his new son-in-law, was found guilty of fathering an illegitimate son by Margaret Wheeler, who died in childbirth. Thus, the court ordered Quinley to do public penance, bringing embarrassment to the Shakespeare family. His substantial estate was left primarily to the eldest daughter, Susanna, with the condition that it be passed intact to the first son of her body. The Quinney's three children all died without marrying. The Hall's only child, Elizabeth, married twice, but died without children in 1670. And with that, Shakespeare's direct lineage was ended. His will makes scant mention of his wife, Anne, likely already entitled to a third of his estate. However, he notably bequeathed her my second best bed, a legacy that has sparked quite a bit of speculation. Some scholars interpret the bequest as an insult, while others believe that the second best bed had significant matrimonial value. Well, Shakespeare was interred in the chancel of the Holy Trinity Church two days after his death. His grave's stone slab is inscribed with a curse moving his remains, which was carefully heeded during the church's 2008 restoration. And it goes like this. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Prior to 1623, a memorial monument was erected on the north wall of the church, featuring a half-effigy of Shakespeare writing. The plaque compares him to Nestor, Socrates, and Virgil. Numerous statues and memorials worldwide commemorate Shakespeare, including funeral monuments in Southwark Cathedral and the Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. So we all know that Shakespeare's work has profoundly influenced later theatre and literature. It's left an impact on the dramatic potential of character development, plot construction, language, and just the whole genre. For instance, before Romeo and Juliet, romance was not considered a suitable subject for tragedy. At least, not in the Western tradition. Look back on Chinese plays, and it's pretty much all tragedies. Soliloquies, once primarily used to convey information, were transformed by Shakespeare into this new method for exploring deep character thoughts. But his influence extends beyond drama and into poetry where the Romantic poets tried unsuccessfully to revive Shakespearean verse drama. It's been remarked that all English verse dramas from Coleridge to Tennyson are merely feeble variations on Shakespearean themes, at least that's what critic George Steiner has stated, and some are inclined to agree with him. John Milton, a pivotal English poet post-Shakespeare, also praised him, saying in that beautiful old language, Thou, in our wonder and astonishment, hast built thyself a lifelong monument. His impact is also evident in the works of novelists like Thomas Hardy, William Faulkner, and the great 
Charles Dickens. Herman Melville's soliloquies in Moby Dick are heavily influenced by Shakespeare, with Captain Ahab echoing the tragic heroism of King Lear. Over 20,000 musical compositions have been inspired by Shakespeare, including Felix Mendelssohn's Overture for A Midsummer Night's Dream and Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet's Ballet. And it's not just that. He's got his fair share of opera inspiration. Giuseppe Verdi's Macbeth, Othello and Falstaff stand in high critical regard on their own, comparable to their Shakespearean sources. Well, visual arts, too, have drawn from Shakespeare, with Romantics and Pre-Raphaelites finding inspiration in his plays. William Hogarth's 1745 portrayal of David Garrick as Richard III established the genre of theatrical portraiture in Britain. And even Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst who, in my opinion, thinks too much, that is possible, used Shakespearean characters, particularly from Hamlet, to frame his theories of human psychology. Well, to a more modern arena of expression, in film, Shakespeare's narratives have also been widely adapted. In ways that you might not think as well. Are you aware of Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese director? Well, his throne of blood and ran reimagined Macbeth and King Lear, respectively. Max Reinhardt's A Midsummer Night's Dream, Laurence Olivier's Hamlet, and even Al Pacino's Looking for Richard show the range of Shakespeare's influence. Orson Welles' works, especially his portrayal of Falstaff in Chimes at Midnight, are also celebrated for their Shakespearean adaptations. Shakespeare's language also played a significant role in shaping modern English. In fact, Samuel Johnson, in his pioneering of a dictionary of the English language, relied quite heavily on Shakespeare. Phrases like, with bated breath, from the Merchant of Venice, and a foregone conclusion, are now commonplace in English. In fact, because it is so fun, I'm just going to read through a few not all, of course, but a few of the little phrases we have in the English language that are from Shakespeare. You might be surprised. All that glitters isn't gold. Be all and end all. It's all Greek to me. More sinned against than sinning. A method in the madness. Too much of a good thing. The lady doth protest too much. Foregone conclusion. Hot-blooded. Flaming youth. Each dog will have his day. Clothes make the man. And finally, witching time of the night. And perhaps you are listening in that witching time of the night where your eyes become heavier and you drift off to a good dream. Perhaps in your part of the world, and at the time you are listening, it will be midsummer. Well, drift off to that midsummer night's dream then, in keeping with our theme for the video. Edward I of England, known as Edward Longshanks, due to his imposing height and long legs, a formidable monarch whose reign was from 1272 to 1307, marked by ambitious administrative reforms and military campaigns. His rule is notably remembered for his efforts to consolidate the territories of Wales and Scotland under English dominance, 
leading to extensive campaigns in both regions. A conquest that culminated with the construction of an iron ring of massive stone castles that secured English control. In Scotland, his attempts to enforce authority culminated in the wars of Scottish independence, famously opposed by figures such as William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to have you back here again. As always, if you like what I do and wish to support the channel, Patreon link is in the description. Otherwise, help me reach my goal of 10,000 subscribers by subscribing to the channel and liking the video, as that helps push it out a little better. Now, with that out of the way, let's get on to our topic for today. Please take a deep breath, relax, and we can begin our full biography of Edward Longshanks. Edward was born during the evening of the 17th to the 18th of June, on 1239, at the Palace of Westminster. He was the son of Eleanor of Provence and King Henry III. This name, Edward, was unusual among aristocracy post-Norman conquest, and it was chosen by his father in homage to Edward the Confessor. The celebrations of his birth were, of course, elaborate and widespread, culminating in his baptism at Westminster Abbey three days later. Known as the Lord Edward until his accession in 1272, he was raised in the company of his cousin, Henry of Almain, son of King Henry's brother, Richard of Cornwall, who remained his lifelong companion and close friend. His early upbringing was managed by Hugh Giffard initially, and later by Bartholomew Pesch, after Giffard's death in 1246. Well, in terms of education, it was pretty typical for a noble of his time. We're talking about topics such as military strategy, though specific details are scarce, along with the general education in rhetoric and philosophy, theology, the like. Throughout his childhood, he faced several health challenges, notably in the years 1246, 47, and 1251. But regardless of that, he managed to develop into a strong and athletic individual, standing at an impressive 6 feet 2, that's 188 centimeters for those living in civilized countries, which earned him the nickname Long Shanks. His physical prowess was an asset in his military and equestrian activities, and despite a reported lisp, he was apparently a very persuasive speaker. In response to fears of a Castilian attack on the English-held territory of Gascony, a marriage was arranged in 1254 between the then 15-year-old Edward and Eleanor of Castile, then 13, the half-sister of King Alfonso X of Castile. Their wedding took place on the 1st of November 1254 in the Abbey of St. Maria le Real de la Hulgas in Castile, solidifying a political alliance that included a renunciation by Alfonso of claims in Gascony, and also subsequent land grants to Edward. Always helps grease the wheels a little. This union later enabled Edward to inherit the county of Ponthieu in 1279, but we'll get to that a little later. Henry III had granted Edward extensive lands 
including parts of Wales, Ireland, and Gascony in 1254, though he retained significant control over these, particularly the income from Ireland. Edward's real authority in Gascony was somewhat limited, as Simon de Montfort had already been drawing income from the region. After his marriage to Eleanor, the couple entered Gascony, where Edward began to assert more political independence, proclaiming himself as its prince and lord. From 1254 to 1257, Edward's actions were heavily influenced by his mother's Savoyard family, especially her uncle, Peter II of Savoy. After 1257, his affiliation shifted towards the Lusignan group, led by his father's half-brothers, including William de Valence. This alignment with the foreign-born Lusignans was pretty unpopular among the established nobility, and this set the stage for future conflicts among the barons. Chroniclers like Matthew Paris critiqued Edward's circle for their disruptive behaviour, casting Edward's leadership qualities in questionable light during these formative years. Edward began demonstrating his political autonomy as early as 1255, notably siding with the Solar family against the Colomb family in Gascony. This stance conflicted with King Henry III's preference for mediating between local disputes, showing Edward's early streak of independence. By the May of 1258, discontent with royal governance led to provisions of Oxford, aimed at primarily curtailing the influence of Edward's political allies, the Lusignans. Initially, Edward resisted these reforms staunchly in support of his allies. However, his stance evolved significantly by the March of 1259, when he formed an alliance with Richard de Clare, the sixth Earl of Gloucester, and a prominent reformer. By the October of that same year, Edward openly declared his support for the baronial reform movement led by Simon de Montfort, the Earl of Leicester. This apparent shift may have been strategic, aligning with Leicester to help bolster his position in Gascony. When King Henry III departed for France in November, Edward's actions verged on insubordination. He appointed several reformers to key positions, leading his father to suspect a possible coup. Upon Henry's return, the father and son were estranged until reconciled through the efforts of Richard of Cornwall and Archbishop Boniface. In November of 1260, Edward's alignment shifted again as he rejoined the Lusignans, who were then exiled in France. Returning to England in 1262, he experienced financial disputes with some of the Lusignans, leading to further estrangement. King Henry then assigned him to military campaigns in Wales against Lewin ap Gruford in 1263, which achieved very minimal success, and saw Edward's forces surrounded and besieged. Things began to change again with the return of Simon de Montfort in England in 1263, reigniting baronial demands for reform. As the king appeared somewhat likely to capitulate, Edward adopted a more decisive role in defending royal prerogatives. He reconciled with previously alienated allies, including Henry of Almain and John de Warren, the sixth Earl of Surrey, and successfully captured Windsor Castle from the rebel forces. 
the series of events culminated in the Mies of Amiens, brokered by King Louis IX of France in 1264, which decisively favoured the royalist cause, but also set the stage for further conflicts. From 1264 to 1267, during the Second Barons' War, Edward took an active role in the conflict against the baronial forces led by Simon de Montfort. The hostilities began when Edward captured Gloucester, which was under rebel control. Following this, Edward engaged Robert de Ferrers, the sixth Earl of Derby, and managed to negotiate a truce. However, Edward later breached this agreement by launching an assault and capturing Northampton from Simon de Montfort the Younger, subsequently initiating a punitive expedition against Derby's territories. The pivotal Battle of Luz occurred on the 14th of May, 1264, where Edward commanded the right flank. He initially achieved success by routing Leicester's London forces, but his decision to pursue the fleeing enemy led him away from the main battle. Upon his return, he discovered that the rest of the royalist forces had been crushed. Consequently, Edward and his cousin Henry of Almain were captured and handed over as hostages under the terms established by the Mies of Lewis. Edward remained a prisoner until the March of 1265, under close watch, even following his release. His escape on the 28th of May while horse-riding in Hereford marked a turning point. He promptly joined forces with Gilbert de Clare, the 7th Earl of Gloucester, who had recently switched allegiances to support the king. Together, they easily recaptured Worcester and Gloucester. Edward's military campaign continued as he intercepted Leicester, who was attempting to unite with his son, Simon, and their new ally, Llewellyn. Edward's strategic movements led him to Kenilworth Castle, catching Simon the Younger by surprise, before he decisively confronted Leicester at the Battle of Evesham on the 4th of August, 1265, a battle that concluded with Leicester's defeat and subsequent death, marking a significant victory for the royal forces. Edward's tactics throughout the summer of 1265 such as the breach of truce with the Earl of Derby, earned him a reputation for being somewhat, how can we say, untrustworthy. Regardless, his subsequent military successes and leniency towards defeated enemies helped him regain respect and admiration. The conflict extended beyond Leicester's death, with Edward addressing remaining pockets of resistance. He negotiated a settlement with Simon the Younger in Lincolnshire and led to a successful operation against the Sank Ports. The protracted siege at Kenilworth Castle, which only yielded the following dictum of Kenilworth, highlighted the ongoing instability. Edward's political role expanded during this period. He was appointed Lord Warden of the Sank Ports in 1265, and took on significant governmental responsibilities as Steward of England. Despite his involvement in domestic politics, Edward was primarily focused on organising his impending crusade, showing a swift shift in priorities away from the internal strife of the Second Baron's War. In a grand ceremony on the 24th of June, 1268, Edward made public the commitment to embark on a new crusade, alongside his brother Edmund Crouchback. 
funny name, isn't it? And his cousin, Henry of Almain, as well as other former foes, such as John de Vesci, the seventh Earl of Gloucester. Although Gloucester ultimately decided not to participate. This move came after domestic stability had finally been restored, with the main hurdle to the, cons to the crusade, rather, being financial constraints. They simply just did not have enough money, and crusades were notoriously expensive. Just ask Constantinople. Well, King Louis the Ninth of France contributed a loan of about seventeen and a half thousand pounds to the cause. However, additional funds were of course necessary, and this led to the levy of a direct tax on the laity in the May of 1270, and this was significant since it was the first tax since 1237, which Parliament actually sanctioned in exchange for the reconfirmation of the Magna Carta and restrictions on Jewish money lending. Thus, Edward set sail for France on the 20th of August 1270. The initial plan of the Crusade was to aid the Christian stronghold of Arca in Palestine. However, upon the French king Louis and his brother Charles of Anjou, the king of Sicily, redirecting the crusade attack to Tunis, the campaign was disrupted by an epidemic that claimed Louis on August the 25th. By the time Edward had showed up to Tunis, a treaty with the emir had already been signed by Charles, and there was simply no further action to take. So they all just went home. Despite plans to resume military affairs in the following spring, a severe storm dissuaded further campaigning by Charles and Philip III, Louis's successor. Undeterred, Edward sailed from Sicily and landed at Acre on the 9th of May 1271. Upon arrival, Edward found the Christian forces in Acre under significant pressure from the Muslims, led by the Mamluk Sultan Baibars. Despite the limited impact on his forces, Edward's presence bolstered the city's defence, and he conducted a series of military engagements, including a raid, albeit a futile one, at St. Georges de Lebain and a strategic but ultimately unsuccessful raid on Kharkun, a potential launch point for the recapture of Jerusalem. Diplomatic efforts to align with the Mongols against Baibars yielded a temporary distraction, but ultimately no strategic advantage. With the situation growing ever more and more desperate, a ten-year truce with Baibars was signed by Hugh III of Cyprus on the May, in May rather, of 1272. The following month, Edward survived an assassination attempt by the Nizari Ismailis, allegedly under orders from Baibars. They say allegedly, but it was pretty obvious. Though he did kill the assassin. The attack left Edward severely weakened, hastening his decision to conclude the crusade. Thus, Edward departed Arger on September 24, 1272, and learned of his father's death upon reaching Sicily. He did not take the news well. Despite the personal loss, though, he didn't rush back to England. He took a different route through Italy and France, where he visited Pope Gregory X and paid homage to Philip III. His travels included a stop in Savoy to affirm feudal allegiances. His return to Gascony to address administrative and rebellious challenges showcased his interest in governance and 
feudal management. Thus, Edward's European journey concluded with his return to England on August the 2nd, 1274, two years after he heard of his father's death, and subsequently his coronation on August the 19th of the same year at Westminster Abbey, where he notably removed his crown post-ceremony to signify his intent to restore the full authority and territories of the crown. Llewellyn ap Gruford found himself in a relatively favourable position after the Barons' War, with the 1267 Treaty of Montgomery acknowledging his control over the four cantrefs of Perford Wallad, and sorry about my Welsh pronunciation, and formally recognising his title as the Prince of Wales. However, conflicts persisted, particularly with some macho lords such as the Earl of Gloucester and Roger Mortimer, among others. The situation was worsened in 1274, when Llewellyn's younger brother, David, and another Welsh prince by the name of, and I'll do my best, Grufid ad Gwenwinwin, after a failed attempt on Llewellyn's life, defected to the English side. Llewellyn's refusal to pay homage to King Edward citing ongoing hostilities and Edward's sheltering of his adversaries, and plans to marry Eleanor, daughter of Simon de Montfort, made tensions a lot more tense. Now, it leads us to November 1276, where Edward I responded by declaring war on Llewellyn, the campaign initially involved leaders like Roger Mortimer, and included significant forces, reflecting Edward's comprehensive approach to the conflict. Despite early successes, Llewellyn faced internal weaknesses among his followers. By the July of 1277, Edward had launched a full-scale invasion, amassing a large army that faced very little resistance and led to Llewellyn's quick capitulation. Thus, the Treaty of Aberconway later that year significantly reduced Llewellyn's territory to the land of Gwynedd and curtailed his power, though he was allowed to retain the title of Prince of Wales, so small victories, take it where you can get it. However, the war reignited in 1282 under different circumstances. It was characterized by broader Welsh support and a stronger nationalistic fervor spurred by opposition to the new English laws, which were not very popular. The conflict began with a revolt led by David Ab Grufid and quickly saw other Welsh leaders including Llewellyn, join. The Welsh initially saw success, such as the defeat of the English forces at the Battle of the Landalo Fower. However, the campaign turned against the Welsh, with the capture and subsequent execution of Daffid, and the death of Llewellyn at the Battle of Orwin Bridge, which marked significant blows to Welsh independence. Edward I's conquest led to the Statute of Rutland in 1284, integrating Wales into the English legal framework and initiating a policy of English settlements and extensive castle building, supervised by the master architect James of St. George. These castles, such as Beaumaris and Carnarfon, were not only military bastions, but they also served as symbols of Edward's authority and intent to maintain dominion over Wales. The birth of Edward's son, 
the future Edward II, at Carnarvon Castle in 1284, was likely a staged event to cement the symbolism of English permanence in Wales. In 1301, the child was made the first English Prince of Wales, a title intended to signify the integration of Wales under English governance, and provide the prince with a substantive role in the English aristocracy. Edward's aspirations for another crusade influenced much of his foreign policy until 1291, aiming to orchestrate a pan-European crusade by preventing conflicts among European rulers. A key issue was the tension between the French Capetian House of Anjou, ruling southern Italy, and the crown of Aragon in Spain. The Sicilian Vespers uprising in 1282 against Charles of Anjou, where the Sicilians sought aid from Peter III of Aragon, led to the Aragonese War. During this conflict, Charles of Anjou's son, Charles of Salerno, was captured, escalating tensions and raising the threat of a broader European war. Edward intervened to mediate between France and Aragon in Paris in 1286, facilitating a truce that included the release of Charles of Salerno. Despite Edward's efforts, the fall of Acre to the Mamluks in 1291 was a significant setback to his crusading plans, marking the end of the era of Christian strongholds in the Holy Land. Edward also devoted considerable attention to Gascony, his French duchy. In 1278, he appointed a commission to investigate governance there, leading to widespread administrative changes. His personal visit in 1286 was marked by a serious accident in which he survived a fall from a tower, an event followed by the expulsion of Jews from the region, ostensibly as a gesture of thanks for his survival. The status of Gascony as part of the Kingdom of France continually posed diplomatic challenges, notably in 1294 when Edward's refusal to appear before the French king Philip IV to discuss maritime conflicts led to the temporary forfeiture of the duchy. Thus, Edward's engagement with the Mongol Empire was another facet of his international policy, aimed at forming an alliance to reclaim the Holy Land, and he wasn't the first one with that idea. Both sides were trying to get the Mongols to do as they wanted them to do. Well, contacts included receiving Mongol envoys in Gascony in 1287, and sending his own ambassadors to the Mongols, reflecting a serious consideration of a Mongol-European alliance that, if came to fruition, could certainly turn the tide in the Near East. Well, the death of his wife, Eleanor of Castile, in November of 1290, had a profound effect on Edward, who commemorated her with the Eleanor Crosses, marching each overnight stop of her funeral possession. The political necessity later led him to marry Philip IV's sister, Margaret, in 1299, a union simply meant to secure peace with France. The marriage concluded, and the protracted Anglo-French conflicts that had drained the resources and achieved little, culminating in a peace that saw the partial return of Gascony to English control in 1303. By the 1280s, the relationship between England and Scotland was marked by relatively peaceful coexistence, at least compared to before. The issue of homage was less contentious compared to Wales, and in 1278, King Alexander III of Scotland 
who was also Edward's brother-in-law, paid homage to Edward. But this was understood to be for Alexander's English lands only. The real complications began following the death of Alexander III in 1286, who left behind his three-year-old granddaughter, Margaret, as his sole direct heir. Under the Treaty of Bergam, it was agreed that the young Margaret would marry Edward's son, Edward of Carnarvon, ensuring Scotland's independence from English overlordship, despite the union. However, Margaret's untimely death in Orkney in 1290 during her journey from Norway to Scotland precipitated a succession crisis, known as the Great Cause, with no clear heir to the Scottish throne. Amongst the numerous claimants, John Balliol and Robert de Bruce were their primary contenders. Thus the Scottish nobility requested Edward's involvement in the adjudication, but not as an arbitrator. This decision was to be made by 104 auditors, appointed equally among the claimants, and Edward who would choose the final twenty-four from among Scotland's most senior political figures. Initially indifferent to the matter of suzerainty at Birgham, Edward now sees the opportunity to assert some of his authority, insisting on being recognised as Scotland's feudal overlord, if he could indeed resolve the dispute. The Scots were not happy with this, and they resisted it, arguing that without a king they lacked the authority to agree on such terms. The issue was, however, temporarily resolved when the claimants agreed to temporarily cede authority over Scotland to Edward until a king could be chosen and agreed upon. In November of 1292, and after quite a lengthy process and debate, John Balliol was finally declared king. Edward's dominance over Scotland did not end with Balliol's coronation, however. He overstepped his bounds by agreeing to hear appeals against decisions made by the Scottish guardians during the interregnum and further strained relations by demanding Balliol attend the English Parliament to answer charges in a legal dispute, which was, of course, an affront to Scottish sovereignty. Stay in your lane. Well, Edward's subsequent demand for Scottish military support against France was the last straw, leading Scotland to ally with France and attack Carlisle, albeit unsuccessfully, but they were still rather angry. In retaliation, Edward invaded Scotland in 1296, capturing Berwick upon Tweed in a very savage assault, and crushing the Scottish resistance at the Battle of Dunbar. Edward then took symbolic control by removing the Stone of Destiny to Westminster and deposing Balliol, who was imprisoned in the Tower of London. English administrators were installed to govern Scotland. Though Edward's campaign was initially successful, this dominance was not to last. Edward was known far and wide for his formidable and sometimes volatile temperament. One incident vividly illustrating this intimidating presence involves the Dean of St. Paul's, who collapsed and died from fright before he could protest Edward's heavy taxation in 1295. Another case involved the 14th century Archbishop of York, whose death was attributed to Edward's severe treatment of him. Edward's fierceness was not just a matter of hearsay. 
His explosive anger was also directed towards his own family, as demonstrated when he allegedly pulled out clumps of his son Edward of Carnarvon's hair in rage over the young man's request for an earldom for his favourite, Piers Gaveston. Despite the fierce aspects of his character, Edward could show a softer side, especially towards his family. He was known to be particularly close to his daughters, often bestowing lavish gifts upon them during their visits to court. His reputation as a king, however, was shaped by his strong leadership qualities rather than his warmth and gentle feminine side. Described by a contemporary song as a leopard, known for its powerful and unpredictable nature, Edward was both respected and feared, which contributed to the lack of armed rebellions during his reign. Nobody was really wanting to go up against him. Edward was seen by his contemporaries as embodying the ideal of kingship, excelling as a soldier and adhering to the chivalric codes of the time. He was also devoutly religious, regularly attending chapel, generously distributing alms and showing deep reverence for the Virgin Mary, and also St. Thomas Becket, who he was a great fan of. His commitment to the royal touch ritual, believed to cure scrofula, further cemented his role as a traditional medieval monarch. Records indicate that he might have touched over a thousand people annually to heal them. What records don't indicate is the success rate of this medical procedure. His relations with the church, however, were complex and often strained. Edward frequently clashed with the archbishops of Canterbury, and even with the papacy over issues such as ecclesiastical taxation, reflecting the ongoing tensions between secular and religious authorities. If there's one thing the church does not like, it is being taxed. Now, Edward's fascination with the Arthurian legends also played its own role in its cultural and political activities. He made a pilgrimage to Glastonbury Abbey to open what was believed to be the tomb of King Arthur and Guinevere, and he retrieved what he believed to be Arthur's crown from Lillewyn after conquering North Wales. His Welsh castle-building campaign was heavily influenced by the Arthurian myths, both in design and geographic choice. Edward also organized the Round Table events, complete with tournaments and feasts, drawing deliberate parallels between his court and that of King Arthur to enhance his own status and kingship in the eyes of his subjects and contemporaries. Immediately after becoming king, he acted to restore order and strengthen royal authority, which had somewhat diminished during his father's reign. One of his first actions was a comprehensive overhaul of administrative personnel, including Robert Burnell as Chancellor in 1274, a position Burnell held until 1292. That same year, Edward replaced many local officials, such as escritors and sheriffs, to prepare for a nationwide inquest. This inquest aimed to address grievances against royal officials and identify crown lands lost under Henry III's rule. The outcome of the inquest was documented in the Hundred Rolls, somewhat reminiscent of the Domesday Book, and these documents formed the basis for later legal proceedings, known as Quo Moranto. These proceedings were designed to challenge the basis, or warrant, of liberties held without royal sanction. 
the statutes of Westminster in 1275 and 1285, and the statute of Gloucester in 1278, implemented these changes, particularly increasing the pleas of quo warranto, handled by the itinerant justices. This extensive review of liberties caused quite a bit of alarm among the aristocracy, who argued that long-standing practice should suffice as evidence of entitlement. A compromise in the 1290 established that any liberty practiced since Richard the Lionheart's coronation in 1189 was legitimate. Although few liberties were reclaimed by the crown, Edward succeeded in affirming the principle that all liberties certainly did originate from the crown. This period also saw a significant shift in legislative reform, marking one of Edward's most impactful contributions. These reforms began with the baronial movement, including the Statute of Marlborough in 1267. Post-inquest legislation included the Statute of Westminster, which reinforced loyal prerogatives and restrictions on liberties, and the Statutes of Montmen in 1279, addressing land grants to the church. The subsequent legislation, such as the Statute of Merchants in 1285 for debt covery, the Statute of Winchester in the same year for local security, and Quia Emptores in 1290 for land ownership disputes, set a new foundation in English law. Edward's legislative efforts culminated with the great statutes, concluding around the death of Robert Burnell in 1292. His reign was also marked by significant financial and administrative reforms, beginning with a complete overhaul of the coinage system. By 1279, Edward had introduced new and higher quality coins, including the unsuccessful groat, and innovated the minting process itself, shifting from stamping coins from sheets to cutting blanks from a silver rod, a technique introduced by the moneyer William Turnemir. This method was not only more efficient, but also curtailed the prior practice of minting coins with the moneyer's name reflecting a move toward a greater centralization under the crown's control. Despite these improvements, English coins were heavily counterfeited in the Low Countries and illegally exported, leading to a ban in 1283, which Edward enforced by mandating the public to exchange old coins for new ones in 1280. While this was a little bit difficult logistically, when it was said and done, it did manage to stabilize the currency. So, job well done. The financial demands of Edward's military campaigns required diverse revenue sources, including customs duties on wool, England's main export, and taxes on movable property. Negotiations in 1275 secured a permanent wool duty from domestic merchants, and in 1303 from foreign merchants too, in exchange for trading rights. With the revenue managed by the Riccardi bankers of Lucca, until their bankruptcy in 1294 due to the confiscation of their assets by the French king, this led to Florentine Frescobaldi taking over as the crown's financiers. Now, speaking of money, can't go past the Jews, can't we? They were the moneylenders of the time, weren't they? And Edward, well, he did not like them, let's put it that way. His reign saw financial exploitation, and eventually the complete expulsion of all the Jews in England. Now, 
permitted to practice usury, unlike Christians. If you don't know what usury is, that's charging interest on loans. And, in all fairness, the interest they were charging was, more often than not, quite ridiculous. The Jews became a crucial financial resource, albeit one that Edward taxed heavily, forcing them to sell debt bonds at a loss, which benefited the crown and its courtiers. In 1275, facing parliamentary discontent, Edward prohibited Jews from lending with interest and encouraged other occupation through the statute of Jewry. By 1279, under the guise of combating coin clipping, Edward had all Jewish household heads arrested, leading to about 300 executions and substantial fines extracted from the survivors. Now, what they found that the Jews were doing, allegedly, was clipping the edges off the coins to take the little bits of gold off, melt it down and either sell the gold or the silver, or simply mint new counterfeit coins. This is the reason why, in our modern days, you'll see those little lines on the edges of the coins. It comes from uh, this practice many, many years ago. Well, this period saw repeated financial exploitation, reducing the Jews' utility to the crown by 1280, and setting a stage for their expulsion in 1290. This expulsion, justified by Edward as a religious act in honour of the crucified, was part of a deal with Parliament to secure a massive lay subsidy. What he means by in honour of the crucified is that the Jews effectively were always getting the blame for the murder of Jesus Christ, or rather the betrayal of him. The Romans never got the blame, though. But the Rome was where the Pope lived, so figure that one out. Well, it was a political move that saw the Jews despoiled, and their properties granted to royal favourites, and it was an unprecedented thing in its permanency, and it, it wasn't reversed until the 1650s. So that's about 300 years. Edward even funded the renovation of the tomb of little Saint Hugh to align with this expulsion, blending the religious justification with political expediency. Well, enough about that. Edward's reign was also marked by a significant financial strain due to the continuous warfare of the 1290s necessitating the imposition of multiple lay subsidies that did manage to raise over £200,000 between 1294 and 1297. This financial burden was compounded by priests, including the seizure of wool and hides, and the imposition of an unpopular additional duty on wool known as the maltolt, which was perceived as an unjust levy. The fiscal demands led to widespread resentment and eventually catalyzed serious political opposition, initially from the clergy rather than the lay populace. In 1294, Edward's demand for half of all clerical revenues was met with some resistance, but the king enforced compliance through threats of outlawry, securing the necessary grants. However, the situation escalated when Archbishop Robert Winchelsea, who had been absent in Italy, returned in 1295, and was immediately confronted with another royal demand for clerical taxes. This tension between ecclesiastical and royal authority intensified in 1296, with the issuance of the papal bull Clericus Laicos, which prohibited clergy from paying taxes to lay rulers without the Pope's explicit consent. 
When the clergy cited this bull to refuse Edward's tax demands, the king responded by declaring them outlaws. That ought to show them. Winchelsea was, of course, forced to navigate a very complex situation, ultimately advising clerics to act according to their conscience, leading to partial compliance with Edward's taxation. Resistance from the lay nobility emerged more gradually. The critical point came in 1297 at the Salisbury Parliament, where the Earl Marshal Roger Bigod and the Earl of Hereford Humphrey de Beaune challenged Edward's right to demand military service for campaigns outside of England, specifically objecting to service in Gascony when the king was in Flanders. Their resistance culminated in the drafting of the Remonstrances, which articulated grievances particularly about the high level of taxation. Edward's persistence in taxing the nobility without broader consent led to a significant confrontation, when Bigont and Bowen physically prevented the collection of taxes at the Exchequer. As Edward prepared for a campaign in Flanders, England teetered on the brink of civil war. However, the Scottish victory at the Battle of Stirling Bridge on September 1297 shifted the political landscape, uniting Edward and the English magnates against a common enemy. In response to this external threat, and indeed then it was external, in terms of there was no united kingdom, well, Edward agreed to sign the Confirmatio Cartarum, which reaffirmed the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, securing support of the nobility for his Scottish campaign. Despite these concessions, Edward's challenges persisted, particularly with maintaining the commitments he made under the previous agreements. Over time, the death of key opponents like de Boen and the negotiation of favourable terms with others like Bigod eased Edward's political struggles. His ongoing conflict with Archbishop Winchelsea over clerical taxation was also resolved in his favour with the election of the more sympathetic Pope Clement V, who suspended Winchelsea from office. Edward's initial military success in Scotland in 1296 did not secure a lasting peace, as resistance quickly re-emerged under leaders like William Wallace and Andrew de Moray. William Wallace, of course, being the title character of the Braveheart films that you're all so familiar with, which are good films. I don't care if they're not historically accurate, I'm not one of those people who's going to sit there and dig my heels in and not enjoy it just because they're wearing kilts, or just because the colours are wrong on the English uniform. I'm not one of those people. Just enjoy the movie. Well, despite a major victory at the Battle of Falkirk in 1298, Edward failed to capitalise on this success, and ongoing guerrilla attacks by the Scots continued to thwart the English war effort. Well, eventually they captured and executed William Wallace in 1305, which was intended as a decisive blow to the Scottish resistance, make them all feel scared and frightened. But it didn't. The rise of Robert the Bruce as King of Scotland in 1306 revitalised the Scottish struggle for independence, catching Edward completely off guard and marking the beginning of a new and formidable phase of the opposition. In February 1307, Robert the Bruce renewed his campaign for Scottish independence by gathering forces and by May, 
defeating Aimer de Valence at the Battle of Lodon Hill. Edward I, determined to quell Bruce's uprising, mustered his strength and marched north. However, his health was failing. He had developed dysentery during the journey. By the 6th of July, Edward had reached Verge by Sands near the Scottish border, where his condition worsened. The following day, as his servants attempted to help him sit up and eat, he died in their arms. Legends and narratives about Edward's final wishes vary. One tradition claims he requested his heart to be taken to the Holy Land with a crusading force. Another tale, less substantiated, suggests he desired his bones to be carried on future military campaigns against the Scots. A more historically credible account from the Chronicles states that, on his deathbed, Edward charged important barons like Henry de Lacy, 3rd Earl of Lincoln, and Guy de Beauchamp, the 10th Earl of Warwick, to guide and protect his son, specifically instructing them to ensure that Pierre's Gaveston, who he had exiled, did not return. This directive was, however, ignored by his son, Edward II, who recalled Gaveston, recalled, rather, Gaveston, almost immediately after his succession. Edward I's remains were transported south, and lay in state at Waltham Abbey before being interred at Westminster Abbey on the 27th of October. The funeral, relatively modest by royal standards, reflected the financial constraints at the time, costing a total of £473. His tomb, a simple Purbeck marble sarcophagus, lacked the regal effigy typically associated with monarchs, possibly also due to these fiscal limitations. In 1774, the Society of Antiquaries in London opened Edward's tomb, noting the preservation of his body and measuring his height. His tomb bears the inscription, added in the 16th century by Abbot John Feckenham, which reads in English, Here is Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, 1308. Keep the troth. This refers to his reputation as the Hammer of the Scots, a nickname reflecting his military campaigns in Scotland, though this was not an epithet used in his own time, but rather added later on. Mary I of England, also known as Bloody Mary, remembered for her vigorous attempts to reverse the Protestant Reformation initiated by her father, Henry VIII. She restored Roman Catholicism as the state religion, a move that led to the Marian persecutions in which hundreds of Protestant leaders and followers were executed earning her famous nickname. But despite the harsh religious policies, Mary also made significant contributions to English administrative and naval developments, continuing the consolidation of royal power and enhancing the kingdom's naval capabilities. Her marriage to Philip II of Spain aimed to strengthen Catholic alliances that proved to be unpopular among her subjects, and had no lasting political impact due to their failure to produce an heir. Mary's reign, though brief and chaotic, significantly impacted the religious landscape of England, and is a tale that I believe that is worth telling. So welcome to the channel. If it's your first time here, it's good to meet you, and if you are coming back, great to have you back with me again. As always, if you want to support the channel, you're already doing it. The best way to support is just to enjoy the content. But if you really want to support the channel, a like and subscribe, and looking in the video description, 
may get you to where you need to go. Now, without further ado, let's begin our biography of Bloody Mary. Get yourself comfortable. Mary was born on February the 18th, 1516, at the palace of Placentia in Greenwich, England, as the only child of King Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon, who survived past infancy. Oh, by the way, her father was notorious for having six wives. So, if you want to learn about Henry the Eighth, go and take a look in the British History playlist. Quite an interesting character. Her birth followed several unsuccessful pregnancies, including miscarriages, stillbirths, and the death of an infant son. She was baptized into the Catholic faith three days after her birth at the Church of the Observant Friars in Greenwich, and this was a baptism that was in attended by prominent figures including Lord Chancellor Thomas Wolseley and Agnes Howard, the Duchess of Norfolk. Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, a relative and key figure in her life, sponsored her confirmation, which occurred immediately following her baptism. From a young age, Mary held significant ceremonial roles. In fact, by the young age of four, she was a godmother to her cousin, Frances Brandon. In 1520, the Countess of Salisbury was appointed as her governess, a role indicating Mary's high status and importance of her upbringing. Sir John Hoosey took on the role of her chamberlain in 1530, with his wife, Lady Anne Grey, serving as one of Mary's attendants, further illustrating the nobility embedded in her early life. Thus, from a very, very young age, she exhibited signs of keen intelligence and talent. At just four and a half years old, around the July of 1520, she demonstrated her musical abilities by performing on the virginals, which was a kind of harpsichord. She did this for a French delegation that was visiting England, and they were all extremely impressed, not just by her playing, but the fact that she was four and a half years old. It's quite a feat. And in fact, not many four-year-olds have that kind of dexterity in the hands to play a harpsichord. Well, her education in general was closely overseen by her mother, Catherine of Aragon, who engaged the Spanish humanist Juan Luis Vives to advise on a... and contribute, excuse me, to her educational curriculum. Vives wrote De Institution Femine Christiane, a seminal work on the education of young girls, which was commissioned by Catherine. By the age of nine, Mary had become proficient in Latin, and she had also undertaken studies in French, Spanish, music, dance, and possibly Greek. A father... Henry VIII took immense pride in her accomplishments and her temperament, often boasting to the Venetian ambassador Sebastian Guistiniani that Mary was so well behaved that she never even cried. Now physically, Mary bore a strong resemblance to her parents, a fair complexion, pale blue eyes, and red or reddish golden hair, ruddy cheeks characteristic of her father. Despite his affection and pride in her talents and composure, Henry VIII was deeply frustrated by the lack of a male heir, 
as Mary was his only surviving child from his marriage to Catherine. By the time that she was nine years old, it seemed evidently clear that no more children would be forthcoming from the Union. Now in the same year of 1525, yes, she was still nine years old at this time when Henry had made the rather significant decision to send her to preside over the Council of Wales and the Marchers. This effectively positioned her as the head of her own court at Ludlow Castle in the border region of Wales. While she held many royal prerogatives typically reserved for a Prince of Wales and was often referred to as the Princess of Wales by contemporaries like Vives, she was never formally invested with the title. Mary's tenure in the Welsh marshes lasted about three years, during which time she made frequent visits back to her father's court. Around mid-1528, she returned permanently to the home counties near London, marking the end of her formal duties in Wales. Throughout her childhood, Mary's future was a subject of various diplomatic negotiations concerning her marriage, a common practice for royal offspring, used to forge alliances between nations. Well, at the tender age of two, Mary was already entangled in these political maneuvers when she was betrothed to Francis, the Dauphine of France, who was merely an infant at the time, the son of King Francis I. Talk about traditional marriage. Well, this contract, however, was short-lived, and it was dissolved merely three years later. In 1522, when she was six years old, her marriage was negotiated with a much older suitor, her twenty-two-year-old cousin Charles V, who is the Holy Roman Emperor of the time. This arrangement, too, fell through within a few years, as Charles dissolved the engagement, a decision that was agreed upon by Henry VIII. Following this, Cardinal Wolsey, Henry's chief adviser, initiated negotiations with the French. Henry thus proposed that Mary could marry Francis I of France, who was significantly older, or his second son, Henry, the Duke of Orléans. A marriage treaty was eventually signed to this effect, although it did allow for flexibility in the choice of the groom, whether it be Francis the first and his son. Now, the alliance with France was secured by Wolsey without necessitating Mary's marriage as part of the treaty. The possibility of Mary's marriage continued to be a diplomatic tool, however. In 1528, discussions were held about marrying her off to the cousin James V of Scotland. These discussions were conducted by Wolsey's agent, being Thomas Magnus, with the Scottish diplomat Adam Otterburn. By this period, according to the Venetian ambassador Mario Savorgano, Mary had grown into a pretty and well-mannered young lady, noted for her fine complexion, reflecting her burgeoning potential as a diplomatic asset in the eyes of the various European courts. These ongoing negotiations reflect the constant use of royal marriages as a means to secure political alliances, with Mary's personal preferences and agencies largely sidelined in favour of the strategic calculations of her father and his advisers. Well, as Henry VIII's desperation for a male heir continued to escalate, 
so did the instability surrounding Mary's position. Frustrated by his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, which failed to produce a surviving male heir, Henry sought an annulment from the Pope, and this was a very big deal. He didn't get annulments easily. It's kind of like trying to get out of a car leasing agreement in modern times. Well, he argued that his marriage was invalid based on Levitical prohibitions against marrying a brother's widow, claiming the marriage to Catherine was unclean, since she had been married to his deceased brother Arthur. Catherine countered this by insisting that her marriage to Arthur had actually never been consummated. Thus, it was invalid from its inception, an assertion supported by a previous dispensation issued by Julius II. However, Pope Clement VII, influenced by political pressures, including the military presence of Charles V, Catherine's nephew and Mary's one-time fiancé, by the way, in Rome, denied Henry's request for the annulment. Well, and amid all of these tensions, from 1531 onwards, Mary's health had begun to decline, marked by irregular menstruation and episodes of depression, possibly exacerbated by the stress of her father's public and fractious dispute. In 1533, the situation precipitated when Henry married Anne Boleyn, and Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, subsequently declared Henry's marriage to Catherine null and void, and his marriage to Anne as legitimate. Rejecting papal authority, Henry proclaimed himself as the supreme head of the Church of England. Consequently, Catherine was demoted to Dowager Princess of Wales, and Mary was declared illegitimate, stripped of her princess title, and replaced in the line of succession by her newborn half-sister, Elizabeth. Following these events, Mary's household was disbanded. Her servants, including the loyal Countess of Salisbury, were dismissed, and Mary was relegated to this lesser status, residing with her infant half-sister, and under strict supervision. Despite significant personal risk, Mary remained defiant, refusing to acknowledge Anne as queen or Elizabeth as a legitimate heir, which, of course, further strained her relationship with her father. Their communication broke down entirely, and they didn't speak to each other for three years. While well, during this period, Mary's health had continued to suffer, a condition her physician attributed to her mistreatment. All of the stress. It's just a little bit too much. She found a semblance of support from the imperial ambassador, Eustace Chapuis, who acted as an unsuccessful intercessor on her behalf. The death of her mother, however, in 1536, left Mary completely inconsolable, deepening her isolation as she moved away from court, continuing to face severe restrictions and personal grief. Following the execution of Queen Anne Boleyn in 1536, and the subsequent declaration of Elizabeth's illegitimacy, Henry V married Jane Seymour. Jane played a conciliatory role, persuading Henry to reconcile with Mary. After all, she is your own daughter, Henry. 
while to regain favour with her father, Mary was somewhat coerced into accepting several conditions. She had to recognise Henry as the supreme head of the Church of England, reject the Pope's authority, and acknowledge the illegitimacy of her mother's marriage to Henry as well as her own illegitimacy. Not a very good deal by anyone's standards. Well, initially and understandably resistant, she was eventually pressured into signing a submission that met all of Henry's demands. That being said, Henry VIII was not the king that you want to cross. You may end up on one, figuratively, of course. Well, reinstated at court, Mary was granted a household and resumed a public role. She frequented royal residences, including Hatfield House, the Paris of Beaulieu, Richmond, and Hunsdon, and also spent time at Henry's palaces such as Greenwich, Westminster, and Hampton Court. Her expenditures during this period reflected a lifestyle of luxury, and included items such as fine clothing and card games, a favoured leisure activity. The Pilgrimage of Grace, a significant uprising that occurred in northern England in response to Henry's religious reforms, included demands for Mary's restoration to legitimacy. The revolt was ultimately crushed, and its leaders, including Mary's former chamberlain, Lord Hussey, were all executed. However, just in case you were wondering, and before you ask, there is no evidence implicating Mary in the rebellion. Thus, no evidence found. She lived another day. Perhaps she did, but we don't have any proof that she had any involvement. Well, in 1537, Queen Jane Seymour died postpartum after birthing Edward, Henry's much-coveted male heir. Mary was thus appointed godmother to her half-brother Edward, and served as the chief mourner at Jane's funeral. From late 1539, Mary was courted by Philip, the Duke of Bavaria. Though his Lutheran faith proved an obstacle, and the courtship did not result in marriage. During the same period, Thomas Cromwell, Henry's chief minister, sought an alliance with the Duchy of Cleves, and proposed a match between Mary and William, Duke of Cleves. This suggestion did not progress, but Cromwell did arrange a marriage between Henry and Anne of Cleves, which <laughs> did not go very well. Henry found Anne unattractive upon meeting her. You see, they sent someone out to paint a picture of her. And when the picture was presented to Henry, he thought, well, she looks pretty good. Let's bring her back. I'll marry this one. She looks nice. But when she showed up, it was not like the picture. It seems that we have some modern problems that have their roots in medieval times. Well, he was not happy with this, but... He was politically trapped into proceeding with the marriage, and it was annulled six months later as unconsummated. Now you may wonder, why was it unconsummated? Well, apparently on the wedding night, meant to be filled with fireworks and romance, it was uh, not as expected. The next morning Henry had remarked to a 
close friend whose name escapes me, that unfortunately Anne, let's just say, had some hygiene issues and he was very turned off by this. Thus, the wedding night was not as romantic as it should have been. Well, back to Cromwell, who faced numerous charges, including a ludicrous, frankly, accusation of intending to marry Mary himself, was also executed following the political fallout from the failed Cleves marriage. Which leads us to the year of 1541. Amidst suspicions of a Catholic conspiracy involving her former governess's son, Reginald Pole, Henry VIII ordered the execution of the Countess of Salisbury, Mary's godmother. However, the execution was gruesomely botched, and it left the Countess horrifically mutilated. The following year, after executing his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, Henry invited Mary to the royal Christmas celebrations. During this period, when Henry was without consort, Mary often assumed the role of hostess at the court events. In 1453, Henry married again, Catherine Parr, his sixth and final wife who played a key role in reconciling him with his daughters, thereby improving the family dynamic. Under Catherine's influence, Henry restored Mary and her half-sister Elizabeth to the line of succession through the Third Succession Act of 1544, after their half-brother Edward, though they were still considered illegitimate. Well, upon Henry's death, in 14, oh, 1547, rather, Edward VI ascended the throne, and Mary inherited significant estates. During Edward's reign, England saw an intensified push for Protestantism, including the mandatory use of the Book of Common Prayer, introduced by the Act of Uniformity in 1549. Mary, however, staunchly adhered to her Catholic faith, defying the Protestant practices and even celebrating Mass in her private chapel. She sought the intervention of her cousin, Emperor Charles V, to pressure the English government to allow her to practice her faith without interference. Mary stayed mostly secluded on her estates during Edward's rule, and seldom appeared at court. A failed plan in 1550 aimed to smuggle her to safety on the European mainland due to the religious pressures she faced. Despite a temporary reconciliation during the Christmas of 1550, tensions between Mary and Edward over religious matters persisted. At one point, a teenage Edward publicly chastised Mary for her Catholicism, causing a scene that reportedly left both of the siblings in tears. Well, despite the ongoing pressure from Edward to conform to Protestantism, Mary remained resolute in her Catholic faith, consistently rejecting Edward's demands to convert. But Edward VI, at fifteen years old, died on July the 6th, 1553. Most people agree that it was most likely tuberculosis, not a good survival rate from the TB back then. Well, aware that his half-sister Mary would potentially reverse the Protestant reforms that he and his father had instituted, Edward sought to exclude her from succeeding him. His advisers, including John Dudley, the first Duke of Northumberland, informed him that legally he could not disinherit just one sister. He would have to disinherit Elizabeth as well, 
despite Elizabeth being Protestant. Well, consequently, Edward's will bypassed both Mary and Elizabeth in favor of one Lady Jane Grey, the granddaughter of Henry VIII's younger sister, and a Protestant. That was the most important bit. Well, this decision directly contradicted the Act of Succession in 1544. As Edward's health deteriorated, Mary was summoned to London. However, Mary wasn't stupid. Sensing a trap that would facilitate Lady Jane Grey's accession, Mary instead fled to East Anglia. This region was a stronghold of Catholic support and opposition to Northumberland, who had brutally suppressed Ket's rebellion there. From her base in Kenninghall, Norfolk, on the 9th of July, Mary simply declared herself as the rightful successor, and of course began gathering forces. Lady Jane Grey, was proclaimed queen on July the 10th. But Mary's decisive actions quickly eroded Jane's support. By July the 12th, Mary had mobilized a formidable army at Franklingham Castle, Suffolk. Within days, support for Northumberland crumbled, and Lady Jane Grey was deposed by July the 19th, ending her brief reign how brief? Well, she only lasted nine days. You thought Liz Truss was short. Well, both she and Northumberland were subsequently imprisoned in the Tower of London. Mary entered London in triumph on the 3rd of August, 1553, greeted by massive public support. She was accompanied by her half-sister Elizabeth, and a grand procession of over 800 nobles and gentlemen, marking a significant turning point in English history as she began her reign. Upon ascending to the throne, her initial acts, or one of them, was to orchestrate the release of prominent Roman Catholics who had been imprisoned including Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, and Stephen Gardiner. She also saw to the release of her cousin Edward Courtenay. Recognising that Lady Jane Grey had merely been a pawn in Northumberland's scheme to control the throne, Mary chose not to execute her. Yet. Instead, she kept Lady Jane and her husband, Lord Guildford Dudley, under guard in the Tower of London, though Northumberland was executed for high treason. This period was marked by the challenging situation of a privy council, complicit in the coup, leading Mary to appoint new members, such as Gardiner, who was named Bishop of Winchester and Lord Councillor. Focused on securing her rule and the Catholic succession, Mary, who was then 37 years of age, considered marriage prospects to produce an heir and, of course, prevent the Protestant Elizabeth from ascending the throne. Among potential suitors were Edward Courtenay and Reginald Pole, but Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, suggested his son, Philip of Spain. Negotiations included sending of Philip's portrait to Mary, signalling serious matrimonial intentions. Despite opposition from the English Parliament and populace who feared Habsburg dominance, Mary remained resolute leading to Wyatt's rebellion, aimed at placing Elizabeth on the throne. The rebellion failed, and its leaders, including Thomas Wyatt and Lady Jane Grey, 
were executed. In an effort to mitigate the power Philip would wield as her consort, the terms of Queen Mary's Marriage Act were established. Philip was to be styled King of England, but his authority was significantly restricted, i.e. official documents were to bear both names, but he could not appoint foreigners to office or act without Mary's consent, and England was not to be compelled into war to support his family's interests abroad. Philip agreed, seeing the marriage as a political strategy to strengthen his position in Europe. The Union, though politically motivated, positioned England within the broader Habsburg dominions, as Philip also received crowns from his father, making Mary Queen of Naples and titular Queen of Jerusalem. Their marriage, marked by language barriers, and the reported absence of romantic affection, was solemnized at Winchester Cathedral on July 25, 1554, just days after they met. Mary and Philip conversed in a mix of Spanish, French, and Latin, given Philip's apparent lack of English proficiency. In September of 1554, the court was abuzz with the news that Mary had ceased menstruating, was gaining weight, and suffering from morning sickness, leading everybody, including her physicians, to excitedly jump to the conclusion that she was pregnant. Parliament swiftly passed the Treason Act of 1554, designating Philip as regent should Mary die in childbirth. Anticipating the birth, Elizabeth was summoned from house arrest to court to witness the event, expected to occur imminently by late April 1555. Rumours even spread across Europe that Mary had delivered a son, prompting thanksgiving services in London, although these were based on false information. As weeks turned into months, with no birth, the court and the public began to doubt the Queen's pregnancy. The Venetian ambassador Giovanni Michieli and others expressed scepticism, suggesting the pregnancy might end in disappointment rather than a new heir. By July it became apparent that Mary's swollen abdomen was diminishing without any signs of childbirth, leading to the conclusion that it had been a false pregnancy, likely caused by Mary's intense desire for an heir. Now Philip, unsure of the pregnancy himself, wrote to his brother-in-law expressing his doubts. The situation grew more complicated after the embarrassing public spectacle of the false pregnancy, Philip left England to command armies in Flanders. Mary was left devastated and sunk into a deep depression, mourning both her unfulfilled hope for an heir and her husband's departure. The Venetian ambassador noted her profound love for Philip and her subsequent despair at their parting. Well, during this period, Elizabeth remained at court, seemingly back in good graces. Philip, concerned about the succession, especially with Mary, Queen of Scots, a strong Catholic claimant married to the French Dauphine, proposed that Elizabeth marry his cousin, Emmanuel Philibert, the Duke of Savoy. This plan aimed to secure a Catholic succession and maintain Habsburg influence in England 
However, Elizabeth resisted the match, and it was unlikely that the Parliament would consent either, leaving the succession question open as it was contentious. Upon her accession, in July of 1553, Mary initially proclaimed tolerance for all the religious practices, but by September, prominent Protestant leaders like Thomas Cranmer and John Hooper were imprisoned as Mary began reversing her brother Edward's Protestant reforms. Her first parliament, convened in October, legitimized her parents' marriage and repelled the laws of Edward, reverting church doctrine to the 1539 Six Articles, which, among other stipulations, enforced clerical celibacy. Mary, devout in her Catholic faith, rejected the Protestant church established under her father and brother. With Philip's influence, she successfully persuaded Parliament to restore Roman Catholic jurisdiction over the English church. Although they made a significant concession regarding the monastery lands confiscated during her father's reign, which were not returned to the church, but remained with their current owners. By the end of 1554, Pope Julius III ratified this arrangement and reinstated the Heresy Acts. This shift led to the flight of about 800 Protestants, including John Fox to the continent. John Fox was the famous author of the Book of Martyrs, which has my recommendation. Those who remained and openly practiced or dared to preach Protestantism faced persecution under the heresy laws, leading to a series of infamous burnings starting in February 1555 with figures like John Rogers and John Hooper. Now, even Thomas Cranmer, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, after initially recanting his Protestant faith, dramatically withdrew his recantation at the stake. By the end of Mary's reign, 283 people had been executed, mostly by burning, actions that fueled significant anti-Catholic and also anti-Spanish settlements in England, and of course, attributed to her nickname, Bloody Mary. She got it from all the killing. Well, in the wake of these events, Reginald Pole, Mary's late governess's son, arrived as the papal legatee in November of 1554. He was quickly ordained as a priest, and succeeded Cranmer as the Archbishop of Canterbury in March of 1556, following Cranmer's execution. Despite some opposition, even from within Philip's ecclesiastical circle, like Alfonso de Castro, who condemned the burnings, Mary maintained these religious policies throughout her reign, further contributing to the historical epithet of Bloody Mary. Actions that cemented her legacy as a fervent supporter of Catholicism, and left a deeply divided religious landscape in England. Well, during Mary and Philip's reign, they advanced the Tudor conquest of Ireland, establishing English colonies in the Irish Midlands. They founded Queen's and King's counties, known today as the counties of Lois and Offaly, respectively, initiating the plantations of these areas. The principal towns were named Maryborough and Philipstown, nowadays Port Laos and Dangean. In January of 1556, following the abdication of Emperor Charles V, Philip became the King of Spain, celebrated in Brussels, 
while Mary remained in England. In February of that year, Philip negotiated a fragile truce with France. However, in March, the French ambassador to England was implicated in the Dudley conspiracy, a plot to overthrow Mary, orchestrated by Henry Dudley, which aimed to rally support from French forces. The plot failed, leading to the arrest of the conspirators in England, while Dudley and the French ambassador fled. Philip returned to England from March to July 1557 to rally Mary's support for a renewed conflict with France. Despite opposition from her council, concerned about economic repercussions and the strain it would place on England's already depleted resources, the situation escalated when Reginald Paul's nephew, Thomas Stafford, invaded England with French support and seized Scarborough Castle. This act directly challenged Mary's rule, prompting her to declare war in the June of 1557. Thus the war strained relations between England and the papacy. As Pope Paul I had aligned with Henry II of France, Despite a significant victory at the Battle of St. Quentin in August 1557, where English forces were commended for their valour, the war's toll was heavy. The loss of Calais in January 1558 to French forces marked another severe blow to English prestige and Mary's morale. Calais had been the last English possession on the European mainland, and though economically taxing, its loss was seen as a personal failure for Mary, reportedly affecting her deeply until her death. During her reign, England experienced persistent wet weather, even more than normal, leading to widespread flooding and subsequent famines. The economic situation was further aggravated by the decline of the Antwerp cloth trade, which at the time was a significant industry for England, crucial even. And despite her new marriage to Philip of Spain, England was simply unable to tap into the lucrative trade routes of the New World, as the Spanish monarchy strictly controlled access and did not allow English participation. To counter this economic isolation, Mary's government continued the policies of the Duke of Northumberland by promoting exploration and trade expansion. She granted a royal charter to the Moscovy Company under Sebastian Cabot and commissioned a world atlas from Diogo Homem, signaling a push towards discovering new trade opportunities and exploring further into Africa through ventures by explorers like John Locke and William Towerston. Financially, Mary faced the challenge of modernizing the government's financial administration while still relying on outdated methods of taxation. William Paulet, the first Marcus of Winchester, retained from Edward VI's reign as Lord High Treasurer, struggled to improve the revenue collection. The regime's efforts included the publication of a revised Book of Rates in 1558, which updated tariffs and duties on imports to increase customs revenues, changes that were not thoroughly revisited until the early 17th centuries. Moreover, the debasement of English coinage under Henry VIII and Edward VI had devalued the currency significantly. Mary planned comprehensive currency reforms to stabilize and strengthen the economy, but these reforms were not enacted until after her death, leaving a legacy of financial strategies that would only be realized later. 
In 1557, after a visit from her husband Philip, Mary believes that she was pregnant again, anticipating the birth in March 1558. She even made provisions in her will for Philip to act as regent during their child's minority. However, no child arrived, and Mary was forced to acknowledge her half-sister Elizabeth as her lawful successor. Mary's health declined rapidly from May 1558, and she suffered considerable pain, possibly from ovarian cysts or uterine cancer. She died on the 17th of November, 1558, at the age of 42 at St. James's Palace, amidst an influenza epidemic that also claimed the life of Archbishop Reginald Pole on the very same day. Despite her wish to be buried next to her mother, Catherine of Aragon, Mary was interred in Westminster Abbey. She was laid to rest in a tomb she would eventually share with her successor, Elizabeth. The inscription on the tomb, placed by James I after Elizabeth's death, reads as thus, Consorts in realm and tomb, we sisters Elizabeth and Mary here lie down to sleep, in hope of resurrection. At her funeral service, John White, the Bishop of Winchester, commemorated Mary by highlighting her royal lineage and dual role as both queen and king through marriage, stating, She was a king's daughter. She was a king's sister. She was a king's wife. She was a queen, and by the same title, a king also. Mary was the first woman to successfully claim the English throne, securing early support, particularly from Roman Catholics. Despite the significant opposition and competing claims she faced, but of course, it is a reign that is heavily criticized, especially by Protestant historians who condemned the religious persecutions. By the 17th century, the harsh actions against the Protestants had earned her the name Bloody Mary. Influential figures like John Knox and John Fox were particularly critical, with Fox's depiction in his acts and monuments enduring through the centuries, reinforcing her image as a tyrant. In the 20th and 21st centuries, historiographical revisions have begun to paint a more balanced picture of Mary, recognizing her efforts to restore Catholicism in England. Some have argued that Mary's religious policies were not entirely unpopular, and may have actually been successful had her reign been longer and not marred by natural disasters and economic difficulties. Some modern Catholic historians have suggested her policies were correct, but they simply lacked the time to mature due to her short reign. Well, her marriage to Philip II of Spain was certainly unpopular, and her religious policies bred resentment. The loss of Calais to France and her failure to produce an heir were seen as not only personal, but national failures. Despite these issues, some of Mary's policies did lay the groundwork for successes attributed to the Elizabethan era, such as fiscal reform, naval expansion, and colonial exploration. After her death, her widower, Philip, even proposed to Elizabeth, who declined the offer. Well, all in all, while the rain is sometimes viewed negatively and continues to be a topic of debate, I think that recent scholarly assessments suggest a more nuanced legacy. Perhaps it's up to your own interpretation.
Constantine the Eleventh Palaiologos, ascended to the throne during the final years of the Byzantine Empire, which was by then reduced to the city of Constantinople and a few outlying territories. His reign was, of course, dominated by the final siege of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks under Sultan Mehmed II. He faced overwhelming odds to defend the city, and despite these efforts, Constantinople ultimately fell on May 29, 1453, marking the end of the Byzantine Empire and the beginning of the Renaissance and the modern era in Europe. Constantine died in the final battle for the city, and his brave final stand has immortalized him as a heroic figure in Greek and Christian history, a death that symbolized the fall of a thousand-year empire. Thus he is remembered as a symbol of resistance against the Ottomans, well earning him the title, the last emperor. Hello and welcome to the channel. Is it your first time here? If so, it's great to meet you. And if you're coming back, well, you're going to really enjoy this one. A little bit longer than my usual videos, but we give credit where it's due to the subject matter. As always, if you like what I do, the best way to support the channel is by liking and subscribing, doing all that good stuff. Those who want to go above and beyond may refer to the video's description. You'll find where you want to go. Now, let us all get nice and relaxed, because as I said, this will be an extremely long video. Constantine Dragassus Palelogos was born on the 8th of February, 1404, as the fourth son of Emperor Manuel II Palaiologos, who ruled over a disintegrating Byzantine Empire. His mother, Helena Dragas, was a member of the powerful House of Dragas, and daughter of the Serbian ruler Konstantin Dejanovic. Konstantin, often referred to as Porfirogenitos, or born in the purple, was born during his father's reign, a mark of his legitimacy as an heir to the throne. Purple being the royal color, by the way. Now the Byzantine Empire had certainly seen better days. It was in decline, and well and truly so, having lost most of its fertile and populous regions in Anatolia to the Seljuk Turks since the 11th century. Although emperors like Alexios I and Manuel I Komnenos had temporarily reclaimed parts of Anatolia with the help of Western Crusaders, and these gains were quite short-lived. The empire's situation worsened with the Fourth Crusade's sacking of Constantinople in 1204, and the subsequent establishment of the Latin Empire. The Palaiologos dynasty, starting with Michael VII, regained the city in 1261, but the empire, if it could be called so at this point, never fully recovered, especially after the Ottomans had taken most of Anatolia, Bulgaria, and even parts of Greece by the year 1405. By this time, the empire was significantly reduced, little more than the capital of Constantinople, some sections of the Peloponnese, and a few scattered Aegean islands. And it didn't help that they were also in a position where they had to pay tribute to the Ottomans. To preserve the few remaining territories, Emperor Manuel II assigned regions to his sons with the title of despot, his eldest son, John, 
was designated co-emperor and successor. Theodore and Andronicos were made despots of the Morea and Thessaloniki, respectively. Constantine, along with his brothers Demetrios and Thomas, stayed in Constantinople, due to the lack of land to grant them. Little is known about Constantine's early life, but he was noted for his skills in martial arts, horsemanship, and of course, hunting. His character and actions are often described through the writings of George Sofrantes, a historian who would later serve him. However, the accuracy of many accounts is questionable, as they were composed after his death, and often intended to eulogize his reign. It is known that he was competent in both military and administrative matters, and heeded the advice of his counselors on key state issues. After the Ottomans unsuccessfully besieged Constantinople in 1422, Manuel II suffered a stroke. It was all a little bit too much for him, it seems. John effectively took over the empire's governance. To prevent the Ottomans from capturing Thessaloniki, John ceded the city to Venice, who had a much larger navy, by the way. Venice and Genoa, the big naval powers of the time. Now, while John sought Western support in 1423, Manuel II now disillusioned with hopes of Western aid, tried to dissuade him. John was impressed by Constantine's leadership during the siege, and left him as regent of Constantinople. Along with their father, Constantine negotiated a peace treaty with Sultan Murad II, temporarily halting further attacks. Upon Manuel's death in 1425, John VII, the Eighth, rather, Palais Logos, ascended the throne and granted Constantine a strategically important strip of land near Constantinople. It demonstrates the trust that both his father and his brother had in his leadership. John soon recalled Constantine from Mesembria, and designated him as the successor to Theodore as despot of the Morea. Theodore initially expressed dissatisfaction with his role, but later settled. John assigned Constantine to the Morea in 1427, after a military campaign there. Despite threats from the Ottomans and Carlo I Tocco of Epirus, Constantine and John worked together to secure the region. In 1427, John VIII, accompanied by Constantine and George Sofrantes, set out to confront Tocco. They captured Glarensa and other territories after defeating Tocco in the Battle of the Echinades. To cement peace, Toko offered up his own niece, Madalena Toko, who was renamed Theodora, in marriage to Constantine, with her dowry including the recaptured territories. This union was celebrated in 1428, marking a strategic alliance that fortified the Byzantine presence in the region. His arrival in the Morea and his subsequent marriage added complexity to the region's governance. With his brother, Theodore, unwilling to relinquish his position as despot, the Morea, for the first time since its establishment in 1349, was governed by two members of the imperial family.
Soon, their younger brother, Thomas, only nineteen years old, was appointed as a third despot, effectively splitting the nominally undivided despotate into three smaller principalities. Theodore maintained exclusive control over Mistras, while he granted Constantine territories across the Morea, including the northern town of Aegio, fortresses in Laconia, and areas in Kalamata and Messenia. Constantine established his capital in Glarensa, a town he gained through his marriage. Thomas received lands in the north, and based himself in the castle of Calavrita. During his rule, Constantine was known for his bravery and energy, though he was generally cautious when it came to military campaigns. Shortly after being appointed, he joined his brothers in an attempt to capture Patras, a flourishing port ruled by its Catholic archbishop, Pandolf de Malatesta, who was actually Theodore's brother-in-law. Small world. The campaign, however, was unsuccessful, possibly due to Theodore's reluctance and Thomas's inexperience. In a secret meeting with George Sofrantes and John in Mistras, Constantine resolved to make another attempt on Patras alone. If he failed, he planned to return to his old appanage by the Black Sea. On the 1st of March, 1429, Constantine and Sofrantes confident of support from Patras's Greek population, marched towards the city and laid siege on March the 20th. The siege turned into a protracted affair with intermittent skirmishes. At one point Constantine narrowly escaped death when his horse was shot from underneath him, and Sofrantes was captured by the city's defenders. He was released, however, on April 23rd, but he was barely in one piece. Apparently he was near death and very dirty. By May, the defenders, seeing the futility of continued resistance and the absence of reinforcements, decided they had to open the negotiations. They agreed that if Malatesta did not return by the end of the month, Patras would surrender. Constantine withdrew, and on June the 1st he re-entered the city. Since the archbishop had not returned, the city leaders met with Constantine in the Cathedral of St. Andrew on June the 4th and accepted him as their new lord. The archbishop's castle held out for another year, but they eventually surrendered. Constantine's capture of Patras was viewed as an affront by the Pope, the Venetians, and the Ottomans. To mitigate potential threats, Constantine sent ambassadors out to all three, with Sofrantes going to negotiate with Turahan, the Ottoman governor of Thessaly. Although Sofrantes managed to avert a Turkish military response, the deposed archbishop returned with a mercenary army of Catalans. However, the Catalans were more interested in plunder than in restoring Malatesta, and seized Clarenza instead. Constantine had to buy back the town for 6,000 Venetian ducats, and eventually ordered its destruction to prevent it from falling into the hands of pirates. Well, during this chaotic period, 
Constantine faced personal tragedy when his wife, Theodora, passed away in the November of 1429. Initially, he buried her in Clarenza, but later moved her remains to Mistras. By July of 1430, the surrender of the archbishop's castle meant that Patras was fully under Byzantine control after 225 years of foreign rule. And in November, Sifrantes was appointed as the city's governor. By the early 1430s, Constantine and his brother Thomas had nearly reclaimed all of the Peloponnese for Byzantium, a significant recovery since the unpleasantries of the Fourth Crusade. Thomas secured the principality of Archaea by marrying Catherine Zachariah, the final prince's daughter and heir. Upon Centurione's death in 1432, Thomas inherited all of his territories. The only parts of the Peloponnese still under foreign rule were some port towns held by Venice, but they were pretty small. However, the success of the Byzantine brothers in the Morea raised a few eyebrows, Ottoman eyebrows, especially the eyebrows of Sultan Murad II. In 1431, under his orders, Turahan sent his troops to demolish the Hexamillion Wall, a reminder to the despots of their vassal status under the Ottoman Sultan. In March 1432, Constantine, aiming to be closer to Mistras, renegotiated territories with his brother Thomas. This agreement, presumably approved by Theodore and Emperor John VIII, saw Thomas ceding the fortress of Calavrita to Constantine, who then made it his new capital. And in return, Constantine gave Thomas control of the region of Elis, which Thomas established as his new base. This exchange was part of the ongoing adjustments among the brothers to manage their respective territories effectively. Well, as time passed, relationships among the three brothers began to show some cracks. The issue of succession was a significant point of contention. Emperor John VIII had no sons, making it likely that one of his brothers would succeed him, while John's preferred successor was Constantine. This choice was accepted by Thomas, but met with resentment from Theodore, the older brother. In 1435, believing that John intended to appoint Constantine as co-emperor, Theodore travelled to Constantinople to express his objections. The disagreement between Constantine and Theodore escalated, threatening to lead to civil strife. The potential for conflict was diffused towards the end of 1536, when the future patriarch Gregory Mamas mediated a reconciliation between the brothers. It was agreed that Constantine would return to Constantinople, while Theodore and Thomas would remain in the Morea. And this resolution was quite timely, as Emperor John needed Constantine in the capital. He was planning to travel to Italy, you see, for the Council of Ferrara, to discuss the union of the Eastern and Western churches. Good luck with that. Well, John's departure from Italy in November was part of a broader strategy to secure aid for Byzantium by advocating for the unification of the churches, a move that was unpopular in the empire, 
as it implied religious submission to the papacy. John's delegation was quite substantial, including Patriarch Joseph II of Constantinople and other significant ecclesiastical figures. He even brought his younger brother Demetrius along, who had shown signs of opposition to the church union and potential rebellious tendencies. Better keep him under close watch, just in case. In Constantinople, Constantine was not completely without support. He was joined by prominent figures, like Demetrios Padalekos Kantakosanos, long name, I know, and the statesman Lokas Notaras, while Helena and George Soprantes provided close personal counsel. During John's absence, Constantine managed the affairs of the capital, maintaining peace with the Ottomans, who did not breach the established truce. The only significant concern arose in early 1439, when Constantine, anticipating an Ottoman offensive, requested the promised warships from the Pope to defend Constantinople. However, this threat did not materialize, as Sultan Murad II focused his campaign on Serbia. In 1439, the Council in Florence declared the reunification of the churches, a decision that was met with hostility and resentment in Constantinople upon John's return in February 1440. The populace viewed the Union as a betrayal of their faith, and feared it would provide, provoke rather, Ottoman suspicion. Constantine shared John's pragmatic view on the Union. Both brothers believed that sacrificing the independence of their church could justify a Western crusade, and this, well, it just might save Constantinople. Despite being relieved of his duties as regent upon John's return, Constantine remained in the capital throughout the rest of 1440. He likely stayed to find a suitable wife, having been a widower over a decade since the tragedy of the death of Theodora. His choice landed on Caterina Gutilusio, the daughter of Dorino Gutilusio, the Genoese lord of the island of Lesbos. George Sofrantes was dispatched to Lesbos in December of 1440 to arrange the details of the marriage. By late 1441, Constantine, accompanied by Sofrantes and Locas Notaros, sailed to Lesbos and married Caterina in August. He left Lesbos in September, leaving Caterina with her father to travel to the Morea. Upon his return, he noted that his brothers, Theodore and Thomas, had governed the Morea effectively in his absence. Believing he could better serve the Empire's interests closer to the capital, he considered switching places with his younger brother Demetrios who governed around Mesembria in Thrace. Constantine then proposed that he regain in his Black Sea appanage, while Demetrius would take over his holdings in the Morea. He sent Sophrantes to discuss this proposal with both Demetrius and Murad II, the Ottoman Sultan, who had a say in such appointments. By 1442, Demetrios had shown no interest in new appointments, and was instead eyeing the imperial throne. He had made a deal with Murad and raised an army, positioning himself as the champion of those opposing the union of the churches, and then declared war on John. 
when Sophrantes reached Demetrius to propose Constantine's offer, Demetrius was already preparing to march on Constantinople. The threat he posed was significant enough that Constantine was summoned back from the Morea by John to oversee the city's defences. In April of 1442, as Demetrius and the Ottomans began their attack, Constantine left the Morea. He met his wife at Lesbos, and together they sailed to Lemnos, where they were trapped for months by an Ottoman blockade. Though Venice did send ships to assist, Caterina, his new wife, fell ill and passed away in August on Lemnos. Constantine did not reach Constantinople until the month of November, by which time the Ottoman threat had already been repelled, and Demetrios, he was locked up, albeit briefly. Well, in March of 1443, Sophrantes was appointed governor of Selimbria in Constantine's name. From there he kept a watchful eye on Demetrios. In November, Constantine handed over control of Selimbria to Theodore, who had abandoned his role as despot of the Morea, leaving Constantine and Thomas as the sole despots and giving Constantine control of the mistress, the prosperous capital of the despotate. With Theodore and Demetrios out of the picture, Constantine and Thomas switched their efforts to strengthening the Morea, which had become the cultural center of the Byzantine world. They envisioned the Morea as a safe and nearly self-sufficient principality. The philosopher Gemistrus Plato, in Constantine's service, suggested that Mistras and the Morea could become the new Sparta, a centralized and strong Hellenic kingdom. One of their major projects was the reconstruction of the Hexamillion Wall, destroyed by the Turks in 1431. By March 1444, the wall was indeed fully restored, to the impression of many, including the Venetian lords who had declined to fund the project, thinking it was impossible. Well, we sure showed them. The restoration was costly, and required significant manpower, of course. Some Morot landowners fled to Venetian territories to actually avoid financing the project, kind of like a tax evasion sort of thing, while others actually rebelled before being compelled through military means to pay their share. Constantine sought to win the loyalty of local landowners by granting them lands and privileges and staged local athletic games where young Moruts competed for prizes. In the summer of 1444, possibly encouraged by news of a crusade launched from Hungary in the previous year, Constantine invaded the Latin Duchy of Athens, at that time a vassal of the Ottomans. He was in contact with Cardinal Julian Cesarini, a leader of the crusade, who was informed of Constantine's intentions to strike at the Ottomans from the south. Constantine swiftly captured Athens and Thebes, forcing Duke Nerio II Acaglioli to pay tribute to him instead of the Ottomans. The recapture of Athens was celebrated with one of Constantine's counsellors comparing him to the ancient Athenian general Themistocles. Now, despite the crusading army being destroyed by Murad II, 
at the Battle of Varna in November 1444, Constantine continued on in his campaign. Supported by Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy, who supported him by sending 300 soldiers. Constantine raided central Greece and the Pindus Mountains in Thessaly, where he was once again welcomed as a liberator. One of his governors seized the town of Lidoriki from the Ottomans, which was renamed Kanta Kosinopolis in his honor. Murad II was beginning to get more than a little tired of Constantine's successes. Thus, he marched on Morea in 1446, with an army of possibly up to 60,000 men. Despite the overwhelming numbers, Constantine refused to surrender his gains and prepared for battle. The Ottomans quickly took control of Thessaly. Constantine and Thomas rallied at the Hexamillion Wall. Despite their efforts and the wall's strength, Murad brought cannons with him, and that was a big problem. Well, I'm sure you can see how it ended up. By December the 10th, the wall was breached. Most defenders were either killed or captured, and Constantine and Thomas escaped, albeit barely. Murad's general, Turahan, was sent to take Mistress and devastate Constantine's land, while Murad led forces in the north. Although Turahan failed to take Mistress, Murad did not aim to conquer the Moreo, but rather to instill terror, make an example, living memory of terrible things so that no one would stand up to the Ottomans again. The devastated and depopulated peninsula was thus left in ruins. Constantine and Thomas, well, they were in no position to negotiate. The writing was on the wall. They accepted Murad as their lord, paid him tribute, and promised never to restore the Hexamillion Wall again. Theodore, who had previously been the despot of Morea, passed away in the June of 1448, and later that year, on October 31st, Emperor John VIII Palaiologos also died in Constantinople. Among the surviving Palaiologoi brothers, Constantine was notably the most popular, both in Morea and the capital. John VIII's preferred successor was indeed Constantine, and this choice was strongly supported by their mother, Helena Dragas, who also favoured him for the crown. As news of John VIII's death spread, both Thomas and Demetrios rushed back to Constantinople, reaching the capital before Constantine could leave the Morea. Despite many in the capital favoring Demetrios due to his anti-unionist stance, Helena used her authority as regent to stall Demetrios's attempt to seize the throne until Constantine's arrival. Thomas accepted Constantine's appointment without contention, and Demetrios, though initially overruled, eventually proclaimed Constantine as the new emperor. Shortly afterwards, George Sofrantes informed Sultan Murad of the succession, and the Sultan also accepted Constantine's appointment on December 6th, 1448. With the succession issue resolved peacefully, Helena sent two envoys, Manuel Palalegos Largos and Alexios Philanthropenos Lascaris, 
to the Morea to officially proclaim Constantine as emperor, and, of course, to escort him to the capital. Thomas came along for the journey. Constantine was proclaimed emperor of the Romans in a modest civil ceremony at Mistras on January the 6th, 1449. Instead of the traditional crown, Constantine may have placed a pilos, which is another type of imperial headgear on his head by his own hands. This local ceremony in Mistras was notably unconventional, as emperors were typically crowned in the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. However, there were historical precedents for such local ceremonies, and like his predecessors, Constantine chose not to have the traditional coronation ceremony in Constantinople upon his arrival. This was partly because both he and the Patriarch of Constantinople, Gregory III Mamas, were supporters of the Union of Churches, and a formal coronation by Gregory might have incited rebellion among the anti-unionists in the capital. Constantine considered his proclamation at Mistras sufficient for his imperial coronation, and believed it granted him all the constitutional rights of an emperor. In his earliest known imperial document, a crucible from February 1449, he referred to himself as Constantine Palaiologos, in Christ true emperor and autocrat of the Romans. He arrived in Constantinople on the 12th of March 1449, travelling there aboard a Catalan ship. Having served as regent twice, and ruled numerous fiefs throughout the empire, Constantine was well prepared for his role as an emperor. By the time he ascended the throne, Constantine was significantly diminished. Rather, Constantinople was significantly diminished from its former glory. The city had not fully recovered from devastating circumstances of the Fourth Crusade in 1204, and yes, they were so devastating that even two hundred years later they had not recovered. The fifteenth century Constantinople was almost like a rural network of population centers, with many churches and palaces, including the former imperial palace, completely abandoned and in disrepair. The Palais Logoi emperors used the Palace of the Blackerne as their main residence, located closer to the city's walls than the former Grand Palace. The population of Constantinople had also significantly decreased due to Latin occupation, civil wars in the 14th century, and recurring outbreaks of the Black Death. By the time Constantine became emperor, the city's population was around 50,000, a stark contrast to its peak in earlier centuries. Shortly after arriving in Constantinople as emperor, his immediate concern was the threat from the Ottomans. Within two weeks, he sought to secure the empire by negotiating a truce with Sultan Murad II. He dispatched Andronikos Lagaris as an ambassador, who successfully arranged a truce that included not only the capital, but also his brothers in the Morea, aiming to protect that province from further Ottoman incursions. To neutralize his brother Demetrios, who harbored ambitions for the throne, and was a source of potential instability, Constantine appointed him as despot of the Morea. This move allowed Demetrios to rule alongside Thomas, dividing the despotate between them. 
Demetrios took over the former capital, Mistras, and the southern and eastern parts of the Morea, while Thomas controlled the northwest and Corinthia, with his residence alternating between Patras and Leontari. Back in the capital, Constantine faced significant opposition from anti-unionists, who rejected the authority of the unionist patriarch Gregory III. Although Constantine was not a zealous supporter of the union of the churches, he saw it as essential for the empire's survival. However, the unionists and anti-unionists found the emperor's pragmatic approach to be unconvincing, prioritizing spiritual integrity over the possibility of Western aid that may not even come. Another pressing issue for Constantine was the continuation of the imperial line, as neither he nor his brothers had male heirs at the time. In February 1449, he sent Manuel de Chipatos to Italy to negotiate with Alfonso V of Aragon and Naples for military aid against the Ottomans, and also to arrange a marriage with Beatrice of Coimbra, Alfonso's niece. However, the alliance did not materialize. In October of 1449, Constantine sent George Sofrantes to explore potential brides in the empire of Trebizond and the kingdom of Georgia, although this mission also proved to be fruitless. Diplomacy is not easy. Well, upon learning of the death of Murad, Sofrantes and Constantine considered a strategic marriage to Murad's widow, Mara Brankovic, to deter the new sultan, Mehmed II, from attacking Constantinople. However, Mara had no interest in remarrying, having vowed to live a life of celibacy. Sofrantes then suggested a Georgian bride for Constantine, but rising tensions with the Ottomans prevented him from pursuing this alliance any further. No time for dating, I suppose. Well, the death of Helena Dragas in March of 1450 was a significant loss for Constantine, as it would be for anyone whose mother passes away. She was deeply respected, and her passing left Constantine without a clear advisor to rely on. At court, Andronikos, Palaelagos, Cantocosinos, the Mechas Domesticos, often disagreed with Constantine, especially over the choice of a Georgian princess as a bride instead of a princess from Trebizond. Locus Notaros, the Megas Doox, and a close friend of Constantine, believed that Constantinople's formidable fences, defences rather, would buy enough time for Western aid to arrive. George Sofrantos, now promoted to the title of First Lord of the Imperial Wardrobe, was cautious about antagonizing Mehmed II, and advocated for more discreet appeals to Western aid. Well, Constantine quickly sent envoys to the new Sultan Mehmed as a truce, and Mehmed assured the Byzantine envoys of his peaceful intentions. But Constantine remained skeptical about the Sultan's reliability. As he prepared for a potential conflict, he sought alliances, particularly with Venice, which operated a large commercial colony in Constantinople. However, after Constantine raised taxes on Venetian imports to boost the imperial treasury, the Venetians threatened to move their trade elsewhere, and they even signed a treaty with Mehmed in 1451. 
Constantine attempted to counter this by offering trade incentives to the Republic of Ragusa, though they could provide very little military support. The broader European response to the Ottoman threat was seemingly muted, with most Western kingdoms preoccupied with their own conflicts. The recent succession of the young Mehmed lulled Europeans into a false sense of security. To the papacy, enforcing the union of the churches was a lot more critical than responding to the Ottoman threat. In the August of 1451, Constantine's ambassador, Andronikos Brienios Leontaris, arrived in Rome, but Pope Nicholas V responded with an ultimatum. Further military aid would only come if the union achieved at Florence was fully accepted at Constantinople. This, of course, placed Constantine in a very difficult position, as enforcing the Union risked inciting riots in the capital. Cardinal Isidore of Kiev was sent by the Pope to help enforce the Union, but arrived only in October 1452, and at this time Constantinople was already facing significant threats from Mehmed. In an effort to secure the Byzantine Empire against the growing Ottoman threat, one of Constantine's initial acts as emperor was to utilize the presence of Oran Celebi, the great-grandson of the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid I, and a potential rival claimant to the Sultanate. Oran lived as a hostage in Constantinople, and Mehmed had previously agreed to pay annually for his keep. In 1451, Constantine sent a message to Sultan Mehmed, asserting that the payment for Oran's upkeep was insufficient, and hinting that, without increasing the payment, Oran might be released to possibly ignite a Ottoman civil war. This strategy of using Ottoman princes as hostages to create political leverage had been employed by Constantine's father, Manuel II, but it was fraught with risks. Mehmed's grand vizier, Halil Pasha, was shocked by the Byzantine threat and considered it a sign of desperation and foolishness. Halil, who had been a mediator ensuring peaceful relations due to his long-term connections with the Byzantines, lost his temper with the Byzantine messengers, vehemently dismissing their threats and warning that the new sultan would not be as lenient as his predecessors. Well, we actually have a source that was chronicling what was actually said at the time. So, in the words of Halil Pasha, it goes a little bit like this. You stupid Greeks, I have had enough of your devious ways. The late Sultan was a lenient and conscientious friend to you. The present Sultan is not of the same mind. If Constantine eludes his bold and impetuous grasp, it will only be because God continues to overlook your cunning and wicked schemes. You are fools to think you can frighten us with your fantasies, and that when the ink on our recent treaty is barely even dry, we are not children without strength or reason. If you think you can start something, then do so. If you want to proclaim Oran as Sultan in Thrace, go ahead. If you want to bring the Hungarians across the Danube, then let them come. If you want to recover the places which you lost long since, try it. But know this, you will make no headway in any of these things. All that you will achieve is to lose what little you still have. Pretty brutal, isn't it? 
Now, obviously, this was not a wise decision from Constantine, but hindsight is a beautiful thing. The blunder of this significantly weakened Constantine's position. Mehmed considered the threat regarding Oran to be a breach of their 1449 truce, and revoked the small concessions he had granted the Byzantines. The threat gave Mehmed the justification he sought to focus all his efforts on capturing Constantinople, a goal he had harbored since his ascendancy to the Sultanate. Thus, he saw the conquest of Constantinople as vital for the survival of the Ottoman state, ensuring it could not serve as a base for potential crusades, or even fall into the hands of a more formidable adversary than the Byzantines. Inspired by figures like Achilles and Alexander the Great, Mehmed was driven not only by strategic considerations, but also by a fascination with classical and medieval history, wanting to write himself into his own heroic story. Well, I suppose you are the hero or the villain. It depends on whose perspective the story is being told from. In the spring of 1452, Mehmed began constructing the Rumeli Hisari Fortress on the western side of the Bosphorus Strait. That's the gap of water that separates the two sides of Constantinople. Now, directly opposite the already existing fort, the Analodohu Hisari. This allowed Mehmed to control sea traffic and effectively blockade Constantinople by both land and sea. Constantine was alarmed by this aggressive move, and citing a precedent set during his grandfather's reign, protested the construction, reminding Mehmed that they had a peace treaty, and he better honor it. Don't be so rude. Well, Mehmed's intentions became increasingly clear, and panic began to ensue in Constantinople. Constantine tried to manage the situation by declaring war on Mehmed after the Ottomans' aggressive actions, but quickly rescinded this declaration, realizing the futility of the gesture. The construction of the Rumeli Hisari was completed by August 15, 1452 rather, serving both as a blockade and a staging area for the planned conquest. Constantine, acknowledging this immediate threat, began urgently to prepare for a siege, focusing on repairing and reinforcing the formidable Theodosian walls of Constantinople. He placed Manuel Palaiologos Lagros in charge of these vital repairs, which were completed later in 1452. Understanding the desperate need for allies, Constantine sent numerous pleas for military aid. To Venice, he stressed that without immediate support, Constantinople would fall. While the Venetians did express sympathy, their own conflicts in Italy limited their ability to provide military support, though they did offer to send armor and gunpowder. The sinking of a Venetian trading ship by the Ottomans, though, changed Venice's stance, placing them at war with Mehmed as well. Now it wasn't just the Venetians. Constantine also reached out to other potential allies. Alfonso V of Aragon and Naples was promised the island of Lemnos for his support. John Hunyadi of Hungary was promised Mesembria or Selimbria. 
the Genoese on Chios were offered other incentives for their military assistance. The ambassador to Pope Nicholas V, Biernarios Leontaris, delivered a letter in 1451 outlining the challenges of implementing the Union of the Churches and proposing a new council to address these issues on fairer ground. However, Nicholas's response was uncompromising, demanding full acceptance of the union achieved at Florence and the reinstatement of the Unionist Patriarch Gregory III. By late 1452, as the situation grew increasingly dire, Constantine continued to fortify Constantinople and appeal in all directions for assistance but the responses that he did get were limited and largely non-committal. The city itself was on the brink, with Mehmed poised to fulfill his ambition of conquering the last remnant of the Roman Empire, setting the stage for one of history's most dramatic sieges. Constantine's diplomatic efforts intensified as the threat from the Ottomans loomed larger. Understanding the critical nature of his situation, he sent numerous appeals out for assistance, particularly focusing on Pope Nicholas V, whose support was conditional on the full acceptance of the Union of the Churches and recognition of his spiritual authority over Constantinople. Well, despite the Pope's sympathetic stance, he made it very clear that the papacy alone couldn't significantly counter the Ottomans. They were far too strong. And he insisted on a collective response from Western Europe, mirroring Venice's position that promised only to help if other European powers also helped too. On October the 26th, 1452, Nicholas V's legate, Isidore of Kiev, arrived in Constantinople, alongside the Latin Archbishop of Mytilen, Leonard of Chios, bringing a modest force of 200 Neapolitan archers. While this force was not substantial enough to turn the tide of the impending conflict, their presence was more than a military statement. It was a symbol of potential larger Western support, and a direct attempt to solidify the union of the churches. Their arrival, however, stirred significant unrest among the city's staunch anti-unionists. Theodore Agalianos, a lawyer and vocal anti-unionist, encapsulated the sentiment of many in Constantinople, viewing the Union as a cause of great strife and a precursor to the Empire's mounting troubles. He criticized the Union for scattering the faithful, and believed it was the root of Byzantine misfortunes. Constantine faced a severe backlash for his overtures towards the Union. Lucas Notaras, trying to quell the unrest, reasoned with the assembly of nobles that the Catholic visit was well-intentioned, and the accompanying soldiers might indicate forthcoming aid. This did manage to convince many that temporary spiritual concessions could be a price worth paying for their survival, fostering a hope that perhaps more substantial help was on the way. Despite this, once it became more than clear that no further aid was going to come, Riots and chaos broke out in the streets of Constantinople. Leonard of Chios advised Constantinople to adopt a firmer stance against the anti-unionists 
by arresting their leaders. But Constantine, fearing that such actions would martyr the opposition leaders and exacerbate tensions, opted instead for dialogue. He invited the leaders of the Synaxis to the palace, asking them to document their objections to the union achieved at Florence. This approach, however, did very little to mitigate the broader crisis, especially as another Venetian ship was sunk by Ottoman fire from the new Rumeli Hisari castle, exacerbating fears and rallying the city around a common threat. As the forces of Sultan Mehmed tightened their grip around Constantinople, Emperor Constantine faced the daunting reality of defending his city against this seemingly impossible odds. The Ottomans, determined to capture the city, bombarded Constantinople's formidable land walls while planning to infiltrate its weaker sea defences. Constantine, foreseeing this, had laid a massive chain across the Golden Horn, effectively breaking the blocking, rather, the Ottoman fleet's entry. This defensive measure held firm initially, preventing the fleet from aiding the land assault directly. However, the siege's tide began to change with the arrival of crucial reinforcements. A few days after the siege commenced, the massive chain was temporarily lifted to allow three Genoese ships from the papacy and a large supply vessel from Alfonso V of Aragon and Naples to enter the city on April 20. Their successful breach of the Ottoman naval blockade, under the hostile gaze of Mehmed, significantly boosted the morale of Constantinople's defenders. The Ottoman admiral, Suleiman Baltoglu, under direct and frantic commands from Mehmed, failed to stop these ships, marking a significant, albeit brief, victory for the Constantinople side. Well, despite the morale boost, Mehmed was relentlessly in his strategy to conquer Constantinople. By April 23rd, to the defenders' dismay, they witnessed the Ottoman fleet being dragged across land on a series of tracks behind Galata. This ingenious move by Mehmed circumvented the chain and allowed the Ottoman ships to enter the Golden Horn. Attempts by the Venetians to counter this maneuver by attacking the Ottoman ships were unsuccessful. As the siege wore on, the strain on Constantinople's defenders grew. The sea walls, known to be weaker than the land fortifications, now also needed to be manned. Food shortages also began to take their toll. Prices began to soar, leading to starvation among the poor. Constantine ordered that the funds be collected from churches, monasteries and private residents to buy food for the destitute. Precious metals from church treasuries were thus melted down, with Constantine promising to repay the clergy if the city withstood the siege. The Ottoman bombardment eventually created a breach in the outer walls, exposing the inner defences and heightening Constantine's anxiety. He desperately sent messages to Mehmed, offering any form of tribute to end the siege. But Mehmed left him on red, and his resolve was firm. Mehmed responded with a stark ultimatum. Either Constantine surrendered the city for generous terms, including territories for his brother, or face complete destruction and death for himself and his nobles. Constantine 
the Roman emperor, the very last of that line, bound by duty and honour, could not conceive of surrendering Constantinople, and dismissed Mehmed's offer. He had resolved to fight to the end. As hope dwindled, rumours of a Venetian fleet coming to relieve the city provided a glimmer of hope. However, when a Venetian ship scouting the blockade returned with no news of an approaching relief force, despair set in among the city's defenders. Some of Constantine's counsellors and companions pleaded with him to escape and establish a government in exile, possibly in the Morea. Constantine refused, unwilling to abandon his city and be remembered as the emperor who fled his resolve was to stand with Constantinople. He had declared, and I quote, God forbid that I should live as an emperor without an empire. As my city falls, I will fall with it. In his final message to Mehmed, Constantine expressed the collective resolve of Constantinople's citizens to die free rather than live under Ottoman subjugation, stating in his letter, As to surrendering the city to you, it is not for me to decide or for anyone else of its citizens, for all of us have reached the mutual decision to die of our own free will, without any regard for our lives. As the siege entered its final days, internal strife among the defenders began to surface, with Venetians and Genoese bickering amongst each other, forcing Constantine to remind them of the greater enemy at the gates. The emperor, placing his faith in divine will, prepared for the inevitable assault, ready to face the end with his city embodying the spirit of a ruler steadfast in the face of overwhelming odds. In the dark early hours of May 29th, 1453, the final assault on Constantinople began. Mehmed's forces had meticulously prepared for this moment, their numbers overwhelming. Despite the unrelenting siege and the dwindling hope Constantine remained with the men, resolute in his decision to stand with them against the encroaching Ottomans. And as the siege wore on and on, the city of Constantinople was beset by ominous signs. On the 22nd of May, before the final day, a lunar eclipse cast a great shadow over the city, fulfilling a prophecy that the city would fall when the moon waned. Constantine, in an effort to bolster the morale of his beleaguered forces, ordered the revered icon of the Virgin Mary to be carried through the streets in procession. However, this effort was thwarted first by the icon slipping from its frame, and then by a sudden shift in the weather to rain and then hail. The following days were cloaked in a thick fog, adding to the sense of the impending doom. On the night of May 26, as Mehmed prepared the troops for the onslaught, strange lights were observed illuminating the dome of the Hagia Sophia, interpreted by both the Ottomans and the Byzantines as a divine symbol. To the former, a harbinger of victory, and for the latter, a sign of their doom. The Byzantine emperor led his solemn procession along the city walls, icons and relics in hand, as both Orthodox and Catholic defenders joined together in prayer, a rare show of unity fostered by their shared peril. And on this night, before the final assault, 
The city was a tableau of desperate hope and prayer. The Hagia Sophia opened its doors to all, with Emperor Constantine himself present, praying and seeking forgiveness, just like any other member of the public. He then made his rounds, inspecting the defences, and saying his farewells, aware that these would be his final hours. Dawn broke on May 29th. The Ottoman cannons ceased their bombardment, and silence fell, a brief, eerie calm before the storm of the final assault. The defenders, stretched thin and exhausted, fought valiantly under the command of the Genoese commander, Giovanni Giustiniani. But as the sun rose, Giustiniani himself was gravely wounded, and his withdrawal marked the beginning of the end. The Ottomans exploited a small, unguarded position, postern gate, the Kirka Porta, to flood into the city. Panic ensued among the defenders as they saw the Ottoman banner rise over the walls. And with that, the city was overrun. The once mighty walls that had withstood sieges for over a thousand years finally fell. Emperor Constantine seeing the collapse of his city's defences, refused the calls to flee. His last stand was among his soldiers. There was no distinction between emperor and soldier in those final moments. According to later accounts, his final words, as he charged back into the fight, were poignant yelling at the Ottomans while charging at them, screaming, The city is fallen, and I am still alive. His body was later found among the others, and though there was confusion and conflicting reports about his exact fate, the consensus among historians is that he did indeed die fighting. His head was severed, and presented to Mehmed II a grim trophy of the conquest. Thus, the fall of Constantinople marked the end of an era, and the end of an emperor. The last remnants of the Roman Empire vanished into history. Mehmed entered the city, not only as a conqueror, but as a successor to the Roman legacy styling himself Caesar in addition to Sultan. The city he conquered would become the heart of his empire, renamed Istanbul, and serve as a bridge between continents and cultures for centuries to come. Constantine's legacy endures as a symbol of resistance and dignity. The last emperor to stand in defense of his people, and his city, and Christendom, against impossible odds. His death marked not just the fall of the city, but the end of the Byzantine Empire, leaving a profound legacy on both Eastern and Western history. Well, I hope you didn't cry too hard. I suppose it's all, well, if you are a European descent person, I suppose it's all a little bit too much to think about. Well, all in the past now, as we can say, though it is hard to be detached sometimes. Since its inception in the 7th century, Christianity and Islam have been at odds. In the century after Muhammad's death in 632, Islamic forces seized territories including Jerusalem, the Levant, North Africa, and a large portion of the Iberian Peninsula. 
areas that were previously dominated by Christianity. By the 11th century, the Christian forces had begun reclaiming parts of Iberia through the Reconquista, though their connection to the Holy Land was weakening. The Fatimid dynasty, rulers of North Africa and large regions of Western Asia, including Jerusalem and Damascus, had kept a relatively peaceful relationship with Western powers. However, in 1073, the Seljuk dynasty took Jerusalem from the Fatimids, marking a shift to a less accommodating stance towards Christian pilgrims. The plight of the pilgrims and the call for aid from Byzantium rang out in the heartland of Europe, and the embers of a new kind of war were ignited. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's great to have you here again. If you'd like to support the channel, perhaps follow the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, a like, comment and subscribe goes a long way. And now, without further ado, let's talk about the First Crusade. This is part of a larger series on the Crusades in general, which I will get to, and we'll be going into quite a great amount of detail, so make sure you're relaxed. The onset of the First Crusade was a direct countermeasure against the Islamic encroachments by the Fatimids and the Seljuks into previously Christian territories and parts of the Byzantine Empire, which was around modern-day Turkey. The idea of making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem had gained traction in Western Europe as an act of penance. Despite the Seljuks' tenuous grip on Jerusalem, eventually ceding it back to the Fatimids, reports from returning pilgrims highlighted the mistreatment of Christians under their rule. This period also saw the Byzantine Empire's plea for military aid align with the growing readiness among the European Western nobility to heed the call to arms under papal leadership. During the 11th century, Europe experienced a significant population surge due to advances in technology and agriculture that boosted trade and economic prosperity. The Catholic Church ascended to a position of unparalleled influence over Western society, which was structured around the systems of manorialism and feudalism, with knights and nobles providing military service to their superiors in exchange for land use rights. Between 1050 and 1080, the Church sought to expand its authority through the Gregorian Reform, leading to friction with Eastern Christianity over the concept of papal primacy. This tension culminated in 1054 with the mutual excommunication of Pope Leo IX and Patriarch Michael Cerularius, precipitating the East-West Schism. Concurrently, Christian societies had long accepted the use of violence for communal defense, a stance that evolved into a theological justification for holy wars especially after the crusade became entwined with Roman citizenship, requiring citizens to defend the empire. The fragmentation of the Carolingian Empire also gave rise to class of warriors in Western Europe, leading to increased violence and efforts by the papacy to control it. 
This error also saw popes like Alexander II and Gregory VII formalizing systems for mobilizing military resources, including campaigns in the Iberian Peninsula and Norman conquests. Despite Gregory VII's failed attempt to organize a military expedition to aid Byzantium against the Seljuks, the foundation for the Crusader ideology was already laid at this time, asserting that fighting for just causes could absolve sins. Well, back in the Iberian Peninsula, Christian kingdoms like Lyon, Navarre, and Catalonia, despite lacking a unified identity, capitalized on the Caliphate of Cordoba's collapse to make territorial gains, leading to the Reconquista's early stages. Meanwhile, the Italo-Normans captured significant territories in southern Italy and Sicily from the Byzantines and North African Arabs, often clashing with the papacy, but ultimately launching their conquests under the papal banner, setting the stage for future crusades and conflicts that would define the era. Now, from its inception, the Byzantine Empire stood as a kind of a beacon of prosperity, but also with a good amount of cultural richness and military might. And by the reign of Basil II in 1025, the empire had expanded its borders to their zenith, securing territories as far east as Iran, along with Bulgaria and significant portions of southern Italy, while also curbing the issue of Mediterranean piracy. Well, despite facing rivals on all fronts, from the Normans in Italy to the Seljuk Turks in the east, the empire adeptly navigated these challenges, often employing mercenaries from the very factions they contested, money talks. At the same time, the Islamic world was carving out its own expansive narrative and had been doing so since the 7th century, with the entry of the Turkic peoples into the Middle East, marking a pivotal phase of Arab-Turkic entanglement. The Seljuk Turks, originally from Transoxania and newly converted to Islam, dramatically reshaped Western Asia by the 12th century through their conquests. Their Sunni allegiance, that's one of the branches of Islam if you don't know, Sunni and Shia, brought them into conflict with the Shia Fatimid Caliphate. The further stirring of the political cauldron the cultural and administrative contrast between the nomadic Seljuks and their sedentary subjects further exacerbated tensions within the empire, a strain that was highlighted by the capture of Romanos IV Diogenes at Manzikert in 1071, a defeat that hastened Seljuk expansion and indirectly prompted the First Crusade's call to arms. But we're just getting started. The early 12th century witnessed a fracturing of power in the Middle East, participated by the demise of the Seljuk and Fatimid leaders, leaving a fragmented landscape ill-prepared for the First Crusade's onslaught. This period of turmoil saw the emergence of figures like Kilij Arslan, and Tutush I, whose rivalries further splintered the Islamic realm. Amidst the disarray, the Fatimids recaptured Jerusalem from the Seljuks, shortly before the emergence of the Crusaders. 
Now, the spiritual foundations for the First Crusade were more or less laid during the Council of Piacenza and the subsequent Council of Clermont in 1095, under the auspices of Pope Urban II. He's an important character, so we'll talk about him in a bit more detail. It was these two gatherings, the Council of Piacenza and Council of Clermont, that catalyzed the mobilization of Western Europe toward the Holy Land. Byzantine Emperor Alexius Komnenos, facing the Seljuk threat, sought assistance from Urban at Piacenza, igniting a favorable response from the Pope. And indeed, most of West Western Europe, rather, was not aware of the issues that the Byzantines were facing. They were a long, long way from the frontier. It's one thing to fight barbarians. It's another thing to fight the might of the newly forged Islamic empires. Well, back to Pope Urban. His motives intertwined with aspirations to mend the East-West Schism, albeit on his terms, and restore unity under papal leadership, leveraging the Byzantine plea as a bridge towards ecclesiastical reunification. In mid-1095, Urban shifted his focus towards France, his native land, by the way, and rallied a great deal of support for the crusade. The climax of his campaign was the Council of Clermont, when he delivered a stirring sermon to the assembled French nobility and clergy, a speech that has survived in various iterations through the accounts and contemporaries crusaders alike. And yes, I'm going to read the whole thing. It's a little bit long, but I think it's important. So let's listen to it. This is the speech of Urban II at the Council of Clermont, 1095. Most beloved brethren, urged by necessity, I, Urban, by the permission of God, Chief Bishop, and prelate over the whole world, have come into these parts as an ambassador with a divine admonition to you, the servants of God. I hope to find you as faithful and as zealous in the service of God as I had supposed you to be. But if there is in you any deformity or crookedness contrary to God's law, with divine help, I will do my best to remove it. For God has put you as stewards over his family to minister to it. Happy indeed will you be if he finds you faithful in your stewardship. You are called shepherds. See that you do not act as hirelings. But be true shepherds, with your crooks always in your hands. Do not go to sleep, but guard on all sides the flock committed to you. For if through your carelessness or negligence a wolf carries away one of your sheep, you will surely lose the reward laid up for you with God. And after you have been bitterly scourged with remorse for your faults, you will be fiercely overwhelmed in hell, the abode of death. For according to the gospel, you are the salt of the earth. But if you fall short in your duty, how, it may be asked, can the earth be salted? Oh, how great the need of salting! It is indeed necessary for you to correct with the salt of wisdom this foolish people which is so devoted to the pleasures of this world, lest the Lord when he may wish to speak to them, find them putrefied by their sins, unsalted and stinking. For if he shall find worms, that is, 
sins in them, because you have been negligent in your duty. He will command them as worthless, to be thrown into the abyss of unclean things. And because you cannot restore to him his great loss, he will surely condemn you and drive you from his loving presence. But the man who applies his salt should be prudent, provident, modest, learned, peaceable, watchful, pious, equitable, just, and pure. For how can the ignorant teach others? How can the licentious make others modest? And how can the impure make others pure? If anyone hates peace, how can he make others peaceable? Or if anyone has soiled his hands with baseness, how can he cleanse the impurities of another? We read also that if blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. But first, correct yourselves, in order that, free from blame, you may be able to correct those who are subject to you. If you wish to be friends of God, gladly do the things which you know will please Him. You must especially let all matters that pertain to the church be controlled by the law of the church. And be careful that simony does not take root among you, lest both those who buy and those who sell be beaten with the scourges of the Lord through narrow streets and driven into the place of destruction and confusion. Keep the church and the clergy in all its grades, entirely free from secular power. See that the tithes that belong to God are faithfully paid from all that produce of the land. Let them not be sold or withheld. If anyone seizes a bishop, let him be treated as an outlaw. If anyone robs monks or clergymen, nuns or their servants or pilgrims or merchants, let him be the anathema. For thus it happened to the rich man in the gospel. He was not punished because he had stolen the goods of another, but because he had not used well the things that were his own. You have seen, for a long time, the great disorder in the world caused by these crimes. It is so bad in some of your provinces, I am told, and you are weak in the administration of justice, that one can hardly go along the road by day or night without being attacked by robbers, and whether at home or abroad one is in danger of being despoiled either by force or fraud. Therefore, it is necessary to reenact the truce, as it is commonly called, which was proclaimed a long time ago by our holy fathers. I exhort and demand that you, each, try hard to have this truce kept in your diocese, and if any one shall be led by his cupidity or arrogance to break this truce, by the authority of God, and with the sanction of this council, he shall be anathemized. After these and various other matters have been attended to, all who were present, clergy and people, gave thanks to God and agreed to the Pope's proposition. They all faithfully promised to keep the decrees. Then the Pope said that in another part of the world Christianity was suffering from a state of affairs that was even worse than the one he just mentioned. He continues, Although, O sons of God, you have promised more firmly than ever to keep the peace among yourselves and preserve the rights of the Church, there remains still an important work for you to do. Freshly quickened by the divine correction, you must apply the strength of your righteousness to another matter which concerns you as well as God. For your brethren, 
who live in the east, are in urgent need of your help. You must hasten to give them aid, which has been promised to them. For as the most of you have heard, the Turks and the Arabs have attacked them, and have conquered the territory of Romania, as far as the shore of the Mediterranean, and even the Hellespont, which is called the Arm of St. George. They have occupied more and more of the lands of those Christians, and have overcome them in seven battles. They have killed and captured many, and have destroyed the churches and devastated the empire. If you permit them to continue thus for a while with impunity, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them. It is on this account I, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ's herald to publish this everywhere and persuade all people of whatever rank, foot soldiers and knights, poor and rich, to carry aid promptly to those Christians, and to destroy this vile race from the lands of our friends. I say this to those who are present. It meant also for those who are absent. Moreover, Christ commands it. All who die by the way, whether by land or sea, or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. This I grant through the power of God, with which I am invested. Oh, what a disgrace, if such a despised and base race, which worships demons, should conquer a people, which has the faith of omnipotent God, and is made glorious with the name of Christ. With what reproaches will the Lord overwhelm us, if you do not aid those who, with us, profess the Christian religion? Let those who have been accustomed unjustly to wage private warfare against the faithful now go against the infidels and end with victory this war which should have begun long ago. Let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the barbarians. Let those who have been serving as mercenaries for small pay now obtain the eternal reward. Let those who have been wearing themselves out in both body and soul now work for a double honor. Behold, on this side will be the sorrowful and poor, on that side the rich, on this side the enemies of the Lord, on that his friends. Let those who do not put off the journey, but rent their lands and collect money for their expenses, and as soon as the winter is over and the spring comes, let him eagerly set out on the way with God as their guide. Pretty good speech, don't you think? Now, though the historical record of Urban's exact words is fragmented and reconstructed post facto, the essence of his appeal focused on the restoration of peace, support for the beleaguered Christians in the East, and the articulation of a holy war as a pilgrimage with its ultimate aim, perhaps implicitly, of reaching Jerusalem. Now that rallying cry that was not translated within the text, Deus lo volt, or just Deus volt, God wills it, allegedly emerged from the fervent response of, all of Urban's audience, encapsulating the crusade's divine sanction in the collective imagination of Christendom. Well, 
Contrary to the common image of French nobility leading the initial charge towards Jerusalem, it was actually a rather eclectic mix of peasants and lesser nobles who first heeded the call to the Holy Land. Inspired by Pope Urban's proclamation, they embarked on their pilgrimage months ahead of the scheduled departure. It seems they could not wait to go. Well, they rallied behind the fervent yet unofficial preacher Peter the Hermit, whose compelling oratory ignited a widespread zeal, drawing together a diverse group that, despite popular belief, included not only unskilled peasants, but also seasoned knights like Walter sans Avoir, who led a contingent of his very own. This enthusiastic but undisciplined ensemble encountered numerous challenges long before they reached the enemy lines, engaging in unplanned skirmishes and requisitioning resources as they traversed friendly territories. Now, Walter's group, that Walter sans Avoir, made their way through Belgrade, modern-day Serbia, and Zemun to Constantinople with relative ease, while Peter's contingent, marching independently, clashed with the Hungarians and faced more than a few logistical challenges at Nish. Finally, united in Constantinople, Peter and Walter's forces, bolstered by an additional crusaders from across Europe, rather smaller groups comparatively, prepared for the next leg of their journey. Despite the fragmentation of another group from Bohemia and Saxony, on the Hungarian border. Well, in their quest for supplies, the bands led by Peter the Hermit and Walter sans Avoir resorted to plundering the outskirts of Constantinople. Well, this wasn't taken very kindly by the local people, of course, and Alexios, Emperor of Constantinople, decided to expedite their passage across the Bosphorus as quickly as possible. Now once on the other side, their somewhat lack of discipline led them to disperse and continue their pillaging, eventually encountering the seasoned Seljuk forces near Nicaea, where they suffered a devastating loss. The siege of Zeregordon and the Battle of Sivitot saw significant defeats for the Crusaders, with key figures like Walter falling in combat, while Peter, who was conveniently absent during the confrontation, regrouped with the remnants for a subsequent crusading effort. Off to a very good start, it seems. Well, at the same time, the fervor surrounding the First Crusade's call sparked quite a bit of violence in Europe itself, notably in the Rhineland, as there were massacres against Jewish communities. Figures such as Emiko of Flonheim and other Crusade enthusiasts targeted the Jewish population in a series of very brutal attacks, driven by a mix of religious zealotry and greed. It didn't help that the Jews were the only ones practicing usury, that is, lending money at interest. I'm sure a lot of people wanted to go the quicker route of repaying their loans. Now, despite the church's official stance against such violence, the massacres unfolded with more horrific consequences for the Jewish populations, particularly in Worms, Mainz, and Speyer. King Coloman of Hungary 
found his realm in the path of a tumultuous crusade, facing and defeating two marauding bands that disrupted the peace of his kingdom. The aftermath saw the dispersal of Emiko's followers, with some integrating back into the larger official crusading force. Now, the general mobilization for the First Crusade was an endeavor of unprecedented scale, with participation estimates ranging from 70 to 100,000 individuals from across Western Europe. This call to arms, deeply rooted in strategic planning and discussions with prominent leaders like Ademar of Lepoy and Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, quickly garnered significant support among the nobility, particularly from southern France, where the call rang out for crusade the most loud. The crusading message spread far and wide, and the response was overwhelming surpassing Pope Urban's original expectations, and it drew a diverse crowd far beyond the warrior elite, which had its own problems. Of course, many of these people had no idea how to fight, and they were not very disciplined, hence the mass amounts of looting and disorganization. Well, Urban's campaign faced challenges in managing this response, particularly in his efforts to restrict participation to those who were capable of enduring the rigors of such an undertaking. It's a long way to travel from France to the Holy Land and even further afield. But despite all of these intentions, the ranks swelled, predominantly with peasants, embodying a new wave of religious fervor and personal commitment to the cause. In fact, one must remember that back in those days, for the most part, if you went to war, you had to bring your own armor. People were rushing out, selling whatever they had, so they could buy a sword and perhaps a leather tunic, as that was the main, main go for most people if they weren't just wearing some cloth armor which barely counts as armor at all. Either way, they were getting on the bandwagon. Now, unraveling this multitude of motivations driving the crusaders gives us an even more complex challenge, as the historical records primarily focus on the nobility, as they always do, and those tales are often narrated through the lens of ecclesiastical writers. Well, it's widely accepted that a profound sense of personal devotion played a significant role for many, ranging from the humblest foot soldier to the highest ranking noble. Urban II's rallying cry was heard by everybody, and that of course included key figures from the French aristocracy. Thus, the movement was bolstered by such leaders as Godfrey of Bouillon and Bohemond of Toronto, alongside their kin and comrades, each bringing their own aspirations and personal convictions to the cause. Everybody had an agenda. Now, the journey to Constantinople saw the crusading forces take diverging paths. Godfrey opted for the overland route through the Balkans, while Raymond of Toulouse and his Provençals hugged the Illyrian coast before turning eastward. Bohemond and Tancred with their Norman contingent, sailed to Durazzo, and proceeded over land. Upon their arrival they were in dire need for possessions, provisions rather, 
and they anticipated support from Alexios. However, Alexios, weary about the prior encounters with the People's Crusade, and cautious of Norman leaders like Bohemond, known for previous incursions into Byzantine land, greeted them with a mixture of preparedness and suspicion, managing to narrowly avoid the earlier issues that had marred their passage. Fortunately, this time, there wasn't as much looting. But the story's not over yet. There'll be plenty more looting later on, friends. Now, contrary to the Crusaders' expectations of Alexios assuming command, after all, this was his idea, the Emperor focused on facilitating their swift passage into Asia Minor, tying assistance to the pledges of fealty and return of any reclaimed lands to Byzantine control. Of course, that's a little unfair, isn't it? You can't expect everybody to do the heavy lifting and then just give you all the rewards. Well, this condition led to tense moments and near conflict within the walls of Constantinople itself. With most leaders, save for Raymond of Toulouse, who agreed to a non-aggression pact, reluctantly swearing allegiance to Alexios. Well, with the oaths secured, Alexios provided strategic counsel for implementing confrontations with the Seljuks, marking a crucial moment of cooperation and quite a bit of compromise between the Byzantine Empire and the Crusading forces. Now, this is where things really begin to heat up. In the early months of 1097, the Crusader armies advanced into Asia Minor, their ranks bolstered by the remnants of Peter the Hermit's force. They were also accompanied by the Byzantine generals, Manuel Botomitz and Tatikos, underscoring Emperor Alexios's commitment to the Crusade's success. Their initial target was set, and it was Nicaea, the erstwhile Byzantine city, now serving as the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum's capital under Kilij Arslan. Now Arslan was preoccupied with conflicts in central Anatolia, and, underestimating the strength of the Crusaders, probably because of what happened before, left his treasury and his family vulnerable. Thus, the siege of Nicaea began on the 14th of May, 1097. Hearing about this, Kilij Arslan definitely hastened his return. But, despite his efforts, on the 16th of May, a mere two days later, the Seljuk Sultan's counterattack faltered against the substantial Crusader forces. This did, however, lead to significant casualties on both sides. The Crusader armies initially struggled to fully encircle Nicaea, hampered by the city's strategic positioning on Lake Iznik, which allowed for continued provisioning. The situation shifted once again dramatically with the innovative overland transport of Crusader ships to the lake, prompting the Turkish garrison's surrender on the 18th of June of the same year, 1097. Now in the aftermath of the victory at Nicaea, the Franks were a little bit disappointed because they had issued a directive against looting, which everybody was rather looking forward to doing some, well, a good afternoon's worth of looting after the battle. Is that not 
the reward for conquest. However, Alexios's financial compensations did ease these tensions, and despite later chronicles suggesting strained relations, contemporaneous accounts like that of Stefan of Bloy to his wife Adela indicate a spirit of collaboration and goodwill between the Greeks and Franks at this juncture. Well, by late June, the Crusaders advanced deeper into Anatolia, flanked by Byzantine forces led by Tatikios, with aspirations that Emperor Alexios would dispatch additional Byzantine reinforcements. To enhance maneuverability, the Crusader army split into two factions, the Normans and the French, planning a reunion at Doraleum. However, on the 1st of July, Gilij Arslan ambushed the advanced Norman group. Despite a significant numerical disadvantage, the Normans formed a defensive circle to protect their non-combatants, and urgently signaled for assistance from the French contingent. The battle continued with the arrival of the French forces. Godfrey of Bouillon managed to penetrate the Turkish encirclement, while the venerable legate Adamar initiated a decisive rear assault. Surprised by the swift French support and resilience of the Normans, Arslan's forces withdrew, thwarting his plans to annihilate the Norman contingent. This victory at Dorleum ensured a unchallenged passage through Anatolia for the Crusaders, albeit through a scorched earth led by Arslan's strategic retreat, exacerbating the Crusaders' struggle with the harsh summer conditions, scarcity of food and water. Oh, and if you don't know what a scorched earth policy is, effectively, if you are retreating, you don't want to leave behind you nice farmland and berries to pick off trees and all the rest. You want to leave everything burned and nothing for the enemy army to eat. Well, that certainly makes chasing you a lot more difficult. Well, despite occasional support, and I mean occasional support from local Christians, the Crusaders often had to resort to looting for sustenance, and this underscores the expedition's precarious logistics, once again a long, long way from home. Along with this, leadership disputes persisted among the Crusader chiefs, yet none possessed the authority to claim command, solidifying Adamar's role as a kind of spiritual compass of the First Crusade. Venturing beyond the Silesian gates, Baldwin and Tancred embarked on divergent paths towards the lands of Armenia, fueled by Baldwin's ambition to carve out his own dominion within the Holy Land. And it's not Baldwin the Fourth, by the way, before you ask. Now relying on local Armenian support, notably from the adventurous Bagrat, they separated their forces after leaving Heraclea on the 15th of September. Tancred's swift arrival at Tarsus saw him coaxing the Seljuk defenders to accept his banner atop the citadel, only for Baldwin to follow suit the subsequent next day, gaining control over key defensive positions. Well, despite being completely outnumbered, Tancred opted against conflict over the city. The situation began to escalate when Norman reinforcements were barred entry by Baldwin, leading to their slaughter by the Turks, a tragedy for which Baldwin's troops held him responsible, resulting in a retaliatory massacre of the Seljuk garrison. In the aftermath, 
Baldwin secured the loyalty of Gunamer of Bologna, a pirate who sailed up to Tarsus by enlisting his crew for the city's defences, furthering his campaign's ambitions. Meanwhile, Tancred had claimed Mamistra, only for tensions to flare upon Baldwin's arrival, driven by Norman desires for retribution over Tarsus. This discord saw Baldwin departing for Mirage, yet Bagrat's persuasion led him to campaign through Armenian populated areas, culminating in the capture of strategic fortresses by the year's end, with Bagrat appointed as Ravendel's governor. In the early part of 1098, Baldwin was beckoned to Edessa by Lord Thoros, seeking aid against Seljuk encroachments. Baldwin's departure to Edessa was marked by the detention and interrogation of Bagrat, who was suspected of Seljuk collusion, and a harried journey beset by Balduk of Samosata's forces. Baldwin's entry into Edessa heralded a pivotal alliance, as Thoros conferred upon him a co-regency, solidified by military reinforcements from Edessa. This coalition enabled Baldwin to finally confront Balduk, securing a strategic foothold near Samosata, amidst regional power dynamics profoundly influenced by Baldwin's burgeoning leadership and evolving crusader presence. Well, not long after Baldwin's victorious return, the tranquility of Edessa was shattered by a conspiracy among the local aristocracy, seemingly with Baldwin's tacit approval. Very sneaky. This led, as it always does, to a violent uprising, forcing Thoros to seek sanctuary within the city's walls. Baldwin now seen as Thoros's heir, vowed protection. However, on the 9th of March, when insurgents stormed the citadel, taking the lives of Thoros and his spouse, Baldwin's intervention was notably absent. It's funny how that works. Sure, it's just a coincidence. The following dawn witnessed Baldwin's elevation to Count of Edessa by the citizenry, marking the inception of the Crusader States. Now, the Byzantine Empire, having relinquished Edessa to Seljuk control years earlier, voiced zero opposition to Baldwin's new title, not a single objection. This strategic victory not only fortified Baldwin's position, but also ensured vital resources for the Crusaders' campaign towards Antioch, acting as a bulwark against Seljuk advances and securing essential supplies. Back in Edessa, Baldwin's governance was characterized by shrewd diplomacy and strategic matrimonial alliances marrying Arda of Armenia, thereby solidifying his position and fostering integration with the local populace. His acquisition of Samosata through negotiations with Balduk marked a pioneering peaceful accord between the Crusader and Muslim leaderships, showcasing Baldwin's adeptness in both warfare but also diplomacy. That being said, Balduk was in no position to bargain. Now this whole narrative of Edessa is further enriched by figures such as Belek Ghazi, the Artukid Emir, Emir is a word for prince in Arabic, with familial ties to Seljuk governance, who initially aligned with Baldwin. However, the siege of Saruj, Baldwin's strategic demands, and the subsequent execution of Balduk 
underscore this precarious balance of power. The defense of Edessa against Karabogar's formidable siege later on highlighted Baldwin's resilient leadership, inadvertently aiding the Crusaders' pivotal triumph at Antioch, and setting a precedent for the enduring legacy of the Crusaders' states in the Levant. The Crusading Forces, now with Baldwin and Tancred, and a good dose of confidence, advanced towards Antioch, a city renowned for its formidable defences, but also its strategic position. All in all, it was incredibly important. They had to have it. Stephen of Blois, in correspondence, depicted Antioch as an immensely fortified and seemingly unconquerable city. In October 1097, the Crusaders laid siege, hoping for Antioch's surrender through coercion, or perhaps if they were really lucky, internal betrayal, a method that had seen the city's allegiance switch between the Byzantines and the Seljuks previously. Well, despite their efforts, the vastness of Antioch allowed it to remain partially supplied prolonging the crusaders' endeavour and labelling the siege of Antioch as notably significant in the history of sieges itself. Now this prolonged siege was so very special. It stretched over eight months. I mean, if you thought lockdown was bad, well, this was just as bad truly, and it saw the Crusaders grappling with starvation, attributed by Adamar to their sinfulness. Yes, that's right, he had told them that it was all their fault, and they should just imagine the food. Well, this led to strict fasts, prayers, and for some reason they decided to kick out all of the women no girls allowed. Adamar, I think, perhaps had some issues of his own. But that's speculation. Well, because of this, desertions became common, including that of Stephen of Bloy. Relief did come through foraging and aid from allies, notably via supplies from Cilicia and Edessa and the newly seized ports of Latakia and St. Simeon, alongside a crucial English fleet bearing provisions in March. And it wasn't just that. The Muslim world's fragmented state further played to the Crusaders' advantage, missing a pivotal opportunity to oust the besiegers with united forces. Well, oh the infighting. On both sides was bad, but sometimes it was worse on the other side, and you could capitalize on that. Now Kerboga's ambitious coalition aimed to expand his dominance to the Mediterranean, but was delayed at Sarouge, crucially affecting the siege's outcome. Bohemond's negotiation with an Armenian commander of Antioch's defences led to a clandestine entry on the 2nd of June, allowing the Crusaders to take the city in a violent sack, indiscriminately killing Muslims and Christians alike amidst the chaos. It was just a uncontrolled bloodbath. A sack of a city is never a good time. Well, upon Kerboga's approach on the 4th of June, his substantial force encircled the Crusaders, initiating a relentless assault for several days starting with the 10th of June. With the situation dire, 
Bohemond and Ademar sealed the city's exits to prevent a collapse from within. Shifting strategies, Kerboga aimed to starve them into submission, which is, by the way, how most sieges went. While well, the discovery of the Holy Lance by Peter Bartholomew claimed to have been revealed in a divine vision, offered a fleeting morale boost. Though its true impact is debated, given the two-week gap before the decisive confrontation and, come on, the Holy Lance? Well, as long as you believe it, I suppose it has as much power as you want it to. Well, as surrender negotiations failed on the 24th of June, the Crusaders, against all odds, sallied forth on the 28th of June, surprisingly maintaining cohesion against a comparatively disorganized Muslim assault. And this resulted in a significant victory for the outnumbered Crusaders with the Muslim forces ultimately retreating in disarray and confusion, the Christians had won the day. Good job, boys. Now Stephen of Blois, upon witnessing Antioch's rather grim circumstance, effectively abandoned the cause, informing Emperor Alexios of their seemingly impending doom which contributed to a narrative of abandonment by Alexios, used by Beaumont to justify his claim over Antioch. This contention led to internal disputes among the Crusaders, delayed by their differing origins and personal ambitions, further complicated by a devastating plague that claimed Adhemar, among others. Yeah, but honestly, Adamar was no big loss. The year's end saw the Crusaders, desperate and diminished, resorting to cannibalism after the siege at Marat al numan an act which was unrecorded by contemporary Muslim sources. Don't hear about that very much, don't you? Well, despite leadership conflicts and the whole eating each other thing, the march towards Jerusalem resumed in early 1099, with Bohemond remaining in Antioch, thus founding the first Crusader state. As the Crusader forces advanced along the Mediterranean coast towards Jerusalem, they encountered comparatively minimal resistance. Local rulers chose negotiation over conflict, supplying the Crusaders rather than engaging in battle. The Crusader army's hierarchy saw changes too. Robert Curtos and Tancred pledged their allegiance to Raymond IV of Toulouse, attracted by his wealth and the promise of compensation. In contrast, Godfrey of Bouillon bolstered his brother's achievements in Indessa, declined Raymond's overtures. January saw Raymond lead a procession towards Jerusalem, a symbolic march aimed at demonstrating piety and determination with Robert and Tancred and their armies in tow. Raymond's ambition extended beyond Jerusalem, by the way. He eyed Tripoli for the establishment of a domain to rival Bohemond's Antioch. This led to the protracted siege of Arca in February 1099. Meanwhile, Godfrey and allies, including Robert of Flanders and the recently independent Tancred, converged on Arca, reinforcing the siege. 
the Crusades' leadership faced a good deal of turmoil, particularly after the divisive ordeal by fire concerning the Holy Lance, which severely dented Raymond's credibility. Wasn't so holy after all, hmm? While well, failing to capture Arca, the Crusaders rejected a Fatimid proposal for a peaceful pilgrimage and continued to push on towards the holy city of Jerusalem. The Fatimid governor, aware of the impending threat, took drastic measures to hinder the Crusader advance. Yet the Crusaders' march continued unabated receiving support from Tripoli's emir, and reaching abandoned Ramallah. Upon sighting Jerusalem, the culmination of their long and arduous journey, the crusaders were overwhelmed with emotion. They'd gotten to the holy city. Their campaign, marked by faith, ambition, and strife, now faced its ultimate test at the holy city's gates. Upon reaching Jerusalem, the crusaders were met with a surprisingly desolate landscape, devoid of any essential supplies, and always under the looming threat of Fatimid retaliation. The option to lay siege similar to their strategy at Antioch, was deemed to be unfeasible due to their depleted numbers and resources. Well, consequently, they opted for a direct assault on the city. At this juncture, the Crusader forces had dwindled to an estimated 12,000, including only 1,500 cavalry. Remember, they set off with about 100,000? Well, they certainly dwindled away, didn't they? Well, this desperate situation necessitated a decisive move for Jerusalem's capture. They had to get in. Otherwise, they would simply be starving to death outside the city's walls or just going back to eating each other. Now, the cohesion among these varied contingents was at a nadir, with Godfrey and Tancred positioning to the city's north and Raymond to the south. And at this point, their unity was quite fragmented, evident in the Provençal's troops' absence from the initial attack on the 13th of June. This first attempt, more exploratory than forceful, ended in failure as they breached the outer, but not the inner, wall. In response to this setback, the leaders held the meeting, concluding that a united, forceful assault was imperative. The arrival of the Genoese mariners, led by Guglielmo, Imbracchio, sorry about uh, butchering that one, at Jaffa on the 17th of June proved fortuitous, bringing not only skilled engineers, but also critical supplies, including the timber that was needed for siege machinery. The crusaders' spirits were further uplifted by Peter Desiderius's vision which likened their forthcoming victory to the biblical conquest of Jericho, prescribing a fast, followed by a barefoot procession around Jerusalem's walls. The sight of this most likely would have provoked quite an interesting reaction from the guards looking down upon them. Now, complying, the crusaders observed a fast on the 8th of July, and encircled the city walls, slowly walking around them, culminating in their march on the Mount of Olives, with a sermon from Peter the Hermit as the main event of the day. This act of unity was timely, 
as news of an advancing Fatimid army from Egypt reached them, underscoring the urgency of their mission to breach Jerusalem's defenses. The ultimate assault commenced on the 13th of July, with Raymond's forces targeting the southern gate and others the northern wall. Initial efforts by the Provencals at the south gate struggled, but those attacking the north gradually got through, and the city's defences eroded. Well, by the 15th of July, two days later, a concerted effort enabled the Crusaders to breach the inner northern rampart, causing a collapse in the defenders' resolve and opening the city to the invaders. The entry into Jerusalem was marked by widespread killing, contrasting sharply with the Crusaders' spiritual zeal. And despite varying historical interpretations of the scale of the massacre, contemporary accounts are pretty much all agreeing that it was a rather brutal one. The massacre also extended all the way to the Temple Mount, where defenders were ruthlessly killed until Tancred's invention spared those in Al-Aqsa Mosque. The southern defenders, learning of the breach, fled, and Raymond's forces entered the city under an agreement with the garrison commander for safe passage. Well, regardless of this, the bloodshed persisted, targeting both Jews and Muslims equally, with the former perishing in a synagogue where they were all forced and put into, and, well, then the Crusaders lit it on fire. Not a good way to go. Well, despite the horror, many city inhabitants managed to survive sometimes through escape, or perhaps by ransom. Others, reportedly, managed to say, Wait, 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 don't kill me. Here's a bag of gold. Let me go. Works, sometimes. Well, the city's eastern Christian residents had previously been expelled, so they weren't around to see all of this and very lucky that they weren't, because they may have been confused. Of course, they may have been killed along with everybody else. I mean, how different would they really have looked? I'm sure God would not have liked that one, wouldn't he? Now, the 22nd of July... On this day, a pivotal meeting took place within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, aimed at deciding the leadership and governance of Jerusalem. The absence of a clear ecclesiastical authority, due to the recent death of the Greek patriarch, left a void for secular governance, a concept that was actually supported by quite a many people. Now, Raymond of Toulouse, despite being a leading figure in the Crusades since 1098, saw his influence gradually wane away, particularly after his unsuccessful siege at Arca and his failed efforts to carve out a territory for himself. He was still somewhat trying to get over the embarrassment, but everybody else knew it's very hard to forget. His refusal of the crown, citing that only Christ was worthy to be king, could have been a strategy to encourage others to decline the role. Yet Godfrey of Bullion was quite undeterred. Give me that crown, he said. Likely bolstered by his commanding Lorrainian army and his noble lineage, of course, the nobility was only noble because it was a right hand down from God, correct? Well, consequently, 
Godfrey was chosen as the ruler, adopting the title Advocatus Sancti Sepulchri, or Defender of the Holy Sepulchre. This election also managed to rather ruffle some feathers, especially Raymond's, who made a brief but futile attempt to take the Tower of David, before simply giving up and leaving the city with his tail between his legs. Now, it was around this time that the visionary behind the First Crusade, Pope Urban II, actually passed away. Indeed, he passed away on July 29th, 1099, but at this time he was unaware of Jerusalem's fall to the Crusaders. His successor, Pope Pascal II, would lead the church for nearly two decades following these monumental events. And of course, Jerusalem. Well, that city's fate would continue to oscillate back and forth. Held by the Kingdom of Jerusalem until 1291, but briefly falling under Muslim control after Saladin's victory at the Battle of Hattin in 1187. But of course, that's for the next video on the Crusades. Now, in the heat of August 1099, the Fatimid vizier Al-Afdal Shahan Shah orchestrated a landing at Ascalon with a formidable contingent of 20,000 troops from North Africa. In response, Geoffrey and Raymond led a considerably smaller force of 1,200 knights and 9,000 infantry to confront the Fatimids on August 9th at the Battle of Ascalon. Despite facing a two-to-one numerical disadvantage, the Crusaders decided on a surprise attack at dawn, a very cheeky one, catching the overly confident and ill-prepared Fatimid army completely off guard, and massacring a good deal of them. A very staggering and strategic victory. However, it wasn't all good news. Internal conflicts between Godfrey and Raymond squandered a pivotal chance to capture that city, as disagreements over leadership prevented the city's garrison from capitulating to Raymond, whom they deemed more trustworthy. This significant triumph didn't translate into any real territorial gain at all, and Ascalon simply remained under Muslim control posing an ongoing military challenge to the newly formed Crusader Kingdom. Following their vows, a significant portion of the Crusaders deemed their pilgrimage fulfilled and opted to return to their homelands, leaving behind a mere 300 knights and 2,000 infantry to safeguard Palestine. Godfrey's ascendancy to Jerusalem's leadership was chiefly supported by the knights from Lorraine, who, upon his demise after just a year, opposed the Papal League Dagobert of Pisa's intent to transform Jerusalem into a theocracy. Instead, they championed Baldwin to become the inaugural Latin King of Jerusalem. Bohemond, well, he set off back to Europe, aiming to confront the Byzantines from Italy, yet he suffered a defeat in 1108 at Dyrrhachium. Raymond? Well, he died, and following his death, his successors with aid from Genoa succeeded in seizing Tripoli in 1109. Now these brand shiny new crusader states, the county of Edessa and the principality of Antioch, showcased rather fluctuating alliances. They jointly faced defeat at the Battle of Haran in 1104, 
yet Antioch was the one that asserted dominance. Even obstructing Baldwin II of Jerusalem's return post-capture at the battle. This era marked the Franks' deep entrenchment into Near Eastern politics, leading to frequent conflicts between Muslims and Christians. Antioch's ambitions for expansion were dramatically halted, following a devastating loss to the Turks at the Battle of Ager Sanguinus. This crusade left behind mixed legacies across Europe. Those who turned back before reaching Jerusalem, as well as those who never departed Europe, faced ridicule and threats of excommunication upon the crusade's triumphant conclusion. Conversely, survivors who reached Jerusalem were hailed as heroes with Robert II of Flanders earning the moniker Hiero Solimantinus for his feats. The subsequent crusade of 1101 saw the return of figures such as Stephen of Blois and Hugh of Vermandois, who had previously retreated, though this force faced near destruction in Asia Minor and its remnants bolstered the Jerusalem kingdom upon arrival. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, if the crusade was so good, how come they didn't make a sequel? Well, they certainly did. And you know, as I said at the start of the video, this is part of a larger series on the crusades in general. That's right, there's more than one. And we've barely scratched the surface. Thank you for your patience. The Fourth Crusade Initially aimed at reclaiming the Holy Land from Muslim control, took an unexpected and controversial turn that culminated in the sack of Constantinople, the Christian capital of the Byzantine Empire. This diversion was prompted by a series of financial and logistical challenges, coupled with the influence of Venetian merchants who redirected the crusading forces for their own economic and political gains. The crusaders' attack on Constantinople not only deepened the rift between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, but also weakened the Byzantine Empire, contributing to its eventual fall to the Ottoman Turks. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, good to meet you. If you're coming back, good to see you again. And if you'd like to support the channel, the links to the Patreon are in the comments and description. Otherwise, those who feel inclined can leave their thoughts in the comments or like and subscribe the video. Now, this is part of a series on the other Crusades. If you want to watch the other videos, then you'll find them on my channel in the Medieval History playlist. Otherwise, let's continue with the history of the Fourth Crusade. Between 1176 and 1187, Saladin's Ayyubid Sultanate overpowered the Crusader states in the Levant, capturing Jerusalem after a siege in 1187. This loss prompted the launch of the Third Crusade. The Ayyubids then reduced the Crusader presence to a few coastal cities, Tyre, Antioch, and Tripoli. The Third Crusade set out with the aim of retaking Jerusalem, and while it didn't capture the city itself, it certainly did regain significant territories, including Acre and Jaffa. The campaign concluded with the Treaty of Jaffa in 1192 that established a truce with Saladin. This period also saw a heightened friction between Western European states and the Byzantine Empire. 
Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa all but nearly attacked Constantinople over disputes with the Byzantine Emperor Isaac II Angelos, who was preoccupied with internal challenges. Now Richard I of England, also known as Richard the Lionheart, managed to capture Cyprus, and instead of returning it to the Byzantine Empire, as was the arrangement, he decided to hand it over to Guy of Lusignan, a former king of the Crusader state of Jerusalem. Following the death of Saladin in 1193, his empire was divided among his sons and brothers. Henry II of Champagne, the ruler of Jerusalem, extended a truce with the Egyptian sultan Al-Aziz Uthman. However, the German Crusade of 1197 somewhat disrupted this peace, leading to further conflicts but eventually resulting in a truce that left Jaffa under Ayyubid control and Beirut with the Crusaders. Now, to the jewel in the crown. Constantinople, existing for 874 years by the time of the Fourth Crusade, remained a major Christian city, retaining much of ancient Rome's infrastructure. It was a key trade hub, attracting interest and envy from Western powers, especially Venice. Now, in 1195, Byzantine Emperor Isaac II Angelos was overthrown, and his successor, Alexios III Angelos, faced significant challenges, including financial instability and defensive neglect. All of these culminated together to further weaken the empire. In January, 1198, Pope Innocent III assumed papal office, with the proclamation of a new crusade as a central ambition of his papacy. His summons went largely unanswered by the monarchs of Europe, due to various political entanglements. For example, Germany was embroiled in conflicts with papal authority, while England and France they were a little bit too busy fighting each other. Nonetheless, inspired by the sermons of Fulke of Neoli, a crusading force was eventually assembled at Tournament in Ecris-sur-Aine in 1199. Organized by the Count Thurbat of Champagne. Now, Thurbat was initially chosen as the leader but was succeeded by Boniface of Montferrat upon his death in 1201. Boniface, inheriting the title from his brother, Conrad of Montferrat, took on the leadership role. Now Boniface, alongside with the Crusaders' leadership, reached out to Venice, Genoa, and other maritime powers in 1200, to attempt to secure a naval passage to Egypt, which was identified as the new target of the Crusade, a shift from the previous focus, which was mainly centered around Palestine. This strategy, recognizing Egypt as the primary Muslim power in the Mediterranean, and a significant trading partner, particularly with Venice, of course, the choice of Egypt necessitated a maritime campaign, demanding the assembly of a fleet, and a damn good one. A task Genoa declined, but Venice, under Doge Enrico Dandalo, accepted the task. Dandalo saw this as an opportunity for Venice to expand its wealth, prestige, and territorial holdings and Venetian merchants were known for being particularly savvy. Their entire culture at this point was 
just about making money and building boats, which kind of goes hand in hand. The agreements with Venice stipulated the transportation of a substantial force that required at least a year of preparations. Of course, this affected Venice's commercial engagements. The crusading force, primarily hailing from various regions of France, including Blois, Champagne, Amiens, and Burgundy, among others, also saw participation from Flanders, Montferrat, and contingents from the Holy Roman Empire. This diverse assembly was to depart Venice in the early October 1202, aiming directly for Cairo, the stronghold of the Ayyubid Caliphate. Pope Innocent III ratified this plan, emphasizing a prohibition against assaults on Christian territories. Not all crusaders agreed to depart from Venice, however, leading many to embark from Flanders, Marcel, and Genoa instead. By May 1202, the main body of the crusader army had gathered in Venice, but the numbers were somewhat less than anticipated. Only around 12,000 showed up, and they were expecting 33,000 at least. A little disappointing. Well, Venice had fulfilled its part of the agreement, preparing 50 war galleys and 450 transport ships, which was more than enough for the gathered forces. However, the Crusaders fell short of the required 85,000 silver marks, managing to scrape together only 35,000, and later adding another 14,000 through severe financial sacrifices. Of course, this situation put Venice in quite a difficult position, having paused its commercial activities to outfit the expedition. So not only they lost money because they weren't doing business as usual, all of a sudden, bills could not be paid because the crusaders did not meet their obligation. Talk about heartbreaking for Venice. Well, the requirement to crew the fleet also placed a considerable strain on Venice's workforce and economy. So it was not looking good for them. Doge d'Angelo and the Venetian leaders had to then make a choice. The crusade could not afford its fees, yet disbanding the assembled force would damage Venetian prestige and financial stability. Dondolo proposed a solution. The crusaders could offset their debt by targeting various Adriatic ports and towns. This culminated in the capture of Zara in Dalmatia, a city that had asserted its independence from Venetian control and was under protection of King Emmerich of Hungary and Croatia. I'm sure you can imagine how Hungary and Croatia felt about this development. Well, of course, the decision to attack Zara was controversial, to say the least. King Emmerich was a Catholic who had taken up the cross, and many crusaders objected to assaulting fellow Christians. In fact, they had been told specifically not to do this. It was the only rule that they were given. Well, some, including a group led by Simon de Montfort, opted out and pursued their own journey to the Holy Land independently. Despite opposition from the Pope's threat of excommunication, the Crusaders proceeded to besiege Zara, capturing it in November of 1202 after displaying its Catholic affiliation, did not deter the attack. Now, Pope Innocent III 
who had told them, Whatever you do, do not attack other Christians. Upon learning of the sack of Zara, excommunicated the crusaders, urging them to adhere to the original vows and proceed directly to Jerusalem. Fearing the disillusion of their forces, the crusades' leaders withheld the Pope's decree from their troops. Innocent III later lifted the excommunication for those not directly involved in the attack on Zara, recognizing the coercive influence of the Venetians on the crusaders. Now, the tension between Venice and the Byzantine Empire was significantly heightened by both commercial rivalry and the historical grievances, which mainly stemmed from the massacre of the Latins. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I'm sure you can guess what happened via the name. Now, the Chronicle of Novgorod suggests a deeply personal element to this animosity, alleging that Doge Enrico Dandolo had been blinded on the orders of Emperor Manuel I Comnenos during an embassy to Constantinople in 1171. This, of course, fueled quite a lot of resentment towards the Byzantines, especially from Dandolo, who was walking around with his hands in front of him. Now, in the lead-up to the fleet's departure from Venice, Boniface of Montferrat made a detour to visit his cousin, Philip of Swabia, sparking a good bit of speculation about his motives. Now, he might have been trying to avoid the threat of excommunication, aware of Venice's contentious plans, or he might have sought an alliance with Alexios IV Angelos, Philip's brother-in-law and the son of their dethroned Emperor Isaac II Angelos. It's uncertain whether Boniface knew of Angelos the Fourth's presence at Philip's court. Now, Alexios IV, who was at this time in exile, proposed a rather lucrative deal to support the crusade financially, offer military assistance, and promise ecclesiastical concessions in exchange for the crusader's help in reclaiming his father's throne from Emperor Alexios III Angelos. This proposal, delivered to the crusade's leadership during their winter stay in Zara, and promising to alleviate their financial strain, was met with quite a lot of enthusiasm, particularly by Doge D'Angelo. But, despite Dandolo's intricate knowledge of Byzantine politics and skepticism about the feasibility of Alexios IV's promises, the allure of resolving their monetary predicament swayed their leaders. After all, they were in way too deep, and they needed a way out, whatever it was. Boniface of Montferrat having returned from his visit with Alexios IV, joined the fleet in Corfu, ready to advance the plan. While most leaders were persuaded, or possibly influenced by Dandolo's incentives, a faction led by Renaud of Montmirail opted out, proceeding directly to Syria. Now the crusade, now committed to venture against Constantinople itself, a Christian city, prepared a formidable naval force, including siege engines, and set sail in April 1203. Despite the controversial nature of their new objective, Pope Innocent III's response was ambivalent. He forbade attacks on Christian entities, unless they obstructed the crusade. Stopping short, just a little bit short, of outright condemnation of the plan to attack Constantinople. 
Well, upon their arrival at Constantinople on the 23rd of June, 1203, those of the Fourth Crusade faced a city of immense scale, home to half a million inhabitants, protected by a garrison of 15,000 men, including the renowned 5,000 Varangian guards and a modest naval fleet of 20 galleys. Despite its imposing population and storied defenses, the city's military might was constrained by political and economic factors, limiting its permanent forces to a core of units, albeit quite elite and experienced. In times of imminent threat, the Byzantine capital had historically been able to call upon reinforcements from its provincial territories. However, this time, the swift approach of the Fourth Crusade left the city's defenders ill-prepared for the siege. The crusaders' primary aim was to dethrone Emperor Alexios III Angelos and replace him with Alexios IV, the exiled son of the previous emperor, Isaac II. They were driven by the promise of substantial rewards from Alexios IV for their military support. This demand was communicated to Alexios III's representatives via Conan of Bethune, emphasizing the crusaders' intent to fulfill their bargain with the claimant to the throne. Now the internal politics of succession within the Byzantine Empire, marked by a history of palace coups and a fluid concept of hereditary right, meant that the citizens of Constantinople viewed the Crusaders' cause with a good bit of detachment. Accustomed as they were to frequent shifts in imperial power. After all, it's not like they were voting anybody in. A king is a king, right? Well, initially, the Crusaders attempted to take control of the strategic suburbs of Chalcedon and Chrysopolis, but they were repelled back. However, they demonstrated their military prowess in a smaller engagement, where a contingent of 80 Frankish knights achieved a surprising victory against a larger Byzantine force of 500. Well, this showcases quite a lot of tactical advantages and determination of the Crusaders, despite being outnumbered. To breach Constantinople, the Crusaders first had to get across the Bosphorus, utilizing around 200 vessels, including horse transports and galleys, they crossed the narrow strait. The Byzantine forces, arranged by Alexios III along the shore north of Galata, were quickly overcome by the Crusader force, who charged from their transports, causing the Byzantine troops to retreat in fear. The Crusaders then targeted the Tower of Galata, key for its control over the chain that blocked the Golden Horn, guarded by a diverse garrison of mercenaries from England, Denmark, and mainland Italy. Well, on July 6th, the Crusaders' flagship, the Aquila, succeeded in breaking this chain, with a segment of it later sent to Acre to strengthen the defences there. During the siege of the Tower of Galata, Although the defenders made several attempts to break the siege, they often faced very heavy casualties. In a notable sally, many defenders were unable to return to the tower, and were either killed by the crusaders or drowned in the Bosphorus. The capture of the tower allowed the crusaders to access the Golden Horn, and the Venetian fleet sailed right in. 
a display intended to rally support for Alexios IV from the city's populace, instead was met with taunts and jeers from the citizens, contradicting the crusaders' expectations of a warm welcome for the pretender. On July 11th, the crusaders positioned themselves near the Blackernane Palace at the city's northwest. Initial assaults on the walls were repelled, but a week later, on July 17th, a more coordinated attack on the sea and land walls at the same time led to the Venetians breaching around 25 towers. The Varangian Guard repelled attacks on the land walls until a retreat covered by a Venetian fire screen inadvertently caused significant destruction and displacement within the city. In a decisive move, Alexios III marshaled a large force to confront the Crusaders, but ultimately retreated without engaging, severely impacting morale and leading to his personal flight from the city. Not a good look, Alexios. With Alexios gone, Constantinople's authorities reinstated Isaac II, faced with achieving their declared goal, but without the promised reward, the Crusaders negotiated for Alexios IV to be made co-emperor alongside his father Isaac II, culminating in Alexios IV's coronation on August the 1st. Now Alexios IV, he found himself in a challenging position, unable to fulfill the grand promises he'd made to the Crusaders due to the depleted state of the imperial treasury, exacerbated by Alexios III's escape with a significant portion of the empire's wealth. Things were about to get very, very awkward. In a desperate attempt to gather funds, Alexios ordered the melting down of Roman icons for their precious metals, but he managed to raise only around a hundred thousand silver marks, a decision that horrified the Byzantine populace and was seen as a grievous act of sacrilege. Now this act was condemned by citizens and historians alike, with many marking it as the pivotal moment, symbolic of the empire's decline. Just imagine what we lost, all those great statues, melted down. It's like taking your mother's wedding ring to a pawn shop to pay your electricity bills. Ugh. Terrible. The forced desecration of religious icons alienated Alexios IV from his people and heightened tensions within Constantinople. In a bid to secure his position, Alexios IV sought to extend his alliance with the Crusaders for another six months until April of 1204 and even led a contingent to confront Alexios III. Now during his absence, civil unrest escalated, culminating in violent riots and a devastating fire that ravaged the city, leaving approximately 100,000 people without homes and managing to even further strain relations between the Byzantines and the Latin population as if they were not strained enough as it was. Now the death of Isaac II in January of 1204, and the growing dissatisfaction with Alexios IV's rule, led to a brief and unsuccessful attempt by the Byzantine Senate to appoint Nicholas Cannabus as emperor. But Nicholas was not keen on the idea, and he simply declined the position. Well, if he had have taken it up, there was a good chance he would just be simply assassinated some weeks later. Perhaps we should give him a little bit more credit 
for being ahead of the curve. Alexios Dukas, a notable figure with military experience and respect among the populace, at least the majority of them, capitalized on the widespread discontent to seize power for himself. After deposing and executing Alexios IV, Dugas was crowned Emperor Alexios V. He promptly focused on reinforcing the city's defenses and rallying support against the crusader threat. Well, infuriated by the assassination of Alexios IV, whom they had supported and put quite a lot of hope and stock into, the Crusaders and Venetians, who were still quite out of money, demanded that Emperor Alexios V honor the commitments previously made. Now, Alexios V's refusal to comply led to yet another assault on Constantinople. On April the 8th, Despite the Byzantines' forces, strong resilience and their success in damaging the Crusaders' siege equipment with heavy projectiles, adverse weather conditions, and a strong shore wind hampered the Crusaders' efforts, preventing most of their ships from approaching the walls effectively. Therefore, this initial attack was a complete failure with only one minor engagements at the city's towers, and none of which of them were captured. Back to the drawing board. Well, in the aftermath, Latin clergy within the crusading army sought to rally the demoralized troops, preaching that their cause was just and divinely sanctioned, despite the setback. You've got to be joking. I think everybody knew at this point that they were just fighting to get themselves out of debt. Well, either way, they framed the failed assault, not as divine punishment, but as a test of faith, depicting the Byzantines as traitors for the murder of Alexios IV, and comparing them unfavorably the quote was apparently made by the Latin clergy that they were even more traitorous than the Jews. Which, make of that what you will. Well, this attempt to morally justify the campaign against Constantinople was met with mixed reception. But a soldier must follow orders, right? Ignoring Pope Innocent III's commands against attacking, the Crusaders made preparations for another assault, while Alexios V opted to defend from within the city. The Varangian Guard, who were also unpaid and discontented, simply walked off. They left their posts and Alexios V was forced to flee when nightfall hit. Now amidst all this, there had to be a new emperor, right? Well, the efforts to appoint one amid all this chaos, of course, proved very futile. So, Constantinople was effectively a city without a ruler. Fortune favoured the Crusaders on April 12th, when favourable winds allowed the Venetian fleet to breach the city's defences. A small group of Crusaders then breached the walls, and despite fierce resistance from Byzantine forces, including negotiations by the Anglo-Saxon defenders for better pay, the Crusaders gained a foothold in the Blackerne Quarter, their attempt to use fire as a defensive measure inadvertently caused further destruction. Who would have thought? And another 15,000 people had their homes burned down. 
Well, by the next day, April 13th, the Crusaders had taken complete control of Constantinople. Marking a significant and devastating turn in the city's history, and a devastating turn in the broader context of the Crusades. I mean, what had the Crusades become, with Christians fighting Christians? One can only imagine the Muslim rulers watching on from Jerusalem, thinking, what on earth are they doing? Well, for three days following their breach of Constantinople, the Crusaders engaged in unprecedented pillage, marking one of the darkest episodes in medieval history. The systematic destruction and looting inflicted upon the city saw a loss or damage of countless Greco-Roman and medieval works, alongside widespread violence against the civilian population. Churches and monasteries, despite the sacredness afforded to them, were not spared. They were desecrated and stripped of their treasures, contravening even the threat of excommunication. No one cared. They just wanted to loot. Well, eyewitnesses from the period, including Nicetas Corniates and Geoffrey of Villardouin, documented the ruthless greed and destruction that characterized the sack. Not seen since the fall of Rome back in 410. The looting of Constantinople resulted in the acquisition of approximately 900,000 silver marks worth of treasure. While the Venetians claimed their agreed portion, the distribution of the spoils among the Crusaders was uneven, with a significant amount concealed by some knights. Deep pockets, of course. The brutality of the sack, characterized by murder, looting, and was noted for its sheer scale, drawing comparisons to the sacking by historical barbarian tribes, yet surpassing them in ferocity. The Venetians, partly Byzantine in culture themselves, managed to save some of the priceless art. However, many crusaders from other regions who were perhaps not quite as high class didn't recognize the value of these things and engaged in acts of profound desecration and violence. Which leads us to the Hagia Sophia, the pinnacle of Christian architecture in Constantinople, which was subjected to some of the most egregious violations. Its religious icons, holy books, and silver iconostasis were destroyed, and the sanctity of the patriarchal throne was desecrated in a mocking display of contempt for the orthodox Christian tradition. This event not only represented the significant loss of culture and religious heritage, but also deepened the schism between the Eastern Orthodox and Western Catholic churches, exacerbating the estrangement of East and West. In fact, it's rather arguable that this event of the Fourth Crusade was more damaging to Constantinople in terms of loss of culture and art and literature than the actual fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 was. Think about that. The consequences of the Fourth Crusade's diversion to Constantinople extended beyond the immediate horrors and destruction. It signaled a pivotal decline in Byzantine power, which hastened its vulnerability to future conquests 
and ultimately facilitating the rise of the Ottoman Empire. This rather ironic outcome starkly contrasted with the Crusades' initial goals, leading to a resurgence of Islam in regions once held by Christian powers. Pope Innocent III was understandably quite angry about this. His reaction to these atrocities committed by the Crusaders was one of profound dismay and complete confusion. As he confronted the moral and spiritual failings of those he had sent forth under the banner of the cross. The sack of Constantinople remains a poignant testament to the complexities and unintended consequences of the crusading movement, leaving a lasting imprint on the historical trajectory of both Eastern and Western Christendom. Of course, imagine being Pope Innocent III. This whole thing was his idea in the first place. It's kind of like finding out your son is a mass murderer. But, of course, not everybody was in on the siege of Constantinople. The journey of the Fourth Crusade was marked by numerous defections, with many crusaders choosing to take a more direct route and fulfill their vows by heading straight to the Holy Land, bypassing the siege of Constantinople entirely. Despite Geoffrey of Vilhadwin's portrayal of these individuals as deserters, modern historical analysis suggests that a significant number, though not a majority, of the Crusaders made their way to the Holy Land by any means necessary. A substantial portion of these Crusaders departed from southern Italy, particularly from ports in Apulia, aiming for a landing at Arca. This route was chosen by several knights and their retinues, who for various reasons, including disillusionment with the Crusades' direction, or simply a desire to fulfill their vows more directly, opted for a more linear approach. The financial resources for the Holy Land's defense, including the contributions from the preacher Fulk of Newley, were rather significant. These funds were directed towards the fortification of Arca, which was already fortified enough as it was, but this reinforced its defences against potential attacks. The defections, well, they occurred in waves, with a notable number leaving after the siege of Zara, and others departing directly from Zara for the Holy Land. Some crusaders, upon reaching the Holy Land, found themselves constrained by existing truces with Muslim powers, and limited in their military options. These constraints had led to rather tragic outcomes for some, like Renard and his contingent, who suffered ambush and captivity while attempting to engage in military actions independently. Additionally, several official and unofficial groups made their way to the Holy Land, either in defiance of, or as an alternative to, the main crusading forces' objectives. These groups included notable figures and contingents that chose to distance themselves from the controversial decisions made by the crusaders' leadership. Now in the summer of 1202, Baldwin of Flanders made the strategic decision to divide his forces for the Fourth Crusade, leading one contingent to Venice and dispatching another by sea under the leadership of John II of Nessel, Thierry of Flanders, and Nicholas of Mali. The Flemish fleet embarked on a Mediterranean journey that included a notable military engagement on the African coast where they managed to capture a Muslim city, 
leaving it under the control of the Livonian Brothers of the Sword, before heading to Marcel to overwinter. The Marcel pilots, renowned for their navigational skills and experience in open sea sailing, offered the Flemish and French crusaders a vital link to the Holy Land. By March 1203, Baldwin's fleet received orders to sail towards Metheny to meet with the Venetian forces. However, due to timing and decision-making processes influenced perhaps by the news of the Crusades' redirection to Constantinople, the Flemish fleet chose to proceed directly to Acre, possibly making a stop in Cyprus, where theory of Flanders laid a familial claim to the island. Now upon reaching Acre, the Flemish contingent faced the same diplomatic constraints as other crusaders, with King Amory of Jerusalem adhering to his truce with the Ayubids, and thus limiting their military options. The crusaders dispersed, serving in different capacities across the Levantine states, with some being captured in conflicts that erupted after the truce's initial breakdown. The changing politics and military dynamics in the region, highlighted by the seizure of ships by both Christian and Muslim forces, speaks to the precarious balance of power and the complex network of alliances and hostilities that characterize this period. The embassy of Martin of Paris and Conrad of Schwarzenberg to the main crusader army, beseeching it to join the conflict in the Holy Land following the truce's violations, illustrates the ongoing challenges and fragmented nature of the crusading effort by this time, as well as, of course, the difficulties in undertaking such a diverse and geographically dispersed task. Now back to Pope Innocent. He spoke of the outcomes of the crusade thusly, and, my God, he does not sound happy about it. This is from Pope Innocent III, a quote. How, indeed, will the Church of the Greeks, no matter how severely she is beset with afflictions and persecutions, return into ecclesiastical union and to a devotion for the apostolic see, when she has seen in Latins only an example of perdition and the works of darkness, so that she now, with reason, detests the Latins more than dogs. As for those who are supposed to be seeking the ends of our Lord Jesus Christ, and not their own ends, who made their swords, which they were supposed to use against the pagans, drip with Christian blood. They have spared neither religion nor age. They have committed adultery and fornication before the eyes of men. They have exposed both matrons and virgins, even those dedicated to God, to the sordid lusts of men. Not satisfied with breaking open the imperial treasury and plundering the goods of princes and lesser men, they have also laid their hands on the treasures of the churches, and what is more serious, on their very own possessions. They have even ripped silver plates from the altars, and have hacked them to pieces among themselves. They violated the holy places and have carried off crosses and relics. End of the quote from Pope Innocent III. Doesn't sound happy about it, doesn't he? Well, following the sack of Constantinople in 1204, the Fourth Crusade culminated in the division of the Byzantine Empire through the Partitio Terrarum Imperi Romaniae a treaty that allocated territories between the Republic of Venice and the leading crusaders. This partitioning led to the establishment of the Latin Empire of Constantinople, 
marking a profound shift in the region's political and cultural landscape. Boniface of Montferrat, despite being a favoured candidate for the emperorship among many, given his royal connections and his visibility among the crusader forces, was ultimately bypassed in favour of Baldwin of Flanders for the imperial throne. The Venetians harboured certain reservations about Boniface, fearing his ties to the previous Byzantine regime and his potential bias towards Genoa, concerns that stemmed from Montferrat's geographical proximity to Genoa and Boniface's own familial connections through his brother Rainier's marriage to Maria Comnene, a former empress. As a result, Baldwin of Flanders was crowned the first emperor of the newly formed Latin Empire, while Boniface was compensated with the creation of the Kingdom of Thessalonica. Effectively, a vassal state to the Latin Empire. Now Venice, don't forget about them. They also secured significant gains, notably establishing the Duchy of the Archipelago in the Aegean Sea, further asserting its maritime dominance and expanding its commercial empire. Well, the aftermath of the Fourth Crusade also saw the emergence of Byzantine successor states as refugees and remnants of the Byzantine aristocracy sought to preserve their heritage and authority as much as they possibly could. The Empire of Nicaea, under Theodore Lascaris, the Emperor of Trebizond, and the Despote of Epirus, were among the most significant of these entities, each representing the centre of resistance against Latin rule and a beacon of Byzantine continuity in the face of Latin occupation. And the Muslims, sitting comfortably down in Jerusalem, didn't really feel a thing. Wasn't that interesting? Well, if you've enjoyed this full history of the Fourth Crusade, albeit a one-hour video on the Fourth Crusade perhaps does not do it a justice, but this is the main idea. Well, you best like and subscribe, don't you think? You get more of this in the future. The Eighth Crusade Initiated in 1270 by King Louis the Ninth of France. It was an ill-fated expedition, aimed to strengthen the Christian foothold in the Holy Land by attacking the Muslim-controlled city of Tunis. The campaign was cut short by an outbreak of disease which led to Louis's death and a swift conclusion to the crusade without any significant military engagement. Another disaster in a long line of ever-complicated wars. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to have you with me again. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description and comments, and of course, a like, comment and sub goes a very long way. Thank you in advance for liking the video. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the topic. As always, this is number 8 in my series on the Crusades. If you're interested in the other ones, they're all there on the Medieval History playlist. So let's get on with it. On the 24th of April, 1254, the Seventh Crusade came to an official close when Louis the Ninth of France departed from the Holy Land, leaving behind Godfrey of Sergenes to represent him as the Seneschal to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. 
This was a time when John of Ibelin took on the role of Bailey of the kingdom, following his cousin John of Arsuf, who then returned to Cyprus to counsel Plaisance of Antioch. She was acting as regent for Hugh II of Cyprus, who held claims over both kingdoms of Cyprus and Jerusalem. The passing of Conrad II in Jerusalem in May 1254 led to his toddler son, Conradin, becoming the nominal monarch of Jerusalem. Before his return to France, Louis had managed to negotiate a truce with Damascus that would last until October 1256, a move that was driven by mutual desire to avoid conflict due to the looming threat of the Mongols, and that was a threat for both sides. Similarly, Aibak, the Sultan of Egypt, sought peace and agreed to a ten-year truce with the Franks in 1255, though he made one exception for Jaffa, aiming to secure it as a port. Despite these efforts, the region's stability was as precarious as ever. An example of this was in January of 1256, when a Frankish raid led to a retaliatory expedition by the Mamluk governor of Jerusalem, who was ultimately defeated and killed. This prompted Ibak to negotiate a new treaty with Damascus, extending the truce to include Palestine and Jaffa. The year 1255 saw the death of Robert of Nantes, the Latin patriarch who had been captured with Louis IX during the Seventh Crusade. His successor, appointed by Pope Alexander IV, was James Pantaleon, a bishop very well versed in the affairs of the Prussian Crusades. Taking the name Urban IV, he didn't reach Argo until the summer of 1260, leaving that kingdom without a senior patriarch, amid threats from both Muslims and Mongols, as well as a good amount of internal threats, as there always were. The period also witnessed the War of St. Sabas, fueled by the commercial rivalries among Italian merchant cities, Pisa, Venice and Genoa each vying for control over the critical Mediterranean trade. These conflicts, while detrimental to Christian states, did not deter Muslim emirs from engaging in trade with the Italians, often leading to treaties that ensured their continued profit. A notable incident con occurred in 1250, when a Genoese merchant was killed by a Venetian, igniting tensions within Arca. The rivalries further escalated after Louis's departure, culminating in 1256 with the Genoese and Pisan merchants attacking the Venetian quarter over the monastery of St. Sebas in Arca. Despite various efforts to quell the violence, including the Venetians' temporary control over the monastery and the Genoese blockade, the conflict persisted. Influenced by external support from notable figures and military orders, of course it's trade and commerce, and everybody has their stake in the game. Two years later, in the February of 1258, the landscape of the Levantine politics took a significant turn when Plaisance of Cyprus, alongside her young son Hugh II, journeyed to Tripoli to rendezvous with her brother Bohemond VI of Antioch. Upon their arrival in Acre, a significant meeting of the Hautkur of Jerusalem was summoned 
Beaumont promised that the assembly acknowledge Hugh II as the rightful successor to Conradin, who had been absent from the kingdom for a notably long while. He suggested that Hugh's claim be recognized, with Plaisance serving as the regent. This move was hoped to quell the ongoing civil strife. The Ibelins, along with the Templars and the Teutonic Knights, supported Hugh and Plaisance's claims. However, the Hospitallers contended that no decision could be made without Conradin's presence, thus dragging the royal family deeper and deeper into the civil conflict. The Venetians sided with Plaisance and her son, whereas Genoa, the Hospitallers, and Philip of Montfort backed Conradin, despite their historical opposition to Frederick II. Well, eventually, a majority ruled in favour of recognising Plaisance as regent, leading to John of Arasuf stepping down as Bailey, only to be promptly reinstated. Following these events, Plaisance and Bohemond returned to Cyprus, leaving directives to combat the rebellion decisively. The impending arrival of the new Latin patriarch, James Pantaleon, was overshadowed by the escalating tensions in the Holy Land. Pantaleon, notable for his diplomacy in Prussian crusades, endorsed Plaisance urging Pope Alexander IV for direct intervention. The Pope's response was to call for a truce among the belligerent Italian republics, ordering their envoys to embark on a diplomatic mission to Syria. This was amid ongoing conflicts, notably the Genoese fleet arriving off Tyre and joining forces for the pivotal assault. The consequential Battle of Acre on the 24th of June 1258 saw the Genoese retreat and the Genoese quarter within Acre fall, leading to their withdrawal back to Tyre. The Pope's initiative to dispatch a legatee, Thomas Agne, to mediate the conflict marked a turning point in 1259. I mean, if it's the Genoese fighting, along with the Venetians, those sorts of powers, people begin to lose money. So of course it's of utmost importance for the Pope to step in. Well, following the death of John of Arasov, Plaisance appointed Geoffrey of Sargins as Bailey, who, alongside Agni, managed to broker a temporary armistice. By January 1261, a conciliatory agreement among the Haute Gare and the Italian delegates was achieved, establishing the respective headquarters for the Genoese at Tyre and the Venetians and Pisans at Acre. This peace, however, was very fragile, and conflicts re-erupted, undermining the regional trade and leading to naval skirmishes that persisted until 1270. Godfrey of Sargine's tenure as Bailey saw attempts at restoring order, though his authority did not extend all the way to Tripoli, where the conflict between Henry of Jubail and Beaumont IV continued to escalate. The violent feud culminated in the murder of Bertrand Embriaco, with the blame squarely falling on Beaumont. The incident intensified the hostility between Antioch and the Embriaco family. Now, the complicated politics of the region were further destabilized by the Byzantine recapture of Constantinople. 
the Latin Empire, significantly bolstered by Italian trade, found itself under the threat from Genoa's support for Michael VIII Pelagalos. Michael's triumph at the Battle of Pelagonia and subsequent treaty with the Genoese facilitated the re-establishment of Byzantine control over Constantinople in 1261. And this, of course, effectively dissolved the Latin Empire. All of those treaties that were made, agreements that were struck, promises that were waiting to be kept, well, they were all gone now. Time to renegotiate. Now the death of Plaisance in the September of 1261 once more left the regency of Cyprus and Jerusalem in contention. Despite Hugh of Brienne's claim as the next heir, the High Court of Cyprus favoured Hugh III, Plaisance's nephew, as regent. The acceptance of Hugh III as de facto regent marked a temporary resolution to the succession dispute. Although it was marred by reluctance from the haute corps to pledge full allegiance without Conradin's presence. The subsequent death of Isabella in Cyprus in 1264 reopened the debate over the Jerusalem Regency. Ultimately, the jurists of Outremer favoured kinship over primogeniture, leading to Hugh III's ununanimous recognition by the nobility and military orders. The administration of Arca was once again entrusted to Geoffrey of Sargonese, reflecting a period of arguably relative stability amidst the comparatively chaotic turmoil of normal times. Now, things got a little bit more complicated with the emergence of everybody's new best friends in the mid-thirteenth century. You guessed it, the Mongols, who began their invasions in the 1240s. Establishing the Ilkhanate in the southwestern reaches of their expansive empire, the Mongols quickly became a formidable force, initially overcoming the Ayyubids and constantly shifting their allegiances between the Mamluks and the Christian states of the West. An unreliable ally, but an even worse enemy. Louis IX of France, during his crusade in 1248, found himself in indirect contact with the Mongols through envoys from El Gigide, suggesting a joint military strategy against the Muslim powers of Egypt and Syria. Louis outreach to Mongol courts including missions to the great Khan Guyuk Khan and later his successor Monke, highlighted the complexities of these international relations. Though these efforts ultimately did not culminate in a direct alliance or military cooperation. The Mongol campaign against the assassins in 1257, led by Hulagu, was another demonstration of their military prowess and also strategic ruthlessness. The surrender and subsequent execution of the assassin's leader, Ruk ad Din, marked the near obliteration of this once universally feared sect. Well, in Syria, the Mongol forces again under Hulugu's command proceeded to dismantle the Ayyubid dynasty with the capture of Baghdad in 1258, and then continued their conquests into Syrian territories, including the significant captures of Aleppo and Damascus. 
These actions drastically altered the politics of the region. Notably, the Mongols approached to their Christian allies, such as Hethum I of Armenia and Beaumont VI of Antioch, with another nuanced strategy aimed at leveraging religious and political alliances, which of course included negotiations with the recently reconquered Byzantium. The fallout from these conquests affected the relationships between the various Christian and Muslim states, with significant events such as the excommunication and later absolution of Bohemond VI, illustrating a tangled web of ecclesiastical and political maneuverings. The Mongols, while not seeking direct conflict with the Frankish states, nevertheless found themselves well and truly engaged in hostilities, such as the sacking of Si Don in response to the killing of a Mongol commander. The culmination of all of these events led to the pivotal battle of Ain Jalut in 1260, where the Mamluks of Egypt decisively halted the Mongol advance. The subsequent assassination of the Egyptian Sultan Qutuz by Baibars, who ascended to power shortly after, marked another significant turning point. As Baibars' less conciliatory stance towards alliances with the Franks signaled a shift in the region's diplomacy. The Mongol dominion over the Levant faced a pivotal moment with the death of Hulagu in the February of 1265, which weakened their grip on the region, yes, but momentarily. His widow, Dokus Katun, adeptly secured the succession for her stepson, Abaka, who was a Buddhist and then the governor of Turkestan. Hulagu's pre-death negotiations with the Byzantine Emperor Michael VIII Pelagiliokos for a marital alliance were quickly adapted to the new circumstances, resulting in the marriage of the Emperor's daughter, Maria Pelagina, to Abaka. This transition marked the beginning of a challenging period for Abaka, whose reign was immediately threatened by the Golden Horde in alliance with the Mamluks. In the broader context of the Christian and Islamic worlds, the death of Pope Urban IV was followed by the election of Clement IV in 1265. Abaka sought to reinforce Mongol ties with Western Christendom, to counter the Mamluk threat, initiating diplomatic exchanges with Clement IV and dispatching ambassadors to Europe in hopes of forming a comprehensive alliance against the Mamluks. These diplomatic efforts were part of a more broader strategy that included outreach to the kings of France and Navarre, as revealed in 1267 letter from Pope Clement to Abaco, which highlighted the Mongols' willingness to assist the Latins in the Holy Land. Now this period also saw attempts by James I of Aragon to engage with Abaco, culminating in a failed expedition to Arco in 1269. The communication between Abaco and European rulers including Edward I of England, showcased another complex web of alliances and counter-alliances that characterized the Crusading era. The succession of Gregory X, after the longest papal election in history, represented a continuity of the Vatican's engagement with the Mongols further exemplified by the Mongols' delegation participation in the Second Council of Lyon 
in 1274. Baibars, well and truly ascended to the power as the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, following his key role in the Seventh Crusade, and defeating the Mongols at the Battle of Angelot, which I'm sure was universally appreciated. Well, all of this marked another shift in the region's power dynamic. His aggressive stance against the Mongols and the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, alongside his refusal to continue accommodating policies of his predecessors, set the stage for a new phase of Islamic consolidation and resistance against both the Mongols and what remained of the Crusader states. The post-Mongol invasion era saw the Muslim world grappling with the absence of a unifying caliphate authority after the sack of Baghdad. The attempts to re-establish a caliph in Cairo with al-Mustansir II's brief and ill-fated tenure followed by al-Hakim signaled the beginning of a new era of Muslim leadership that was centered in Egypt, far, far away from any Mongols who wanted to cause trouble. Baibar's military campaigns against the Crusader states in Syria were relentless and marked by a series of strategic sieges and assaults. In 1263, his initial siege on Acre, though unsuccessful, led him to target other cities. Nazareth fell, with Baibars ordering the destruction of Christian structures and banning of Latin clergy. His conquest continued with the capture of Arsuf, where, despite promising safe passage to the surrendering hospitaliers, he enslaved them and demolished their fortress. Well, that's not very nice, isn't it? The cities of Haifa and Caesarea soon met similar fates under his forces. The focus of Baibar's aggression extended to Sicilian Armenia in 1266, exploiting its allegiance to the Mongols. The disaster of Mari saw the defeat of Armenian forces, followed by the devastation of its principal cities, Tarsus, Mamistra, and Adana. This situation forced Hetoam I to cede control of key fortresses to the Mamluks and negotiate for his son's safe return, setting a precedence for Silesia's dual allegiance to the Mongols and tribute payments to the Mamluks. Safed, a stronghold that was held by the formidable Knights Templar, became a significant target for Baibars in 1266. Its location was rather special, as it provided crucial intelligence on Muslim movements. Despite offering the Templars safe conduct, Baibars, take a guess, massacred them upon surrender. Choosing to occupy and reinforce the fortress instead of destroying it. Once again, Baibars ruthless, really bad guy. But maybe I'm a little biased. Well, the fall of Antioch in 1268 represented one of the most brutal episodes in the crusading era, especially with its population, with Baibar breaking his promise of mercy to the city's defenders and inhabitants. The massacre and enslavement that followed eradicated a substantial portion of the Christian population and marked the end of the Principality of Antioch highlighting the devastating impact of Baibar's campaigns on the Crusader states. 
You see why we needed an Eight Crusade now? Indeed, the background is quite important. Despite his victories, Bypass was cautious of potential threats from the Mongols and the possibility of a new crusade led by Louis IX. His diplomatic outreach to Hugh III of Cyprus and the negotiation of a truce with the remaining crusader states indicated a strategic shift to consolidate his gains, but also prepare for future challenges. Well, rewinding back a little bit. In the aftermath of Louis's departure from the Holy Land, the Mamluks' military ascendancy escalated, capturing numerous Frankish strongholds and repeatedly assailing Arca. The looming specter of losing the entire kingdom spurred discussions of launching a new crusade. The conclusion of the Second Baron's War with Edward I's victory over Simon de Montfort, coupled with Charles of Anjou's triumph in the Battle of Benevento, liberated more than enough French martial resources. Pope Clement IV, seizing the moment in January of 1266, announced plans for a new expedition to the Holy Land, a venture initially conceived under Urban IV's papacy in 1263, some three years prior. This initiative sought to rally support against the Sultan of Babylon, or the Pharaoh of Egypt, and the Saracens, aiming to alleviate the plight of Christians in the region and bolster the Holy Land. By September 1266, the determination of Louis to lead another crusade crystallized, despite the pressing demands within France. By 1267, despite health and weariness, Louis was poised to embark on the new crusade, symbolized by a ceremonial taking of the cross at Saint-Chapelle on the 25th of March of that same year, 1267. A subsequent ceremony was held at Notre Dame, with Theobald II of Navarre among those committing to the cause. And, despite a comparatively lukewarm response compared to his first crusade, then the scepticism of chroniclers like Jean de Joinville, preparations continued to progress along pretty nicely. The 1267 Crusade, emanating from the Upper Rhine, underscored a broader pattern of papally endorsed crusade preaching and mobilization. Clement's directive to German bishops, Dominicans and Franciscans to preach the cross met with mixed responses only finding notable success in regions that were adjacent to France. The departure of several hundred crusaders from Basel during Lent in 1267, though modest in its scope, represented the fervent hope and commitment of those willing to journey to the Holy Land in anticipation of larger expeditions, led by monarchs like Louis and Edward I of England. Now in the early stages of 1267, the Mongol Ilkhanate's leader, Abaka, initiated diplomatic outreach to James I of Aragon, proposing an alliance against the Mamluk Sultanate, a formidable force in the Levant. James I, responsive to this call, dispatched Jaime Alaric de Perpignan as his envoy, who later returned accompanied by a Mongol delegation. Despite reservations from Pope Clement and Alfonso X of Castile about James's involvement in the Holy Land, partly and due to questions about his moral character, the death of Clement IV in November and the delayed election of his successor, 
Gregory the Tenth, left James with a much freer hand. Additionally, Alfonso's influence over Aragonese decisions was fairly minimal. Fresh from his conquest of Mercia, James began fundraising for his own crusade. On the 1st of September, 1269, James set sail from Barcelona with a significant fleet, unfortunately to be scattered by a storm. While the king and the majority of his fleet did turn back, a smaller contingent, led by his illegitimate sons, Pedro Fernandez and Fernand Sanchez, pressed on to Arcar, arriving as Baibars ended a truce and menaced the city with a large force. Now the Aragonese contingent was eager to engage Baibars' forces. However, the Council of the Templars and Hospitallers advised them against action, at least for now. Now, everything in Arco was very precarious on all fronts. Geoffrey of Sargonet's death in April of 1269 left the city's defense in the hands of his successor, Robert of Gresk. A French regiment under Olivier de Termes was deployed on a raid at the time of the Aragonese festival, arrival rather, only to encounter Baibar's forces upon their return. Despite Olivier's preference for a stealthy withdrawal, Robert of Cresc's insistence on confrontation led them into a carefully laid ambush by Baibars, resulting in significant losses for the Crusaders. Certainly not off to a good start. The Aragonese, meanwhile, advised against a sortie to rescue the beleaguered regiment, prioritizing rather the defense of Arca over a risky engagement with Baibars' troops. This cautious stance, however, meant that the Aragonese expedition concluded without any significant contribution to the Christian defense. Now, the defeat of Manfred of Sicily at Benevento in 1266 by Charles I of Anjou marked another shift in the power dynamics of Italy. Manfred's refusal to retreat from the battlefield led to his death, a moment that could have spelled harsh reprisals for his supporters. However, Charles opted for a more lenient approach, a decision that was met with skepticism by those who doubted the sustainability of such conciliatory measures. Despite Charles' victory and initial attempts at leniency, his administration faced criticism from Pope Clement, who found Charles' methods and demeanor to be overly arrogant and frankly quite obstinate. Now, politics and the complexities thereof were further compounded when Charles was invited to expel the Ghibellines from Florence, a move that aroused the Pope's concern over Charles' territorial ambitions in Tuscany. Clement's unease led him to extract a promise from Charles to relinquish any claims on Tuscany within three years. Meanwhile, Charles' ambitions extended beyond mere Italy. He pledged to support Baldwin II of Cordenay in an endeavor to reclaim Constantinople from the Byzantine Emperor Michael VIII, with the agreement that he would receive a portion of the conquered territory. Charles' military campaigns continued with the siege of Pogibonsi in Tuscany, which resisted capture until late November 1267. Meanwhile, the political fallout from Manfred's defeat saw his supporters seeking refuge and rallying support in Bavaria for Conradin, Manfred's heir 
to claim his rights over Sicily. This led to an invasion attempt by Frederick of Castile, supported by Muhammad I al-Mustansir, the Hafsid Caliph of Iftikia, modern-day Tunisia, launching a campaign from North Africa into Sicily. The subsequent Battle of Tagliacozzo in the August of 1268 initially suggested a victory for Conradin. Yet the battle ultimately ended in his defeat and capture. The execution of Conradin and Frederick of Baden in October 1268 marked the end of their challenge to Charles' rule. Frederick of Castile, however, managed to escape the aftermath of this defeat, finding refuge in Tunis. This escape set the sage for his involvement against Louis' crusaders in the 1270 Tunis campaign, linking the conflicts of the Mediterranean in a web of alliances and hostilities that spanned from Italy to North Africa. Now, Louis's enduring commitment to a liberation of Jerusalem was ultimately challenged into a new strategic direction, a crusade against Tunis. This shift, influenced by his confessor Geoffrey of Beaulieu's assertion of Muhammad al-Mustansir's potential conversion to Christianity, and possibly persuaded by Charles of Angelo's geopolitical interest, marking a significant pivot in Louis' crusading endeavors. The rationale for targeting Tunis blended both spiritual ambition with political calculus, with the aided dimension of Charles' desire to assert control of tribute payments from the region, a legacy of Sicilian monarch's dominion. Thus, the 1270 Crusade, equipped with Genoese and Marcelloise fleets, was a departure from Louis' original plan of directly aiding Outremer via Cyprus. The shift to Tunis as a primary target represented a complex amalgamation of Louis' religious motiva motivations, rather, but also Charles' political objectives. The logistical challenge of financing the crusade underscored another lukewarm support from the expedition received, and it forced Louis to shoulder a significant portion of the financial burden himself. The involvement of the church, through Clement's allocation of a tenth of the church's income in Navarre to Theobald II, highlighted more ecclesiastical support for Louis's cause. I mean, at least you've got the church behind you, right? Well, send out the preachers, they did, and the efforts in Navarre, led by the Franciscans and the Dominicans, were another crucial aspect in rallying support for the crusade. On July the 2nd, 1270, under the leadership of Florent de Veronese, France's first admiral, appointed in 1269, Louis and his expeditionary force set sail from Aigues Mortes. This marked the beginning of what would be Louis's final crusade, a venture characterized by the king's personal sacrifice and dedication to the religious cause. The crusade was, of course, a family affair, with Louis's brother Alphonse of Portiers, his wife Joan of Toulouse, and his sons, including Philip III, among the notable participants. In the presence of his nephew Richard II of Artois, and leading nobles like Robert III of Flanders and John I of Brittany, further underscored the expedition's significance to the French nobility, many of whom 
were actually descendants of veterans from previous crusades. Despite the meticulous organization of the fleet, the departure was delayed by at least a month, posing challenges related to the Tunisian heat and potential maritime hazards. The army, though smaller than that of the Seventh Crusade, was significantly large, with Louis's own household contributing 347 knights to an estimated force of around 10,000. The Second Fleet, commanded by Louis's son-in-law, Theobald II, set sail from Marcel. But the journey to Tunis was not straightforward involving a strategic stop in Sardinia, where tensions with the local population, due to the Genoese origin of their vessels, underscored more of the complexities of Mediterranean politics. This unification of the French and Navarine fleets at Cagliari, and the subsequent revelation of Tunis at the Crusade's initial target, surprised the troops who had actually more so anticipated a direct engagement in Jerusalem. Nonetheless, the profound respect for Louis among his followers somewhat mitigated their concerns, maintaining cohesion and morale as they prepared for the unexpected campaign ahead. Upon arriving at Carthage on July 18, 1270, Louis's crusading force encountered an unexpectedly vacant harbour, leading to divided opinions within the royal council regarding their next move. Ultimately, their decision was made to disembark and take control of the strategic point at La Goulette. This initial success, however, was tempered by the harsh realities of the Tunisian climate and the logistical challenges of maintaining an army abroad, including the critical issue of sanitation and fresh food supply. As the Crusaders settled and awaited reinforcements by Charles of Anjou, their situation grew increasingly dire due to outbreak of disease, likely dysentery, which ravaged the ranks. The king himself was not spared, and after receiving his last rites, King Louis succumbed to the illness on August 25th. His death marked a significant turning point in this crusade, pretty much destroying the morale and casting a pall of uncertainty over the entire expedition. Well, shortly after Louis's death, Charles' fleet arrived. While potentially being a source of reinforcement, but it instead marked the beginning of the end for the Crusades' objectives in Tunis. The mutual affliction of both the Crusaders and Almustansir's forces with the disease paved the way for peace negotiations, and led to a somewhat anti-climactic conclusion to the campaign. The toll of the Tunisian campaign was heavy, with notable figures such as John II of Sosons and Alfonso of Brienne among the casualties. The survival of others, including Jean Depp and John I of Brittany, highlighted the arbitrary cruelty of the disease in determining the fate of those involved in the crusade. The Treaty of Tunis, signed on November 1st, 1270, marked the conclusion of the Eighth Crusade, bringing a period of truce between the Latin Christians and Tunis under Muhammad I al-Mustansir. This agreement afforded the Christians notable commercial privileges, including free trade and the establishment of religious missions within Tunis, 
effectively opening new avenues for interaction and influence. The treaty notably benefited Charles I of Anjou by securing a significant war indemnity and in addressing the issue of the Hohenstaufen refugees within the Sultanate. Now Philip III of France, ascending to the throne amidst the adversity of the Tunis campaign, faced the immediate challenge of leadership during a time of loss and disease. The deaths of his brother, John Tristan, followed by his father, Louis, and the subsequent fatalities within his family, took a deep personal toll on the royal family. The practice of Mos Teutonicus applied to Louis IX's remains for preservation during transport back to France reflects the length in which the Crusaders went to honour their dead, even in the face of logistical challenges. Most soldiers were simply buried on the field, if they were buried at all. Upon his return to Paris in May 1271, Philip III's reign began under sombre circumstance. With his coronation in Reims in August 1271, signifying both the continuation of the Capetian dynasty and a moment of solemn reflection on the Crusades' impact. Edward's arrival in Tunis with the English fleet on the eve of the Crusaders' departure underscored another challenge of coordination and communication in the timing that plagued the Crusades. Despite this setback, Edward's commitment to the crusading cause led him and the remnants of Louis's force to Sicily, only to face another adversary when a storm devastated their fleet off Trapani. Undeterred, Edward pressed on to Arca in April of 1271, marking the continuation of what would be recognised as the last major crusade to the Holy Land. The election of Gregory X as Pope in September of 1271 during his engagement in Arca with Edward's expedition highlighted the deep intertwinement of religious leadership with the crusading effort, or at least what was left of it. His immediate appeal for aid upon learning of his election and his poignant sermon in Arca reflected a profound commitment to Jerusalem, echoing the enduring spiritual and political aspirations of the crusaders who simply didn't want to let go. The Second Council of Lyon, in March of 1272, represented a significant ecclesiastical effort to organize a comprehensive crusade, funded by a church-wide tithe Despite the enthusiasm of figures like James I of Aragon, internal opposition from entities such as the Knights Templar showcased more complexities and divisions. The involvement of the Mongol delegation at the Council, which is surprising, and the subsequent plans for a joint crusade with the Mongols to commence in 1278 just shows another broad scope of the alliances. However, Gregory's death in 1276 completely destroyed these plans, which was a shame, because they were considered quite viable for reclaiming the Holy Land. Well, all of the resources amassed for the Crusade were redirected, and, well, the idea continued to be even more unpopular. However, Philip's undertaking of the Aragonese Crusade in 1284, and his subsequent death in dysentery again, further underscored the personal risks and political gambits inherent within the crusading movement, and the eventual loss of the Holy Land following the siege of Arca in 1291 under Philip IV of France marked the end of an era 
closing a chapter on the Crusades, that had been characterized by lofty aspirations, complex international alliances, and that profound cooperation between power, faith, and harsh reality. Well, thank you very much for listening. We certainly have talked about the Crusades a lot this week, haven't we? And there's still a few more little Crusades to do. Like the People's Crusade, the Children's Crusade, the Albigensian Crusade. We'll get to them. Allow me to thank my Patreon members on the top tier, being... Jeffrey, JC, and Stark Factory. If you would like to become a member of the Patreon, you know what to do. Otherwise, I wish you all the best. Look after yourselves, and I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone.